chapter fourteen of the works of the right honourable edmund burke volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the works of the right honourable edmund burke volume one by edmund burke sections nine through sixteen of part four section nine why visual objects of great dimensions are sublime vision is performed by having a picture formed by the rays of light which are reflected from the object painted in one piece instantaneously on the retina or last nervous part of the eye or according to others there is but one point of any object painted on the eye in such a manner as to be perceived at once but by moving the eye we gather up with great celerity the several parts of the object so as to form one uniform piece if the former opinion be allowed it will be considered that though all the light reflected from a large body should strike the eye in one instant yet we must suppose that the body itself is formed of a vast number of distinct points every one of which or the ray from every one makes an impression on the retina so that though the image of one point should cause but a small tension of this membrane another and another and another stroke must in their progress cause a very great one until it arrives at last to the highest degree and the whole capacity of the eye vibrating in all its parts must approach near to the nature of what causes pain and consequently must produce an idea of the sublime again if we take it that one point only of an object is distinguishable at once the matter will amount nearly to the same thing or rather it will make the origin of the sublime from greatness of dimension yet clearer for if but one point is observed at once the eye must traverse the vast space of such bodies with great quickness and consequently the fine nerves and muscles destined to the motion of that part must be very much strained and their great sensibility must make them highly affected by this straining besides it signifies just nothing to the effect produced whether a body has its parts connected and makes its impression at once or making but one impression of a point at a time it causes a succession of the same or other so quickly as to make them seem united as is evident from the common effect of whirling about a lighted torch or piece of wood which if done with celerity seems a circle of fire section ten unity why requisite to vastness it may be objected to this theory that the eye generally receives an equal number of rays at all times and that therefore a great object cannot affect it by the number of rays more than that variety of objects which the eye must always discern whilst it remains open but to this i answer that admitting an equal number of rays or an equal quantity of luminous particles to strike the eye at all times yet if these rays frequently vary their nature now to blue now to red and so on or their manner of termination as to a number of petty squares triangles or the like at every change whether of colour or shape the organ has a sort of relaxation or rest but this relaxation and labour so often interrupted is by no means productive of ease neither has it the effect of vigorous and uniform labour whoever has remarked the different effects of some strong exercise and some little piddling action will understand why a teasing fretful employment which at once wearies and weakens the body should have nothing great these sorts of impulses which are rather teasing than painful by continually and suddenly altering their tenor and direction prevent that full tension that species of uniform labour which is allied to strong pain and causes the sublime the sum total of things of various kinds though it should equal the number of the uniform parts composing some one entire object is not equal in its effect upon the organs of our bodies besides the one already assigned there is another very strong reason for the difference the mind in reality hardly ever can attend diligently to more than one thing at a time if this thing be little the effect is little and a number of other little objects cannot engage the attention the mind is bounded by the bounds of the object and what is not attended to and what does not exist are much the same in the effect but the eye or the mind for in this case there is no difference in great uniform objects does not readily arrive at their bounds it has no rest whilst it contemplates them 
the image is much the same everywhere so that everything great by its quantity must necessarily be one simple and entire section eleven the artificial infinite we have observed that a species of greatness arises from the artificial infinite then that this infinite consists in an uniform succession of great parts we observe too that the same uniform succession had a like power in sounds but because the effects of many things are clearer in one of the senses than in another and that all the senses bear analogy to and illustrate one another i shall begin with this power in sounds as the cause of the sublimity from succession is rather more obvious in the sense of hearing and i shall here at once for all observe that an investigation of the natural and mechanical causes of our passions besides the curiosity of the subject gives if they are discovered a double strength and lustre to any rules we deliver on such matters when the ear receives any simple sound it is struck by a single pulse of the air which makes the eardrum and the other membranous parts vibrate according to the nature and species of the stroke if the stroke be strong the organ of hearing suffers a considerable degree of tension if the stroke be repeated pretty soon after the repetition causes an expectation of another stroke and it must be observed that expectation itself causes a tension this is apparent in many animals who when they prepare for hearing any sound rouse themselves and prick up their ears so that here the effect of the sounds is considerably augmented by a new auxiliary the expectation but though after a number of strokes we expect still more not being able to ascertain the exact time of their arrival when they arrive they produce a sort of surprise which increases this tension yet further for i have observed that when in at any time i have waited very earnestly for some sound that returned at intervals as the successive firing of cannon though i fully expected the return of the sound when it came it always made me start a little the eardrum suffered a convulsion and the whole body consented with it the tension of the part thus increasing at every blow by the united forces of the stroke itself the expectation and the surprise it is worked up to such a pitch as to be capable of the sublime it is brought just to the verge of pain even when the cause has ceased the organs of hearing being often successively struck in a similar manner continue to vibrate in that manner for some time longer this is an additional help to the greatness of the effect section twelve the vibrations must be similar but if the vibration be not similar at every impression it can never be carried beyond the number of actual impressions for move any body as a pendulum in one way and it will continue to oscillate in an arch of the same circle until the known causes make it rest but if after first putting it in motion in one direction you push it into another it can never reassume the first direction because it can never move itself and consequently it can have but the effect of that last motion whereas if in the same direction you act upon it several times it will describe a greater arch and move a longer time section thirteen the effects of succession in visual objects explained if we can comprehend clearly how things operate upon one of our senses there can be very little difficulty in conceiving in what manner they affect the rest to say a great deal therefore upon the corresponding affections of every sense would tend rather to fatigue us by an useless repetition than to throw any new light upon the subject by that ample and diffuse manner of treating it but as in this discourse we chiefly attach ourselves to the sublime as it affects the eye we shall consider particularly why a successive disposition of uniform parts in the same right line should be sublime and upon what principle this disposition is enabled to make a comparatively small quantity of matter produce a grander effect than a much larger quantity disposed in another manner to avoid the perplexity of general notions let us set before our eyes a colonnade of uniform pillars planted in a right line let us take our stand in such a manner that the eye may shoot along this colonnade for it has its best effect in this view in our present situation it is plain that the rays from the first round pillar will cause in the eye a vibration of that species an image of the pillar itself the pillar immediately succeeding increases it that which follows renews and enforces the impression each in its order as it succeeds repeats impulse after impulse and stroke after stroke until the eye long exercised in one particular way 
cannot lose that object immediately and being violently roused by this continued agitation it presents the mind with a grand or sublime conception but instead of viewing a rank of uniform pillars let us suppose that they succeed each other around in a square one alternately in this case the vibration caused by the first round pillar perishes as soon as it is formed and one of quite another sort the square directly occupies its place which however it resigns as quickly to the round one and thus the eye proceeds alternately taking up one image and laying down another as long as the building continues from whence it is obvious that at the last pillar the impression is as far from continuing as it was at the very first because in fact the sensory can receive no distinct impression but from the last and it can never of itself resume a similar impression besides every variation of the object is a rest and relaxation to the organs of sight and these reliefs prevent that powerful emotion so necessary to produce the sublime to produce therefore a perfect grandeur in such things as we have been mentioning there should be a perfect simplicity an absolute uniformity in disposition shape and colouring upon this principle of succession and uniformity it may be asked why a long bare wall should not be a more sublime object than a colonnade since the succession is no way interrupted since the eye meets no check since nothing more uniform can be conceived a long bare wall is certainly not so grand an object as a colonnade of the same length and height it is not altogether difficult to account for this difference when we look at a naked wall from the evenness of the object the eye runs along its whole space and arrives quickly at its termination the eye meets nothing which may interrupt its progress but then it meets nothing which may detain it a proper time to produce a very great and lasting effect the view of a bare wall if it be of a great height and length is undoubtedly grand but this is only one idea and not a repetition of similar ideas it is therefore great not so much upon the principle of infinity as upon that of vastness but we are not so powerfully affected with any one impulse unless it be one of a prodigious force indeed as we are with a succession of similar impulses because the nerves of the sensory do not if i may use the expression acquire a habit of repeating the same feeling in such a manner as to continue it longer than its cause is in action besides all the effects which i have attributed to expectation and surprise in section eleven can have no place in a bare wall section fourteen locke's opinion concerning darkness considered it is mr locke's opinion that darkness is not naturally an idea of terror and that though an excess of light is painful to the sense the greatest excess of darkness is no ways troublesome he observes indeed in another place that a nurse or an old woman having once associated the ideas of ghosts and goblins with that of darkness night ever after becomes painful and horrible to the imagination the authority of this great man is doubtless as great as that of any man can be and it seems to stand in the way of our general principle we have considered darkness as a cause of the sublime and we have all along considered the sublime as depending on some modification of pain or terror so that if darkness be no way painful or terrible to any who have not had their minds early tainted with superstitions it can be no source of the sublime to them but with all deference to such an authority it seems to me that an association of a more general nature an association which takes in all mankind may make darkness terrible for in utter darkness it is impossible to know in what degree of safety we stand we are ignorant of the objects that surround us we may every moment strike against some dangerous obstruction we may fall down a precipice the first step we take and if an enemy approach we know not in what quarter to defend ourselves in such a case strength is no sure protection wisdom can only act by guess the boldest are staggered and he who would pray for nothing else towards his defence is forced to pray for light as to the association of ghosts and goblins surely it is more natural to think that darkness being originally an idea of terror was chosen as a fit scene for such terrible representations than that such representations have made darkness terrible the mind of man very easily slides into an error of the former sort but it is very hard to imagine that the effect of an idea so universally terrible in all times and in all countries as darkness 
could possibly have been owing to a set of idle stories or to any cause of a nature so trivial and of an operation so precarious section fifteen darkness terrible in its own nature perhaps it may appear on inquiry that blackness and darkness are in some degree painful by their natural operation independent of any associations whatsoever i must observe that the ideas of darkness and blackness are much the same and they differ only in this that blackness is a more confined idea mr cheselden has given us a very curious story of a boy who had been born blind and continued so until he was thirteen or fourteen years old he was then couched for a cataract by which operation he received his sight among many remarkable particulars that attended his first perceptions and judgments on visual objects cheselden tells us that the first time the boy saw a black object it gave him great uneasiness and that some time after upon accidentally seeing a negro woman he was struck with great horror at the sight the horror in this case can scarcely be supposed to arise from any association the boy appears by the account to have been particularly observing and sensible for one of his age and therefore it is probable if the great uneasiness he felt at the first sight of black had arisen from its connection with any other disagreeable ideas he would have observed and mentioned it for an idea disagreeable only by association has the cause of its ill effect on the passions evident enough at the first impression in ordinary cases it is indeed frequently lost but this is because the original association was made very early and the consequent impression repeated often in our instance there was no time for such a habit and there is no reason to think that the ill effects of black on his imagination were more owing to its connection with any disagreeable ideas than that the good effects of more cheerful colours were derived from their connection with pleasing ones they had both probably their effects from their natural operation section sixteen white darkness is terrible it may be worth while to examine how darkness can operate in such a manner as to cause pain it is observable that still as we recede from the light nature has so contrived it that the pupil is enlarged by the retiring of the iris in proportion to our recess now instead of declining from it but a little suppose that we withdraw entirely from the light it is reasonable to think that the contraction of the radio fibres of the iris is proportionally greater and that this part may by great darkness come to be so contracted as to strain the nerves that compose it beyond their natural tone and by this means to produce a painful sensation such a tension it seems there certainly is whilst we are involved in darkness for in such a state whilst the eye remains open there is a continual nisus to receive light this is manifest from the flashes and luminous appearances which often seem in these circumstances to play before it and which can be nothing but the effect of spasms produced by its own efforts in pursuit of its object several other strong impulses will produce the idea of light in the eye besides the substance of light itself as we experience on many occasions some who allow darkness to be a cause of the sublime would infer from the dilatation of the pupil that a relaxation may be productive of the sublime as well as a convulsion but they do not i believe consider that although the circular ring of the iris be in some sense a sphincter which may possibly be dilated by a simple relaxation yet in one respect it differs from most of the other sphincters of the body that it is furnished with antagonist muscles which are the radial fibres of the iris no sooner does the circular muscle begin to relax than these fibres wanting their counterpoise are forcibly drawn back and open the pupil to a considerable wideness but though we are not apprised of this i believe any one will find if he opens his eyes and makes an effort to see in a dark place that a very perceivable pain ensues and i have heard some ladies remark that after having worked a long time upon a ground of black their eyes were so pained and weakened they could hardly see it may perhaps be objected to this theory of the mechanical effect of darkness that the ill effects of darkness or blackness seem rather mental than corporeal and i own it is true that they do so and so do all those that depend on the affections of the finer parts of our system the ill effects of bad weather appear often no otherwise than in a melancholy and dejection of spirits though without doubt in this case the bodily organs suffer first in the mind through these organs End of chapter fourteen
chapter fourteen of the works of the right honourable edmund burke volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the works of the right honourable edmund burke volume one by edmund burke section fifteen of the works of the right honourable edmund burke volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the works of the right honourable edmund burke volume one by edmund burke sections seventeen through twenty five of part four section seventeen the effects of blackness blackness is but a partial darkness and therefore it derives some of its powers from being mixed and surrounded with colored bodies. In its own nature, it cannot be considered as a color, black bodies, reflecting none or but a few rays with regard to sight, are but as so many vacant spaces, dispersed among the objects we view. When the eye lights on one of these vacuities, after having been kept in some degree of tension by the play of the adjacent colors upon it, it suddenly falls into a relaxation, out of which it as suddenly recovers by a convulsive spring. To illustrate this, let us consider that when we intend to sit on a chair and find it much lower than was expected, the shock is very violent, much more violent than could be thought from so slight a fall as the difference between one chair and another can possibly make. If, after descending a flight of stairs, we attempt inadvertently to take another step in the manner of the former ones, the shock is extremely rude and disagreeable, and by no art can we cause such a shock by the same means when we expect and prepare for it. When I say that this is owing to having the change made contrary to expectation, I do not mean solely when the mind expects. I mean likewise that when any organ of sense is for some time affected in some one manner, if it be suddenly affected otherwise, there ensues a convulsive motion, such a convulsion as is caused when anything happens against the expectance of the mind. And though it may appear strange that such a change as produces a relaxation should immediately produce a sudden convulsion, it is yet most certainly so, and so in all the senses. Everyone knows that sleep is a relaxation, and that silence, where nothing keeps the organs of hearing in action, is, in general, fittest to bring on this relaxation. Yet, when a sort of murmuring sounds dispose a man to sleep, let these sounds cease suddenly, and the person immediately awakes. That is, the parts are braced up suddenly, and he awakes. This I have often experienced myself, and I have heard the same from observing persons. In like manner, if a person in broad daylight were falling asleep, to introduce a sudden darkness would prevent his sleep for that time, though silence and darkness in themselves, and not suddenly introduced, are very favorable to it. This I knew only by conjecture on the analogy of the senses when I first digested these observations, but I have since experienced it, and I have often experienced, and so have a thousand others, that on the first inclining towards sleep, we have been suddenly awakened with a most violent start, and that this start was generally preceded by a sort of dream of our falling down a precipice. Whence does this strange motion arise, but from the too sudden relaxation of the body, which by some mechanism in nature restores itself by as quick and vigorous an exertion of the contracting power of the muscles? The dream itself is caused by this relaxation, and it is of too uniform a nature to be attributed to any other cause. The parts relax too suddenly, which is in the nature of falling, and this accident of the body induces this image in the mind. When we are in a confirmed state of health and vigor, as all changes are then less sudden and less on the extreme, we can seldom complain of this disagreeable sensation. Section 18. The Effects of Blackness Moderated Though the effects of black be painful originally, we must not think they always continue so. 
Custom reconciles us to everything. After we have been used to the sight of black objects, the terror abates, and the smoothness and glossiness, or some agreeable accident of bodies so colored, softens, in some measure, the horror and sternness of their original nature. Yet the nature of the original impression still continues. Black will always have something melancholy in it, because the sensory will always find the change to it from other colors too violent. Or, if it occupy the whole compass of the sight, it will then be darkness, and what was said of darkness will be applicable here. I do not purpose to go into all that might be said to illustrate this theory of the effects of light and darkness. Neither will I examine all the different effects produced by the various modifications and mixtures of these two causes. If the foregoing observations have any foundation in nature, I conceive them very sufficient to account for all the phenomena that can arise from all the combinations of black with other colors. To enter into every particular, or to answer every objection, would be an endless labor. We have only followed the most leading roads, and we shall observe the same conduct in our inquiry into the cause of beauty. Section 19. The Physical Cause of Love. When we have before us such objects as excite love and complacency, the body is affected, so far as I could observe, much in the following manner. The head reclines something on one side, the eyelids are more closed than usual, and the eyes roll gently with an inclination to the object. The mouth is a little opened, and the breath drawn slowly, with now and then a low sigh. The whole body is composed, and the hands fall idly to the sides. All this is accompanied with an inward sense of melting and languor. These appearances are always proportioned to the degree of beauty in the object and of sensibility in the observer, and this gradation from the highest pitch of beauty and sensibility even to the lowest of mediocrity and indifference and their correspondent effects ought to be kept in view, else this description will seem exaggerated, which it certainly is not. But from this description it is almost impossible not to conclude that beauty acts by relaxing the solids of the whole system. There are all the appearances of such a relaxation, and a relaxation somewhat below the natural tone seems to me to be the cause of all positive pleasure. Who is a stranger to that manner of expression so common in all times and in all countries, of being softened? relaxed, enervated, dissolved, melted away by pleasure. The universal voice of mankind, faithful to their feelings, concurs in affirming this uniform and general effect, and although some odd and particular instance may perhaps be found wherein there appears a considerable degree of positive pleasure without all the characters of relaxation, we must not therefore reject the conclusion we had drawn from a concurrence of many experiments, but we must still retain it, subjoining the exceptions which may occur according to the judicious rule laid down by Sir Isaac Newton in the third book of his Optics. Our position will, I conceive, appear confirmed beyond any reasonable doubt if we can show that such things as we have already observed to be the genuine constituents of beauty have each of them separately taken a natural tendency to relax the fibers. And if it must be allowed us that the appearance of the human body, when all these constituents are united together before the sensory, further favors this opinion, we may venture, I believe, to conclude that the passion called love is produced by this relaxation. By the same method of reasoning which we have used in the inquiry into the causes of the sublime, we may likewise conclude that as a beautiful object presented to the sense by causing a relaxation of the body produces the passion of love in the mind, so if by any means the passion should first have its origin in the mind, a relaxation of the outward organs will as certainly ensue in a degree proportioned to the cause. Section 20. Why Smoothness is Beautiful. 
It is to explain the true cause of visual beauty that I call in the assistance of the other senses. If it appears that smoothness is a principal cause of pleasure to the touch, taste, smell, and hearing, it will be easily admitted a constituent of visual beauty, especially as we have before shown that this quality is found almost without exception in all bodies that are, by general consent, held beautiful. There can be no doubt that bodies which are rough and angular rouse and vellicate the organs of feeling, causing a sense of pain, which consists in the violent tension or contraction of the muscular fibers. On the contrary, the application of smooth bodies relaxes. Gentle stroking with a smooth hand allays violent pains and cramps, and relaxes the suffering parts from their unnatural tension and it has therefore very often no mean effect in removing swellings and obstructions. The sense of feeling is highly gratified with smooth bodies. A bed smoothly laid and soft, that is, where the resistance is every way inconsiderable, is a great luxury, disposing to an universal relaxation, and inducing beyond anything else that species of it called sleep. Section 21. Sweetness, its nature. Nor is it only in the touch that smooth bodies cause positive pleasure by relaxation. In the smell and taste we find all things agreeable to them, and which are commonly called sweet, to be of a smooth nature, and that they all evidently tend to relax their respective sensories. Let us first consider the taste, since it is most easy to inquire into the property of liquids, and since all things seem to want a fluid vehicle to make them tasted at all, I intend rather to consider the liquid than the solid parts of our food. The vehicles of all tastes are water and oil. And what determines the taste is some salt, which affects variously according to its nature, or its manner of being combined with other things. Water and oil, simply considered, are capable of giving some pleasure to the taste. Water, when simple, is insipid, inodorous, colorless, and smooth. It is found, when not cold, to be a great resolver of spasms and lubricator of the fibers. This power it probably owes to its smoothness, for as fluidity depends, according to the most general opinion, on the roundness, smoothness, and weak cohesion of the component parts of any body, and as water acts merely as a simple fluid, it follows that the cause of its fluidity is likewise the cause of its relaxing quality, namely, the smoothness and slippery texture of its parts. The other fluid vehicle of tastes is oil. This, too, when simple, is insipid, inodorous, colorless, and smooth to the touch and taste. It is smoother than water, and in many cases yet more relaxing. Oil is in some degree pleasant to the eye, the touch, and the taste, insipid as it is. Water is not so grateful, which I do not know on what principle to account for, other than that water is not so soft and smooth. Suppose that to this oil or water were added a certain quantity of a specific salt, which had a power of putting the nervous papillae of the tongue into a gentle vibratory motion, as suppose sugar dissolved in it. The smoothness of the oil and the vibratory power of the salt cause the sense we call sweetness. In all sweet bodies, sugar, or a substance very little different from sugar, is constantly found. Every species of salt, examined by the microscope, has its own distinct, regular, invariable form. That of nitre is a pointed oblong. That of sea salt, an exact cube. That of sugar, a perfect globe. If you have tried how smooth globular bodies, as the marbles with which boys amuse themselves, have affected the touch when they are rolled backward and forward and over one another, you will easily conceive how sweetness, which consists in a salt of such nature, affects the taste for a single globe, though somewhat pleasant to the feeling, yet by the regularity of its form and the somewhat too sudden deviation of its parts from a right line, is nothing near so pleasant to the touch as several globes, 
where the hand gently rises to one and falls to another, and this pleasure is greatly increased if the globes are in motion and sliding over one another, for this soft variety prevents that weariness which the uniform disposition of the several globes would otherwise produce. Thus, in sweet liquors, the parts of the fluid vehicle, though most probably round, are yet so minute as to conceal the figure of their component parts from the nicest inquisition of the microscope, and consequently, being so excessively minute, they have a sort of flat simplicity to the taste, resembling the effects of plain smooth bodies to the touch. For if a body be composed of round parts excessively small and packed pretty closely together, the surface will be both to the sight and touch as if it were nearly plain and smooth. It is clear from their unveiling their figure to the microscope that the particles of sugar are considerably larger than those of water or oil, and consequently that their effects from their roundness will be more distinct and palpable to the nervous papillae of that nice organ, the tongue. They will induce that sense called sweetness, which in a weak manner we discover in oil, and in a yet weaker in water. For insipid as they are, water and oil are in some degree sweet, and it may be observed that insipid things of all kinds approach more nearly to the nature of sweetness than to that of any other taste. Section 22. Sweetness Relaxing In the other senses we have remarked that smooth things are relaxing. Now it ought to appear that sweet things which are the smooth of taste are relaxing too. It is remarkable that in some languages soft and sweet have but one name. Do, in French, signifies soft as well as sweet. The Latin, dulcis, and the Italian, dolce, have in many cases the same double signification. That sweet things are generally relaxing is evident, because all such, especially those which are most oily, taken frequently, or in a large quantity, very much enfeeble the tone of the stomach. Sweet smells, which bear a great affinity to sweet tastes, relax very remarkably. The smell of flowers disposes people to drowsiness, and this relaxing effect is further apparent from the prejudice which people of weak nerves receive from their use. It were worth while to examine whether tastes of this kind, sweet ones, tastes that are caused by smooth oils and a relaxing salt, are not the originally pleasant tastes. For many which use has rendered such were not at all agreeable at first. The way to examine this is to try what nature has originally provided for us, which she has undoubtedly made originally pleasant, and to analyze this provision. Milk is the first support of our childhood. The component parts of this are water, oil, and a sort of a very sweet salt, called the sugar of milk. All these, when blended, have a great smoothness to the taste, and a relaxing quality to the skin. The next thing children covet is fruit, and of fruits those principally which are sweet. And every one knows that the sweetness of fruit is caused by a subtle oil, and such a salt as that mentioned in the last section. Afterwards, custom, habit, the desire of novelty, and a thousand other causes confound, adulterate, and change our palates, so that we can no longer reason with any satisfaction about them. Before we quit this article, we must observe that as smooth things are, as such, agreeable to the taste, and are found of a relaxing quality, so, on the other hand, things which are found by experience to be of a strengthening quality, and fit to brace the fibers, are almost universally rough and pungent to the taste, and in many cases rough even to the touch. We often apply the quality of sweetness, metaphorically, to visual objects. For the better carrying on this remarkable analogy of the senses, we may here call sweetness the beautiful of the taste. Section 23. Variation. Why beautiful? Another principal property of beautiful objects is that the line of their parts is continually varying its direction. 
but it varies it by a very insensible deviation. It never varies it so quickly as to surprise, or by the sharpness of its angle to cause any twitching or convulsion of the optic nerve. Nothing long continued in the same manner, nothing very suddenly varied, can be beautiful, because both are opposite to that agreeable relaxation which is the characteristic effect of beauty. It is thus in all the senses. A motion in a right line is that manner of moving, next to a very gentle descent, in which we meet the least resistance, yet it is not that manner of moving which, next to a descent, wearies us the least. Rest certainly tends to relax, yet there is a species of motion which relaxes more than rest, a gentle oscillatory motion, a rising and falling. Rocking sets children to sleep better than absolute rest. There is indeed scarcely anything at that age which gives more pleasure than to be gently lifted up and down. The manner of playing which their nurses use with children, and the weighing and swinging used afterwards by themselves as a favorite amusement, evince this very sufficiently. Most people must have observed the sort of sense they have had on being swiftly drawn in an easy coach on a smooth turf, with gradual ascents and declivities. This will give a better idea of the beautiful, and point out its probable cause better than almost anything else. On the contrary, when one is hurried over a rough, rocky, broken road, the pain felt by these sudden inequalities shows why similar sights feelings and sounds are so contrary to beauty, and with regard to the feeling it is exactly the same in its effect, or very nearly the same, whether, for instance, I move my hand along the surface of a body of a certain shape, or whether such a body is moved along my hand. But to bring this analogy of the senses home to the eye, if a body presented to that sense has such a waving surface that the rays of light reflected from it are in a continual insensible deviation from the strongest to the weakest, which is always the case in a surface gradually unequal, it must be exactly similar in its effects on the eye and touch, upon the one of which it operates directly, on the other indirectly. And this body will be beautiful if the lines which compose its surface are not continued, even so varied, in a manner that may weary or dissipate the attention. The variation itself must be continually varied. Section 24. Concerning Smallness. To avoid a sameness which may arise from the too frequent repetition of the same reasonings, and of illustrations of the same nature, I will not enter very minutely into every particular that regards beauty as it is founded on the disposition of its quantity, or its quantity itself. In speaking of the magnitude of bodies, there is great uncertainty, because the ideas of great and small are terms almost entirely relative to the species of the objects, which are infinite. It is true that having once fixed the species of any object, and the dimensions common in the individuals of that species, we may observe some that exceed and some that fall short of the ordinary standard. Those which greatly exceed are, by that excess, provided the species itself be not very small, rather great and terrible than beautiful. But as in the animal world, and in a good measure in the vegetable world likewise, the qualities that constitute beauty may possibly be united to things of greater dimensions, when they are so united, they constitute a species something different both from the sublime and beautiful, which I have before called fine. But this kind, I imagine, has not such a power on the passions, either as vast bodies have, which are endued with the correspondent qualities of the sublime, or as the qualities of beauty have when united in a small object. The affection produced by large bodies adorned with the spoils of beauty is a tension continually relieved, which approaches to the nature of mediocrity. But if I were to say how I find myself affected upon such occasions, I should say that the sublime suffers less by being united to some of the qualities of beauty 
than beauty does by being joined to greatness of quantity or any other properties of the sublime. There is something so overruling in whatever inspires us with awe in all things which belong ever so remotely to terror that nothing else can stand in their presence. There lie the qualities of beauty either dead or unoperative, or at most exerted to mollify the rigor and sternness of the terror, which is the natural concomitant of greatness. Besides the extraordinary great in every species, the opposite to this, the dwarfish and diminutive, ought to be considered. Littleness, merely as such, has nothing contrary to the idea of beauty. The hummingbird, both in shape and coloring, yields to none of the winged species, of which it is the least, and perhaps his beauty is enhanced by his smallness. But there are animals which, when they are extremely small, are rarely, if ever, beautiful. There is a dwarfish size of men and women, which is almost constantly so gross and massive in comparison of their height that they present us with a very disagreeable image. But should a man be found not above two or three feet high, supposing such a person to have all the parts of his body of a delicacy suitable to such a size, and otherwise endued with the common qualities of other beautiful bodies, I am pretty well convinced that a person of such a stature might be considered as beautiful, might be the object of love, might give us very pleasing ideas on viewing him, the only thing which could possibly interpose to check our pleasure is that such creatures, however formed, are unusual, and are often therefore considered as something monstrous. The large and gigantic, though very compatible with the sublime, is contrary to the beautiful. It is impossible to suppose a giant the object of love. When we let our imagination loose in romance, the ideas we naturally annex to that size are those of tyranny, cruelty, injustice, and everything horrid and abominable. We paint the giant ravaging the country, plundering the innocent traveler, and afterwards gorged with his half-living flesh. Such are Polyphemus, Cacos, and others, who make so great a figure in romances and heroic poems. The event we attend to with the greatest satisfaction is their defeat and death. I do not remember, in all that multitude of deaths with which the Iliad is filled, that the fall of any man, remarkable for his great stature and strength, touches us with pity. Nor does it appear that the author, so well read in human nature, ever intended it should. It is Simoesius, in the soft bloom of youth, torn from his parents, who tremble for a courage so ill-suited to his strength. It is another hurried by war from the new embraces of his bride, young and fair, and a novice to the field, who melts us by his untimely fate. Achilles, in spite of the many qualities of beauty which Homer has bestowed on his outward form, and the many great virtues with which he has adorned his mind, can never make us love him. It may be observed that Homer has given the Trojans, whose fate he has designed to excite our compassion, infinitely more of the amiable social virtues than he has distributed among his Greeks. With regard to the Trojans, the passion he chooses to raise is pity. Pity is a passion founded on love, and these lesser, and if I may say domestic virtues, are certainly the most amiable." but he has made the Greeks far their superiors in the politic and military virtues. The counsels of Priam are weak, the arms of Hector comparatively feeble, his courage far below that of Achilles. Yet we love Priam more than Agamemnon, and Hector more than his conqueror Achilles. Admiration is the passion which Homer would excite in favor of the Greeks, and he has done it by bestowing on them the virtues which have but little to do with love. This short digression is perhaps not wholly beside our purpose, where our business is to show that objects of great dimensions are incompatible with beauty, the more incompatible as they are greater. Whereas the small, if ever they fail of beauty, this failure is not to be attributed 
to their size. Section 25 of Color With regard to color, the disquisition is almost infinite, but I conceive the principles laid down in the beginning of this part are sufficient to account for the effects of them all, as well as for the agreeable effects of transparent bodies, whether fluid or solid. Suppose I look at a bottle of muddy liquor, of a blue or red color. The blue or red rays cannot pass clearly to the eye, but are suddenly and unequally stopped by the intervention of little opaque bodies, which, without preparation, change the idea, and change it too into one disagreeable in its own nature, conformably to the principles laid down in section 24. But when the ray passes without such opposition through the glass or liquor, when the glass or liquor is quite transparent, the light is sometimes softened in the passage, which makes it more agreeable even as light, and the liquor reflecting all the rays of its proper color evenly, it has such an effect on the eye as smooth opaque bodies have on the eye and touch. So that the pleasure here is compounded of the softness of the transmitted and the evenness of the reflected light. This pleasure may be heightened by the common principles in other things, if the shape of the glass which holds the transparent liquor be so judiciously varied as to present the color gradually and interchangeably, weakened and strengthened with all the variety which judgment in affairs of this nature shall suggest. On a review of all that has been said of the effects, as well as the causes of both, it will appear that the sublime and beautiful are built on principles very different, and that their affections are as different. The great has terror for its basis, which, when it is modified, causes that emotion in the mind, which I have called astonishment. The beautiful is founded on mere positive pleasure, and excites in the soul that feeling which is called love. Their causes have made the subject of this fourth part. End of section 15. Section 16 of the Works of the Right Honorable Edmund Burke, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Works of the Right Honorable Edmund Burke, Volume 1, by Edmund Burke, Section 16, Part 5 of a Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and Beautiful, Section 1, of Words. Natural objects affect us by the laws of that connection which providence has established between certain motions and configurations of bodies and certain consequent feelings in our mind. Painting affects in the same manner, but with the superadded pleasure of imitation. Architecture affects by the laws of nature and the law of reason, from which latter result the rules of proportion which make a work to be praised or censured in the whole or in some part when the end for which it was designed is or is not properly answered but as to words they seem to me to affect us in a manner very different from that in which we are affected by natural objects or by painting or architecture yet words have as considerable a share in exciting ideas of beauty and of the sublime as many of those and sometimes a much greater than any of them. Therefore, an inquiry into the manner by which they excite such emotions is far from being unnecessary in a discourse of this kind. Section 2. The Common Effects of Poetry, Not by Raising Ideas of Things. The common notion of the power of poetry and eloquence as well as that of words in ordinary conversation is that they affect the mind by raising in it ideas of those things for which custom has appointed them to stand to examine the truth of this notion it may be requisite to observe that words may be divided into three sorts the first are such as represent 
many simple ideas united by nature to form some one determinate composition as man horse tree castle etc these i call aggregate words the second are they that stand for one simple idea of such compositions and no more as red blue round square and the like these i call simple abstract words the third are those which are formed by an union an arbitrary union of both the others and of the various relations between them in greater or lesser degrees of complexity as virtue honour persuasion magistrate and the like these i call compound abstract words words i am sensible are capable of being classed into more curious distinctions but these seem to be natural and enough for our purpose and they are disposed in that order in which they are commonly taught and in which the mind gets the ideas they are substituted for i shall begin with the third sort of words compound abstracts such as virtue honour persuasion docility of these i am convinced that whatever power they may have on the passions they do not derive it from any representation raised in the mind of the things for which they stand as compositions they are not real essences and hardly cause i think any real ideas nobody i believe immediately on hearing the sounds virtue liberty or honour conceives any precise notions of the particular modes of action and thinking together with the mixed and simple ideas and the several relations of them for which these words are substituted neither has he any general idea compounded of them for if he had then some of those particular ones though indistinct perhaps and confused might come soon to be perceived but this i take it is hardly ever the case for put yourself upon analyzing one of these words and you must reduce it from one set of general words to another and then into the simple abstracts and aggregates in a much longer series than may be at first imagined before any real idea emerges to light before you come to discover anything like the first principles of such compositions and when you have made such a discovery of the original ideas the effect of the composition is utterly lost a train of thinking of this sort is much too long to be pursued in the ordinary ways of conversation nor is it at all necessary that it should such words are in reality but mere sounds but they are sounds which being used on particular occasions wherein we receive some good or suffer some evil or see others affected with good or evil or which we hear applied to other interesting things or events and being applied in such a variety of cases that we know readily by habit to what things they belong they produce in the mind whenever they are afterwards mentioned effects similar to those of their occasions the sounds being often used without reference to any particular occasion and carrying still their first impressions they at last utterly lose their connection with the particular occasions that gave rise to them yet the sound without any annexed notion continues to operate as before section three general words before ideas mr locke has somewhere observed with his usual sagacity that most general words those belonging to virtue and vice good and evil especially are taught before the particular modes of action to which they belong are presented to the mind and with them the love of the one and the abhorrence of the other for the minds of children are so ductile that a nurse or any person about a child by seeming pleased or displeased with anything or even any word may give the disposition of the child a similar turn when afterwards the several occurrences in life come to be applied to these words and that which is pleasant often appears under the name of evil and what is disagreeable to nature is called good and virtuous a strange confusion of ideas and affections arises in the minds of many and an appearance of no small contradiction between their notions and their actions there are many who love virtue and who detest vice and this is not from 
hypocrisy or affectation who notwithstanding very frequently act ill and wickedly in particulars without the least remorse because these particular occasions never came into view when the passions on the side of virtue were so warmly affected by certain words heeded originally by the breath of others and for this reason it is hard to repeat certain sets of words though owned by themselves unoperative without being in some degree affected especially if a warm and affecting tone of voice accompanies them as suppose wise valiant generous good and great these words by having no application ought to be unoperative but when words commonly sacred to great occasions are used we are affected by them even without the occasions when words which have been generally so applied are put together without any rational view or in such a manner that they do not rightly agree with each other the style is called bombast and it requires in several cases much good sense and experience to be guarded against the force of such language for when propriety is neglected a greater number of these affecting words may be taken into the service and a greater variety may be indulged in combining them section four the effect of words if words have all their possible extent of power three effects arise in the mind of the hearer the first is the sound the second the picture or representation of the thing signified by the sound the third is the affection of the soul produced by one or by both of the foregoing compounded abstract words of which we have been speaking honour justice liberty and the like produce the first and the last of these effects but not the second simple abstracts are used to signify some one simple idea without much adverting to others which may chance to attend it as blue green hot cold and the like these are capable of affecting all three of the purposes of words as the aggregate words man castle horse etc are in a yet higher degree but i am of opinion that the most general effect even of these words does not arise from their forming pictures of the several things they would represent in the imagination because on a very diligent examination of my own mind and getting others to consider theirs i do not find that once in twenty times any such picture is formed and when it is there is most commonly a particular effort of the imagination for that purpose but the aggregate words operate as i said of the compound abstracts not by presenting any image to the mind but by having from use the same effect on being mentioned that their original has when it is seen suppose we were to read a passage to this effect the river danube rises in a moist and mountainous soil in the heart of germany we are winding to and fro it waters several principalities until turning into austria and laving the walls of vienna it passes into hungary there with a vast flood augmented by the save and the drave it quits christendom and rolling through the barbarous countries which border on tartary it enters by many mouths in the black sea in this description many things are mentioned as mountains rivers cities the sea etc but let anybody examine himself and see whether he has been impressed on his imagination any pictures of a river mountain watery soil germany etc indeed it is impossible in the rapidity and quick succession of words in conversation to have ideas both of the sound of the word and of the thing represented besides some words expressing real essences are so mixed with others of a general and nominal import that it is impracticable to jump from sense to thought from particulars to generals from things to words in such a manner as to answer the purposes of life nor is it necessary that we should section five examples that words may affect without raising images i find it very hard to persuade several that their passions are affected by words from whence they have no ideas and yet harder to convince them that in the ordinary course of conversation we are sufficiently understood without raising any images of the things concerning which we speak it seems to be an odd subject of dispute with any man whether he has ideas in his mind or not of this at first view every man in his own form 
ought to judge without appeal but strange as it may appear we are often at a loss to know what ideas we have of things or whether we have any ideas at all upon some subjects it even requires a good deal of attention to be thoroughly satisfied on this head since i wrote these papers i found two very striking instances of the possibility there is that a man may hear words without having any idea of the things which they represent and yet afterwards be capable of returning them to others combined in a new way and with great propriety energy and instruction the first instance is that of mr blacklock a poet blind from his birth few men blessed with the most perfect sight can describe visual objects with more spirit and justness than this blind man which cannot possibly be attributed to his having a clearer conception of the things he describes than is common to other persons mr spence in an elegant preface which he has written to the works of this poet reasons very ingeniously and i imagine for the most part very rightly upon the cause of this extraordinary phenomenon but i cannot altogether agree with him that some improprieties in language and thought which occur in these poems have arisen from the blind poet's imperfect conception of visual objects since such improprieties and much greater may be found in writers even of a higher class than mr blacklock and who notwithstanding possess the faculty of seeing in its full perfection here is a poet doubtless as much affected by his own descriptions as any that reads them can be and yet he is affected with this strong enthusiasm by things of which he neither has nor can possibly have any idea further than that of a bare sound and why may not those who read his works be affected in the same manner that he was with as little of any real ideas of the things described the second instance is of mr saunderson professor of mathematics in the university of cambridge this learned man had acquired great knowledge in natural philosophy in astronomy and whatever sciences depend upon mathematical skill what was the most extraordinary and the most to my purpose he gave excellent lectures upon light and colours and this man taught others the theory of those ideas which they had and which he himself undoubtedly had not but it is probable that the words red blue green answer to him as well as the ideas of the colours themselves for the ideas of greater or lesser degrees of refrangibility being applied to these words and the blind man being instructed in what other respects they were found to agree or to disagree it was as easy for him to reason upon the words as if he had been fully master of the ideas indeed it must be owned he could make no new discoveries in the way of experiment he did nothing but what we do every day in common discourse when i wrote this last sentence and used the words every day in common discourse i had no images in my mind of any succession of time nor of men in conference with each other nor do i imagine that the reader will have any such ideas on reading it neither when i spoke of red or blue and green as well as refrangibility had i these several colours or the rays of light passing into a different medium and there diverted from their course painted before me in the way of images i know very well that the mind possesses a faculty of raising such images at pleasure but then an act of the will is necessary to this and in ordinary conversation or reading it is very rarely that any image at all is excited in the mind if i say i shall go to italy next summer i am well understood yet i believe nobody has by this painted in his imagination the exact figure of the speaker passing by land or by water or both sometimes on horseback sometimes in a carriage with all the particulars of the journey still less has he any idea of italy the country to which i propose to go or of the greenness of the fields the ripening of the fruits and the warmth of the air with the change to this from a different season which are the ideas for which the word summer is substituted but least of all has he any image from the word next for this word stands for the idea of many summers with the exclusion of all but one and surely the man who says next summer has no images of such a succession and such an exclusion in short it is not only of those ideas which are commonly called abstract and of which no image at all can be formed but even of particular real beings that we converse without having any idea of them excited in the imagination as will certainly appear on a diligent 
examination of our own minds indeed so little does poetry depend for its effect on the power of raising sensible images that i am convinced it would lose a very considerable part of its energy if this were the necessary result of all description because that union of affecting words which is the most powerful of all poetical instruments would frequently lose its force along with its propriety and consistency if the sensible images were always excited there is not perhaps in the whole aeneid a more grand and laboured passage than the description of vulcan's cavern in etna and the works that are there carried on virgil dwells particularly on the formation of the thunder which he describes unfinished under the hammers of the cyclops but what are the principles of this extraordinary composition tres embris torti radios tres nubis aqua sci i did durant rotuli tres ignis et alitis austri fulgoros nunc terrificos sonatumque metumque miscabant operae flamisque sequacabus iris this seems to me admirably sublime yet if we attend coolly to the kind of sensible images which a combination of ideas of this sort must form the chimeras of madmen cannot appear more wild and absurd than such a picture three rays of twisted showers three of watery clouds three of fire and three of the winged south wind then mixed they in the work terrific lightnings and sound and fear and anger with pursuing flames the strange composition is formed into a gross body it is hammered by the cyclops it is in part polished and partly continues rough the truth is if poetry gives us a noble assemblage of words corresponding to many noble ideas which are connected by circumstances of time or place or related to each other as cause and effect or associated in any natural way they may be moulded together in any form and perfectly answer their end the picturesque connection is not demanded because no real picture is formed nor is the effect of the description at all the less upon this account what is said of helen by priam and the old men of his council is generally thought to give us the highest possible idea of that fatal beauty own nemesis troas chi efconidus ac hios toward amphi genechi pollen cronon algia pashine inos athanatisi deus eus opa oiken they cried no wonder such celestial charms for nine long years have set the world in arms what winning graces what majestic mien she moves a goddess and she looks a queen pope here is not one word said of the particulars of her beauty nothing which can in the least help us to any precise idea of her person but yet we are much more touched by this manner of mentioning her than by those long and laboured descriptions of helen whether handed down by tradition or formed by fancy which are to be met with in some authors i am sure it affects me much more than the minute description which spencer has given of belphoebe though i own that there are parts in that description as there are in all the descriptions of that excellent writer extremely fine and poetical the terrible picture which lucretius has drawn of religion in order to display the magnanimity of his philosophical hero in opposing her is thought to be designed with great boldness and spirit humana ante oculus fede cum vita jacurit in terra suppressa gravi sub religione cae caput e caeli regionibus astendabat horribili super aspectu mortalibus instans primus gratias homo mortalis teleri contra est oculus ausis what idea do you derive from so excellent a picture none at all most certainly neither has the poet said a single word which might in the least serve to mark a single limb or feature of the phantom which he intended to represent in all the horrors imagination can conceive in reality poetry and rhetoric do not succeed in exact description so well as painting does their business is to affect rather by sympathy than imitation to display rather the effect of things on the mind of the speaker or of others than to present a clear idea of the things themselves this is their most extensive province and that in which they succeed the best section six poetry not strictly an imitative art 
hence we may observe that poetry taken in its most general sense cannot with strict propriety be called an art of imitation it is indeed an imitation so far as it describes the manners and passions of men which their words can express where anomi modus effort interpreta lingua there it is strictly imitation and all merely dramatic poetry is of this sort but descriptive poetry operates chiefly by substitution by the means of sounds which by custom have the effect of realities nothing is an imitation further than as it resembles some other thing and words undoubtedly have no sort of resemblance to the ideas for which they stand section seven how words influence the passions now as words affect not by any original power but by representation it might be supposed that their influence over the passions should be but light yet it is quite otherwise for we find by experience that eloquence and poetry are as capable nay indeed much more capable of making deep and lively impressions than any other arts and even than nature itself in very many cases and this arises chiefly from these three causes first that we take an extraordinary part in the passions of others and that we are easily affected and brought into sympathy by any tokens which are shown of them and there are no tokens which can express all the circumstances of most passions so fully as words so that if a person speaks upon any subject he can not only convey the subject to you but likewise the manner in which he is himself affected by it certain it is that the influence of most things on our passions is not so much from the things themselves as from our opinions concerning them and these again depend very much on the opinions of other men conveyable for the most part by words only secondly there are many things of a very affecting nature which can seldom occur in the reality but the words that represent them often do and thus they have an opportunity of making a deep impression and taking root in the mind whilst the idea of the reality was transient and to some perhaps never really occurred in any shape to whom it is notwithstanding very affecting as war death famine etc besides many ideas have never been at all presented to the senses of any men but by words as god angels devils heaven and hell all of which have however a great influence over the passions thirdly by words we have it in our power to make such combinations as we cannot possibly do otherwise by this power of combining we are able by the addition of well-chosen circumstances to give a new life and force to the simple object in painting we may represent any fine figure we please but we never can give it those enlivening touches which it may receive from words to represent an angel in a picture you can only draw a beautiful young man winged but what painting can furnish out anything so grand as the addition of one word the angel of the lord it is true i have here no clear idea but these words affect the mind more than the sensible image did which is all i contend for a picture of priam dragged to the altar's foot and there murdered if it were well executed would undoubtedly be very moving but there are very aggravating circumstances which it could never represent sanguine fedantum quos ipse sacra verat ignis as a further instance let us consider those lines of milton where he describes the travels of the fallen angels through their dismal habitation or many a dark and dreary vale they passed and many a region dolorous or many a frozen many a fiery alp rocks caves lakes fens bogs dens and shades of death a universe of death here is displayed the force of union in rocks caves lakes dens bogs fens and shades which yet would lose the greatest part of their effect if they were not the rocks caves lakes dens bogs fens and shades of death this idea or this affection caused by a word which nothing but a word could annex to the others raises a very great degree of the sublime and this sublime is raised yet higher by what follows a universe of death here are again two ideas not presentable but by language and an union of them great and amazing beyond conception if they may properly be called ideas which present no distinct image to the mind but still it would be difficult to conceive how words can move the passions which belong to real objects 
without representing these objects clearly this is difficult to us because we do not sufficiently distinguish in our observations upon language between a clear expression and a strong expression these are frequently confounded with each other though they are in reality extremely different the former regards the understanding the latter belongs to the passions the one describes a thing as it is the latter describes it as it is felt now as there is a moving tone of voice an impassioned countenance an agitated gesture which affect independently of the things about which they are exerted so there are words and certain dispositions of words which being peculiarly devoted to passionate subjects and always used by those who are under the influence of any passion touch and move us more than those which far more clearly and distinctly express the subject matter we yield to sympathy what we refuse to description the truth is all verbal description merely as naked description though never so exact conveys so poor and insufficient an idea of the thing described that it could scarcely have the smallest effect if the speaker did not call in to his aid those modes of speech that mark a strong and lively feeling in himself then by the contagion of our passions we catch a fire already kindled in another which probably might never have been struck out by the object described words by strongly conveying the passions by those means which we have already mentioned fully compensate for their weakness in other respects it may be observed that very polished languages and such as are praised for their superior clearness and perspicuity are generally deficient in strength the french language has that perfection and that defect whereas the oriental tongues and in general the languages of most unpolished people have a great force and energy of expression and this is but natural uncultivated people are but ordinary observers of things and not critical in distinguishing them but for that reason they admire more and are more affected with what they see and therefore express themselves in a warmer and more passionate manner if the affection be well conveyed it will work its effect without any clear idea often without any idea at all of the thing which has originally given rise to it it might be expected from the fertility of the subject that i should consider poetry as it regards the sublime and beautiful more at large but it must be observed that in this light it has been often and well handled already it was not my design to enter into the criticism of the sublime and beautiful in any art but to attempt to lay down such principles as may tend to ascertain to distinguish and to form a sort of standard for them which purposes i thought might be best effected by an inquiry into the properties of such things in nature as raise love and astonishment in us and by showing in what manner they operated to produce these passions words were only so far to be considered as to show upon what principle they were capable of being the representatives of these natural things and by what powers they were able to affect us often as strongly as the things they represent and sometimes much more strongly End of section sixteen Chapter 17 of the Works of the Right Honorable Edmund Burke, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Works of the Right Honorable Edmund Burke, Volume 1, by Edmund Burke. Chapter 17. A Short Account of a Late Short Administration, 1766. The late administration came into employment under the mediation of the Duke of Cumberland on the 10th day of July, 1765, and was removed upon a plan settled by the Earl of Chatham on the 30th day of July, 1766, having lasted just one year and twenty days. In that space of time, the distractions of the British Empire were composed by the repeal of the American Stamp Act but the constitutional superiority of Great Britain was preserved by the act for securing the dependence of the colonies. Private houses were relieved from the jurisdiction of the excise by the repeal of the cider tax. The personal liberty of the subject was confirmed by the resolution against general warrants. 
The lawful secrets of business and friendship were rendered inviolable by the resolution for condemning the seizure of papers. The trade of America was set free from injudicious and ruinous impositions. Its revenue was improved and settled upon a rational foundation. Its commerce extended with foreign countries, while all the advantages were secured to Great Britain by the act for repealing certain duties and encouraging, regulating, and securing the trade of this kingdom and the British dominions in America. Materials were provided and insured to our manufacturers. The sale of these manufacturers was increased. The African trade preserved and extended. The principles of the act of navigation pursued and the plan improved. And the trade for bullion rendered free, secure, and permanent by the act for opening certain ports in Dominica and Jamaica. That administration was the first which proposed and encouraged public meetings and free consultations of merchants from all parts of the kingdom, by which means the truest lights have been received. Great benefits have been already derived to manufacturers and commerce, and the most extensive prospects are opened for further improvement. Under them, the interests of our northern and southern colonies, before that time jarring and dissonant, were understood, compared, adjusted, and perfectly reconciled. The passions and animosities of the colonies, by judicious and lenient measures, were allayed and composed, and the foundation laid for a lasting agreement amongst them. Whilst that administration provided for the liberty and commerce of their country, as the true basis of its power, they consulted its interests. They asserted its honor abroad, with temper and with firmness. By making an advantageous treaty of commerce with Russia, by obtaining a liquidation of the Canada Bills, to the satisfaction of the proprietors, by reviving and raising from its ashes the negotiation for the Manila Ransom, which had been extinguished and abandoned by their predecessors. They treated their sovereign with decency, with reverence. They discountenanced, and it is hoped forever abolished, the dangerous and unconstitutional practice of removing military officers for their votes in Parliament. They firmly adhered to those friends of liberty who had run all hazards in its cause, and provided for them in preference to every other claim. With the Earl of Butte they had no personal connection, no correspondence of councils. They neither courted him nor persecuted him. They practiced no corruption, nor were they even suspected of it. They sold no offices. They obtained no reversions or pensions, either coming in or going out for themselves, their families, or their dependents. In the prosecution of their measures, they were traversed by an opposition of a new and singular character, an opposition of placemen and pensioners. They were supported by the confidence of the nation, and having held their offices under many difficulties and discouragements, they left them at the express command, as they had accepted them at the earnest request of their royal master. These are plain facts, of a clear and public nature, neither extended by elaborate reasoning, nor heightened by the coloring of eloquence. They are the services of a single year. The removal of that administration from power is not to them premature, since they were in office long enough to accomplish many plans of public utility, and, by their perseverance and resolution, rendered the way smooth and easy to their successors, having left their king and their country in a much better condition than they found them. By the temper they manifest, they seem to have now no other wish than that their successors may do the public as real and as faithful service as they have done. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18 of the Works of the Right Honourable Edmund Burke, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. The Works of the Right Honourable Edmund Burke, Volume 1, by Edmund Burke. Chapter 18. Part 1 of Observations on a Late Publication, entitled The Present State of the Nation. O oh, Taite, si quid ego adjuvero curamve lavaso, que nunc te coquit et versat sub pectore fixa, equid erit pretii? Marcus Tullius Cicero, 1769. Party divisions whether on the whole operating for good or evil, are things inseparable from free government. This is a truth which, I believe, admits little dispute, 
having been established by the uniform experience of all ages. The part a good citizen ought to take in these divisions has been a matter of much deeper controversy. But God forbid that any controversy relating to our essential morals should admit of no decision. It appears to me that this question, like most of the others which regard our duties in life, is to be determined by our station in it. Private men may be wholly neutral and entirely innocent, but they who are legally invested with public trust or stand on the high ground of rank and dignity, which is trust implied, can hardly in any case remain indifferent without the certainty of sinking into insignificance, and thereby in effect deserting that post in which, with the fullest authority and for the wisest purposes, the laws and institutions of their country have fixed them. However, if it be the office of those who are thus circumstanced to take a decided part, it is no less their duty that it should be a sober one. It ought to be circumscribed by the same laws of decorum and balanced by the same temper which bound and regulate all the virtues. In a word, we ought to act in party with all the moderation which does not absolutely enervate that vigour and quench that fervency of spirit, without which the best wishes for the public good must evaporate in empty speculation. It is probably from some such motives that the friends of a very respectable party in this kingdom have been hitherto silent. For these two years past, from one and the same quarter of politics, a continual fire has been kept upon them, sometimes from the unwieldy column of quartos and octavos, sometimes from the light squadrons of occasional pamphlets and flying sheets. Every month has brought on its periodical calumny. The abuse has taken every shape which the ability of the writers could give it. Plain invective, clumsy raillery, misrepresented anecdote. No method of vilifying the measures, the abilities, the intentions, or the persons which compose that body has been omitted. On their part nothing was opposed but patience and character. It was a matter of the most serious and indignant affliction to persons who thought themselves in conscience bound to oppose a ministry dangerous from its very constitution, as well as its measures, to find themselves, whenever they faced their adversaries, continually attacked on the rear by a set of men who pretended to be actuated by motives similar to theirs. They saw that the plan long pursued, with but too fatal a success, was to break the strength of this kingdom, by frittering down the bodies which compose it, by fermenting bitter and sanguinary animosities, and by dissolving every tie of social affection and public trust. These virtuous men, such I am warranted by public opinion to call them, were resolved rather to endure everything than to cooperate in that design. A diversity of opinion upon almost every principle of politics had indeed drawn a strong line of separation between them and some others. However, they were desirous not to extend the misfortune by unnecessary bitterness. They wished to prevent a difference of opinion on the Commonwealth from festering into rancorous and incurable hostility. Accordingly, they endeavoured that all past controversies should be forgotten, and that enough for the day should be the evil thereof. There is, however, a limit at which forbearance ceases to be a virtue. Men may tolerate injuries whilst they are only personal to themselves, but it is not the first of virtues to bear with moderation the indignities that are offered to our country. A peace has at length appeared, from the quarter of all the former attacks, which upon every public consideration demands an answer. Whilst persons more equal to this business may be engaged in affairs of greater moment, I hope I shall be excused if, in a few hours of a time not very important, and from such materials as I have by me, more than enough, however, for this purpose, 
I undertake to set the facts and arguments of this wonderful performance in a proper light. I will endeavour to state what this piece is, the purpose for which I take it to have been written, and the effect, supposing it should have any effect at all, it must necessarily produce. This piece is called The Present State of the Nation. It may be considered as a sort of digest of the avowed maxims of a certain political school, the effects of whose doctrines and practices this country will fuel long and severely. It is made up of a farrago of almost every topic which has been agitated on national affairs in parliamentary debate or private conversation for these last seven years. The oldest controversies are hauled out of the dust with which time and neglect had covered them. Arguments ten times repeated, a thousand times answered before, are here repeated again. Public accounts formerly printed and reprinted revolve once more and find their old station in this sober meridian. All the commonplace lamentations upon the decay of trade, the increase of taxes and the high price of labour and provisions are here retailed again and again in the same tone with which they have drawled through columns of gazetteers and advertisers for a century together paradoxes which affront common sense, and uninteresting barren truths which generate no conclusion, are thrown in to augment unwieldy bulk, without adding anything to weight. Because two accusations are better than one, contradictions are set staring one another in the face, without even an attempt to reconcile them, and, to give the whole a sort of pretentious air of labour and information, the table of the House of Commons is swept into this grand reservoir of politics. As to the composition, it bears a striking and whimsical resemblance to a funeral sermon, not only in the pathetic prayer with which it concludes, but in the style and tenor of the whole performance. It is piteously doleful, nodding every now and then towards dullness, well stored with pious frauds, and, like most discourses of the sort, much better calculated for the private advantage of the preacher than the edification of the hearers. The author has indeed so involved his subject that it is frequently far from being easy to comprehend his meaning. It is happy for the public that it is never difficult to fathom his design. The apparent intention of this author is to draw the most aggravated, hideous, and deformed picture of the state of this country, which his querulous eloquence, aided by the arbitrary dominion he assumes over fact, is capable of exhibiting. Had he attributed our misfortunes to their true cause, the injudicious tampering of bold, improvident and visionary ministers at one period, or to their supine negligence and traitorous dissensions at another, the complaint had been just, and might have been useful. But far the greater and much the worst part of the state which he exhibits is owing, according to his representation, not to accidental and extrinsic mischiefs attendant on the nation, but to its radical weakness and constitutional distempers. All this, however, is not without purpose. The author is in hopes that, when we are fallen into a fanatical terror for the national salvation, we shall then be ready to throw ourselves, in a sort of precipitate trust, some strange disposition of the mind jumbled up of presumption and despair, into the hands of the most pretending and forward undertaker. One such undertaker at least he has in readiness for our service. But let me assure this generous person, that however he may succeed in exciting our fears for the public danger, he will find it hard indeed to engage us to place any confidence in the system he proposes for our security. His undertaking is great. The purpose of this pamphlet, at which it aims directly or obliquely in every page, to, is to persuade the public of three or four of the most difficult points in the world, that all the advantages of the late war were on the part of the Bourbon alliance, 
that the peace of Paris perfectly consulted the dignity and interest of this country, and that the American Stamp Act was a masterpiece of policy and finance, that the only good minister this nation has enjoyed since His Majesty's accession is the Earl of Butte, and the only good managers of revenue we have seen are Lord Despenseur and Mr. George Grenville, and, under the description of men of virtue and ability, he holds them out to us as the only persons fit to put our affairs in order. Let not the reader mistake me. He does not actually name these persons, but having highly applauded their conduct in all its parts, and heavily censured every other set of men in the kingdom, he then recommends us to his men of virtue and ability. Such is the author's scheme. Whether it will answer his purpose, I know not. But surely that purpose ought to be a wonderfully good one, to warrant the methods he has taken to compass it. If the facts and reasonings in this piece are admitted, it is all over with us. The continuance of our tranquillity depends upon the compassion of our rivals. Unable to secure to ourselves the advantages of peace, we are at the same time utterly unfit for war. It is impossible, if this state of things be credited abroad, that we can have any alliance. All nations will fly from so dangerous a connection, lest, instead of being partakers of our strength, they should only become sharers in our ruin. If it is believed at home, all that firmness of mind and dignified national courage, which used to be the great support of this isle against the powers of the world, must melt away and fail within us. In such a state of things, can it be amiss if I aim at holding out some comfort to the nation? Another sort of comfort, indeed, than that which this writer provides for it, a comfort not from its physician, but from its constitution. If I attempt to show that all the arguments upon which he founds the decay of that constitution and the necessity of that physician are vain and frivolous, I will follow the author closely in his own long career, through the war, the peace, the finances, our trade and our foreign politics, not for the sake of the particular measures which he discusses, that can be of no use, they are all decided, their good is all enjoyed, or their evil incurred, but for the sake of the principles of war, peace, trade and finances. These principles are of infinite moment. They must come again and again under consideration. And it imports the public, of all things, that those of its ministers be enlarged and just and well confirmed upon all these subjects. What notions this author entertains we shall see presently. Notions, in my opinion, very irrational and extremely dangerous, and which, if they should crawl from pamphlets into councils and be realised from private speculation into national measures, cannot fail of hastening and completing our ruin. This author, after having paid his compliment to the showy appearances of the late war in our favour, is of the utmost haste to tell you that these appearances were fallacious, that they were no more than an imposition, I fear I must trouble the reader with a pretty long quotation, in order to set before him the more clearly this author's peculiar way of conceiving and reasoning. Happily, the K was then advised by ministers, who did not suffer themselves to be dazzled by the glare of brilliant appearances, but, knowing them to be fallacious, they wisely resolved to profit of their splendour before our enemies should also discover the imposition. The increase in the exports was found to have been occasioned chiefly by the demands of our own fleets and armies, and, instead of bringing wealth to the nation, was to be paid for by oppressive taxes upon the people of England. While the British seamen were consuming on board our men of war and privateers, foreign ships and foreign seamen, were employed in the transportation of our merchandise, and the carrying trade, so great a source of wealth and marine, 
was entirely engrossed by the neutral nations. The number of British ships annually arriving in our port was reduced, 1756 sail, containing 92,559 tonnes, on a medium of the Six Years' War, compared with the Six Years of Peace preceding it. The conquest of the Havana had, indeed, stopped the remittance of specie from Mexico to Spain, but it had not enabled England to seize it. On the contrary, our merchants suffered by the detention of the galleons, as their correspondents in Spain were disabled from paying them for their goods sent to America. The loss of the trade to old Spain was a further bar to an influx of specie, and the attempt upon Portugal had not only deprived us of an import of bullion from thence, but the payment of our troops employed in its defence was a fresh drain opened for the diminution of our circulating specie. The high premiums given for new loans had sunk the price of the old stock near a third of its original value, so that the purchasers had an obligation from the state to repay them with an addition of 33% to their capital. Every new loan required new taxes to be imposed. New taxes must add to the price of our manufactures and lessen their consumption among foreigners. The decay of our trade must necessarily occasion a decrease of the public revenue, and a deficiency of our funds must either be made up by fresh taxes, which would only add to the calamity, or our national credit must be destroyed, by showing the public creditors the inability of the nation to repay them their principal money. Bounties had already been given for recruits, which exceeded the year's wages of the ploughman and reaper, and as these were exhausted and husbandry stood still for want of hands, the manufacturers were next tempted to quit the anvil and the loom by higher offers. France, bankrupt France, had no such calamities impending over her. Her distresses were great, but they were immediate and temporary. Her want of credit preserved her from a great increase of debt, and the loss of her ultramarine dominions lessened her expenses. Her colonies had, indeed, put themselves into the hands of the English, but the property of her subjects had been preserved by capitulations, and a way opened for making her those remittances which the war had before suspended, with as much security as in time of peace. Her armies in Germany had been hitherto prevented from seizing upon Hanover, but they continued to encamp on the same ground on which the first battle was fought, and, as it must ever happen from the policy of that government, the last troops she sent into the field were always found to be the best, and her frequent losses only served to fill her regiments with better soldiers. The conquest of Hanover became therefore every campaign more probable. It is to be noted that the French troops received subsistence only for the last three years of the war, and that, Although large arrears were due to them at its conclusion, the charge was the less during its continuance. If any one be willing to see to how much greater lengths the author carries these ideas, he will recur to the book. This is sufficient for a specimen of his manner of thinking. I believe one reflection uniformly obtrudes itself upon every reader of these paragraphs. For what purpose, in any cause, shall we hereafter contend with France? Can we ever flatter ourselves that we shall wage a more successful war? If, on our part, in a war the most prosperous we ever carried on, by sea and by land, and in every part of the globe, attended with the unparalleled circumstance of an immense increase of trade and augmentation of revenue, if a continued series of disappointments, disgraces and defeats, followed by public bankruptcy on the part of France, if all these still leave her a gainer on the whole balance, will it not be downright frenzy in us ever to look her in the face again, or to contend with her any, even the most essential points, since victory and defeat, though by different ways, equally conduct us to our ruin? Subjection to France without a struggle will indeed be less for our honour, but on every principle of our author it must be more for our advantage. 
according to his representation of things, the question is only concerning the most easy fall. France had not discovered, our statesman tells us, at the end of that war, the triumphs of defeat and the resources which had arrived from bankruptcy. For my poor part, I do not wonder at their blindness. But the English ministers saw further. Our author has at length let foreigners also into the secret, and made them altogether as wise as ourselves. It is their own fault if, vulgato imperii arcano, they are imposed upon any longer. They are now apprised of the sentiments which the great candidate for the government of this great empire entertains, and they will act accordingly. They are taught our weakness and their own advantages. He tells the world that if France carries on the war against us in Germany, every loss she sustains contributes to the achievement of her conquest. If her armies are three years unpaid, she is the less exhausted by expense. If her credit is destroyed, she is the less oppressed with debt. If her troops are cut to pieces, they will by her policy, and a wonderful policy it is, be improved and will be supplied with much better men. If the war is carried on in the colonies, he tells them that the loss of her ultramarine dominions lessens her expenses and ensures her remittances. Per damna per cades ab ipso ducit opes animum quae ferro. If so, what is it we can do to hurt her? It will all be an imposition, all fallacious. Why, the result must be occidit, occidit, spes omnis, et fortuna nostri nominis. The only way which the author's principles leaves for our escape is to reverse our condition into that of France and to take her losing cards into our hands. But though his principles drive him to it, his politics will not suffer him to walk on this ground. Talking at our ease and of other countries, we may bear to be diverted with such speculations. But in England, we shall never be taught to look upon the annihilation of our trade, the ruin of our credit, the defeat of our armies, and the loss of our ultramarine dominions, whatever the author may think of them, to be the high road to prosperity and greatness. End of chapter 18「19 of the Works of the Right Honourable Edmund Burke, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. The Works of the Right Honourable Edmund Burke, Volume 1, by Edmund Burke. Chapter 19. Part 2 of Observations on a Late Publication, entitled The Present State of the Nation. The reader does not, I hope, imagine that I mean seriously to set about the refutation of these uningenious paradoxes and reveries without imagination. I state them only that we may discern a little in the questions of war and peace, the most weighty of all questions, what is the wisdom of those men who are held out to us as the only hope of an expiring nation. The present ministry is indeed of a strange character, at once indolent and distracted. But if a ministerial system should be formed, actuated by such maxims as are avowed in this piece, the vices of the present ministry would become their virtues. Their indolence would be the greatest of all public benefits, and a distraction that entirely defeated every one of their schemes would be our only security from destruction. To have stated these reasonings is enough, I presume, to do their business, but they are accompanied with facts and records which may seem of a little more weight. I trust, however, that the facts of this author will be as far from bearing the touchstone as his arguments. On a little inquiry, they will be found as great an imposition as the successes they are meant to depreciate, for they are all either false or fallaciously applied, or not in the least to the purpose for which they are produced. 
first the author, in order to support his favourite paradox, that our possession of the French colonies was of no detriment to France, has thought proper to inform us that they put themselves into the hands of the English. He uses the same assertion, in nearly the same words, in another place. Her colonies had put themselves into our hands. Now, in justice, not only to fact and common sense, but to the incomparable valour and perseverance of our military and naval forces thus unhandsomely traduced, I must tell this author that the French colonies did not put themselves into the hands of the English. They were compelled to submit. They were subdued by dint of English valour. Will the Five Years' War carried on in Canada, in which fell one of the principal hopes of this nation, and all the battles lost and gained during that anxious period, convince this author of his mistake? Let him inquire of Sir Geoffrey Amherst, under whose conduct that war was carried on, of Sir Charles Saunders, whose steadiness and presence of mind saved our fleet, and were so eminently serviceable in the whole course of the siege of Quebec, of General Monckton, who was shot through the body there, whether France put her colonies into the hands of the English. Though he has made no exception, yet I would be liberal to him. Perhaps he means to confine himself to her colonies in the West Indies. But surely it will fare as ill with him there as in North America, whilst we remember that in our first attempt at Martinico we were actually defeated, that it was three months before we reduced Guadeloupe, and that the conquest of the Havana was achieved by the highest conduct, aided by circumstances of the greatest good fortune. He knows the expense both of men and treasure at which we bought that place. However, if it had so pleased the peacemakers, it was no dear purchase, for it was decisive of the fortune of the war and the terms of the treaty. The Duke of Nivernois thought so. France, England, Europe considered it in that light. All the world, except the then friends of the then ministry, who wept for our victories and were in haste to get rid of the burden of our conquests. This author knows that France did not put those colonies into the hands of England, but he well knows who did put the most valuable of them into the hands of France. In the next place, our author is pleased to consider the conquest of those colonies in no other light than as a convenience for the remittances to France, which he asserts that the war had before suspended, but for which a way was opened, by our conquest, as secure as in time of peace. I charitably hope he knows nothing of the subject. I referred him lately to our commanders for the resistance of the French colonies. I now wish he would apply to our custom-house entries and our merchants for the advantages which we derived from them. In 1761, there was no entry of goods from any of the conquered places but Guadeloupe. In that year it stood thus. Imports from Guadeloupe, value, 482,179 pounds. In 1762, when we had not yet delivered up our conquests, the account was Guadeloupe, 513,244 pounds, Martinico, 288,425 pounds. Total imports in 1762, value, 801,669 pounds. In 1763, after we had delivered up the sovereignty of these islands, but kept open a communication with them, the imports were Guadeloupe, four hundred and twelve thousand three hundred and three pounds martinico three hundred and forty four thousand one hundred and sixty one pounds havana two hundred and forty nine thousand three hundred and eighty six pounds total imports in seventeen sixty three value one million five thousand and eight hundred and fifty pounds besides I find in the account of bullion imported and brought to the bank that during that period in which the intercourse with the Havana was open, we received at that one shop 
in treasure from that one place, five hundred and fifty nine thousand eight hundred and ten pounds. In the year seventeen sixty three, three hundred and eighty nine thousand four hundred and fifty pounds. So that the import from these places in that year amounted to one million three hundred and ninety five thousand three hundred pounds. On this state, the reader will observe that I take the imports from and not the exports to these conquests as the measure of the advantages which we derived from them. I do so for reasons which will be somewhat worthy the attention of such readers as are fond of this species of inquiry. I say therefore I choose the import article as the best and indeed the only standard we can have of the value of the West India trade. Our export entry does not comprehend the greatest trade we carry on with any of the West India islands, the sale of Negroes, nor does it give any idea of two other advantages we draw from them, the remittances for money spent here and the payment of part of the balance of the North American trade. It is therefore quite ridiculous to strike a balance merely on the face of an excess of imports and exports in that commerce though in most foreign branches it is, on the whole, the best method. If we should take that standard, it would appear that the balance with our own islands is, annually, several hundred thousand pounds against this country. Such is its aspect on the Custom House entries, but we know the direct contrary to be the fact. We know that the West Indians are always indebted to our merchants, and that the value of every shilling of West India produce is English property, so that our import from them, and not our export, ought always to be considered as their true value, and this corrective ought to be applied to all general balances of our trade, which are formed on the ordinary principles. If possible, this was more emphatically true of the French West India islands, whilst they continued in our hands that none, or only a very contemptible part, of the value of this produce could be remitted to France, the author will see, perhaps with unwillingness, but with the clearest conviction, if he considers, that in the year 1763, after we had ceased to export to the isles of Guadeloupe and Martinico, and to the Havana, and after the colonies were free to send all their produce to old France and Spain, if they had any remittance to make, he will see that we imported from those places in that year to the amount of one million three hundred and ninety five thousand three hundred pounds. So far was the whole annual produce of these islands from being adequate to the payments of their annual call upon us, that this mighty additional importation was necessary, though not quite sufficient, to discharge the debts contracted in the few years we held them. The property, therefore, of their whole produce was ours, not only during the war, but even for more than a year after the peace. The author, I hope, will not again venture upon so rash and discouraging a proposition concerning the nature and effect of those conquests, as to call them a convenience to the remittances of France. He sees by this account that what he asserts is not only without foundation, but even impossible to be true. As to our trade at that time, he labours with all his might to represent it as absolutely ruined, or on the very edge of ruin. Indeed, as usual with him, he is often as equivocal in his expression as he is clear in his design. Sometimes he more than insinuates a decay of our commerce in that war. Sometimes he admits an increase of exports. But it is in order to depreciate the advantages we might appear to derive from that increase, whenever it should come to be proved against him. He tells you that it was chiefly occasioned by the demands of our own fleets and armies, and, instead of bringing wealth to the nation, was to be paid for by oppressive taxes upon the people of England. Never was anything more destitute of foundation. It might be proved with the greatest ease, from the nature and quality of the goods exported, as well as from the situation of the places to which our merchandise was sent, and which the war could no wise affect, that the supply of our fleets and armies could not have been the cause of this wonderful increase of trade. Its cause was evident to the whole world. 
the ruin of the trade of France and our possession of her colonies. What wonderful effects this cause produced, the reader will see below, and he will form on that account some judgment of the author's candor or information. Admit, however, that a great part of our export, though nothing is more remote from fact, was owing to the supply of our fleets and armies, was it not something, was it not peculiarly fortunate for a nation, that she was able from her own bosom to contribute largely to the supply of her armies, militating in so many distant countries? The author allows that France did not enjoy the same advantages, but it is remarkable throughout his whole book that those circumstances which have ever been considered as great benefits and decisive proofs of national superiority are, when in our hands, taken either in diminution of some other apparent advantage, or even sometimes as positive misfortunes. The optics of that politician must be of a strange confirmation who beholds everything in this distorted shape. So far as to our trade. With regard to our navigation, he is still more uneasy at our situation, and still more fallacious in his state of it. In his text, he affirms it to have been entirely engrossed by the neutral nations. This he asserts roundly and boldly, and without the least concern, though it cost no more than a single glance of the eye upon his own margin to see the full refutation of this assertion. His own accounts proves against him that, in the year 1761, the British shipping amounted to 527,557 tons, the foreign to no more than 180,102. The medium of his six years British, 2,449,555 tons, foreign only 906,690. This state, his own, demonstrates that the neutral nations did not entirely engross our navigation. I am willing from a strain of candor to admit that this author speaks at random, that he is only slovenly and inaccurate, and not fallacious. In matters of account, however, this want of care is not excusable, and the difference between neutral nations entirely engrossing our navigation, and being only subsidiary to a vastly augmented trade, makes a most material difference to his argument. From that principle of fairness, though the author speaks otherwise, I am willing to suppose he means no more than that our navigation had so declined as to alarm us with the probable loss of this valuable object. I shall, however, show that his whole proposition, whatever modifications he may please to give it, is without foundation, that our navigation had not decreased, that, on the contrary, it had greatly increased in the war, that it had increased by the war, and that it was probable the same cause would continue to augment it to a still greater height. To what an height it is hard to say, had our success continued. But first I must observe, I am much less solicitous whether his fact be true or no, than whether his principle is well established. Cases are dead things. Principles are living and productive. I affirm then that, if in time of war our trade had the good fortune to increase, and at the same time a large, nay, the largest proportion of carriage had been engrossed by neutral nations, it ought not in itself to have been considered as a circumstance of distress. War is a time of inconvenience to trade. In general it must be straightened, and must find its way as it can. It is often happy for nations that they are able to call in neutral navigation. They all aim at it. France endeavoured at it, but could not compass it. Will this author say that, in a war with Spain, such an assistance would not be of absolute necessity, that it would not be the most gross of all follies to refuse it? In the next place, his method of stating a medium of six years of war and six years of peace to decide this question, is altogether unfair. 
to say in derogation of the advantages of a war that navigation is not equal to what it was in time of peace is what hitherto has never been heard of no war ever bore that test but the war which he so bitterly laments one may lay it down as a maxim that an average estimate of an object in a steady course of rising or of falling must in its nature be an unfair one more particularly if the cause of the rise or fall be visible and its continuance in any degree probable average estimates are never just but when the object fluctuates and no reason can be assigned why it should not continue still to fluctuate. The author chooses to allow nothing at all for this. He has taken an average of six years of the war. He knew, for everybody knows, that the first three years were on the whole rather unsuccessful, and that, in consequence of this ill success, trade sunk, and navigation declined with it. But that grand delusion of the three last years turned the scale in our favour. At the beginning of that war, as in the commencement of every war, traders were struck with a sort of panic. Many went out of the freighting business. But by degrees, as the war continued, the terror wore off. The danger came to be better appreciated and better provided against. Our trade was carried on in large fleets, under regular convoys and with great safety. The freighting business revived. The ships were fewer, but much larger, and though the number decreased, the tonnage was vastly augmented, insomuch that in 1761 the British shipping had risen by the author's own account to 527,557 tons. In the last year he has given us of the peace, it amounted to no more than 494,000 772. That is, in the last year of the war, it was 32,785 tonnes more than in the correspondent year of his peace average. No year of the peace exceeded it except one, and that but little. The fair account of the matter is this. Our trade had, as we have just seen, increased to so astonishing a degree in 1761 as to employ British and foreign ships to the amount of 707,659 tonnes, which is 149,500 more than we employed in the last year of the peace. Thus our trade increased more than a fifth. Our British navigation had increased likewise with this astonishing increase of trade, but was not able to keep pace with it and we added about 120,000 tonnes of foreign shipping to the 60,000 which had been employed in the last year of the peace. Whatever happened to our shipping in the former years of the war, this would be no true state of the case at the time of the treaty. If we had lost something in the beginning, we had then recovered, and more than recovered, all our losses. Such is the ground of the doleful complaints of the author, that, the carrying trade was wholly engrossed by the neutral nations. I have done fairly, and even very moderately, in taking this year, and not his average, as the standard of what might be expected in future, had the war continued. The author will be compelled to allow it, unless he undertakes to show, first, that the possession of Canada, Martinico, Guadeloupe, Granada, the Havana, the Philippines, the whole African trade, the whole East India trade, and the whole Newfoundland fishery had no certain inevitable tendency to increase the British shipping, unless, in the second place, he can prove that those trades were, or might be, by law or indulgence, carried on in foreign vessels, and unless, thirdly, he can demonstrate that the premium of insurance on British ships was rising as the war continued. He can prove not one of these points. I will show him a fact more that is mortal to his assertions. It is the state of our shipping in 1762. The author had his reasons for stopping short at the preceding year. It would have appeared, had he proceeded farther, that our tonnage was in a course of uniform augmentation, 
owing to the freight derived from our foreign conquests and to the perfect security of our navigation from our clear and decided superiority at sea. This, I say, would have appeared from the state of the two years. 1761, British, 527,557 tons. 1762, ditto, 559,537 tons. 1761, foreign, 180,102 tons. 1762, ditto, 129,502 tons. The last two years of the peace were in no degree equal to these. Much of the navigation of 1763 was also owing to the war. This is manifest from the large part of it employed in the carriage from the ceded islands, with which the communication still continued open. No such circumstances of glory and advantage ever attended upon a war. Too happy will be our lot if we should again be forced into a war to behold anything that shall resemble them, and if we were not then the better for them, it is not in the ordinary course of God's providence to mend our condition. In vain does the author declaim on the high premiums given for the loans during the war. His long note swelled with calculations on that subject, even supposing the most inaccurate of all calculations to be just, would be entirely thrown away did it not serve to raise a wonderful opinion of his financial skill in those who are not less surprised than edified, when, with a solemn face and mysterious air, they are told that two and two make four. For what else do we learn from this note? That the more expense incurred by a nation, the more money will be required to defray it. That in proportion to the continuance of that expense will be the continuance of borrowing, that the increase of borrowing and the increase of debt will go hand in hand, and lastly, that the more money you want, the harder it will be to get it, and that the scarcity of the commodity will enhance the price. Who ever doubted the truth or the insignificance of these propositions? What do they prove? That war is expensive and peace desirable. They contain nothing more than a commonplace against war, the easiest of all topics. To bring them home to his purpose, he ought to have shown that our enemies had money upon better terms, which he has not shown, neither can he. I shall speak more fully to this point in another place. He ought to have shown that the money they raised, upon whatever terms, had procured them a more lucrative return. He knows that our expenditure purchased commerce and conquest, Theirs acquired nothing but defeat and bankruptcy. Thus, the author has laid down his ideas on the subject of war. Next follow those he entertains on that of peace. The Treaty of Paris, upon the whole, has his approbation. Indeed, if his account of the war be just, he might have spared himself all further trouble. The rest is drawn on as an inevitable conclusion. If the House of Bourbon had the advantage, she must give the law, and the peace, though it were much worse than it is, had still been a good one. But as the world is yet deluded on the state of that war, other arguments are necessary, and the author has, in my opinion, very ill supplied them. He tells of many things we have got, and of which he has made out a kind of bill. This matter may be brought within a very narrow compass, if we come to consider the requisites of a good peace under some plain, distinct heads. I apprehend they may be reduced to these. 1. Stability. 2. Indemnification. 3. Alliance. As to the first, the author more than obscurely hints in several places that he thinks the peace not likely to last. However, he does furnish a security a security, in any light I fear, but insufficient, on his hypothesis, surely a very odd one. By stipulating for the entire possession of the continent, says he, the restored French islands are become in some measure dependent on the British Empire, and the good faith of France in observing the treaty 
guaranteed by the value at which she estimates their possession. This author soon grows weary of his principles. They seldom last him for two pages together. When the advantages of the war were to be depreciated, then the loss of the ultramarine colonies lightened the expenses of France, facilitated her remittances, and therefore her colonists put them into our hands. According to this author's system, the actual possession of those colonies ought to give us little or no advantage in the negotiation for peace, and yet the chance of possessing them on a future occasion gives a perfect security for the preservation of that peace. The conquest of the Havana, if it did not serve Spain, rather distressed England, says our author. But the molestation which her galleons may suffer from our station in Pensacola gives us advantages, for which we were not allowed to credit the nation for the Havana itself, a place surely fully as well situated for every external purpose as Pensacola, and of more internal benefit than 10,000 Pensacolas. The author sets very little by conquests. I suppose it is because he makes them so very likely. On this subject he speaks with the greatest certainty imaginable. We have, according to him, nothing to do but to go and take possession, whenever we think proper, of the French and Spanish settlements. It were better that he had examined a little what advantage the peace gave us towards the invasion of these colonies, which we did not possess before the peace. It would not have been amiss if he had consulted the public experience and our commanders concerning the absolute certainty of those conquests on which he is pleased to found our security. And if, after all, he should have discovered them to be so very sure and so very easy, he might at least, to preserve consistency, have looked a few pages back and, no unpleasing thing to him, listened to himself, where he says that the most successful enterprise could not compensate to the nation for the waste of its people by carrying on war in unhealthy climates. A position which he repeats again, page 9, so that, according to himself, his security is not worth the suit. According to fact, he has only a chance, God knows what a chance, of getting at it, and therefore, according to reason, the giving up the most valuable of all possessions, in hopes to conquer them back, under any advantage of situation, is the most ridiculous security that ever was imagined for the peace of a nation. It is true his friends did not give up Canada. They could not give up everything. Let us make the most of it. We have Canada. We know its value. We have not the French any longer to fight in North America, and from this circumstance we derive considerable advantages. But here let me rest a little. The author touches upon a string which sounds under his fingers but a tremulous and melancholy note. North America was once indeed a great strength to this nation, in opportunity of ports, in ships, in provisions, in men. We found her a sound, an active, a vigorous member of the empire. I hope, by wise management, she will again become so. But one of our capital present misfortunes is her discontent and disobedience. To which of the author's favourites this discontent is owing, we all know but too sufficiently. It would be a dismal event if this foundation of his security, and indeed of all our public strength, should, in reality, become our weakness. And if all the powers of this empire, which ought to fall with a compacted weight upon the head of our enemies, should be dissipated and distracted by a jealous vigilance, or by hostile attempts upon one another. Ten Canadas cannot restore that security for the peace, and for everything valuable to this country, which we have lost along with the affection and the obedience of our colonies. He is the wise minister, he is the true friend to Britain, who shall be able to restore it. To return to the security for the peace, the author tells us 
that the original great purposes of the war were more than accomplished by the treaty. Surely he has experience and reading enough to know that, in the course of a war, events may happen that render its original very far from being its principal purpose. This original may dwindle by circumstances, so as to become not a purpose of the second or even the third magnitude. I trust this is so obvious that it will not be necessary to put cases for its illustration. In that war, as soon as Spain entered into the quarrel, the security of North America was no longer the sole nor the foremost object. The family compact had been, I know, not how long before in agitation. But then it was that we saw produced into daylight an action, the most odious and most formidable of all the conspiracies against the liberties of Europe that ever has been framed. The war with Spain was the first fruits of that league, and a security against that league ought to have been the fundamental point of a pacification with the powers who compose it. We had materials in our hands to have constructed that security in such a manner as never to be shaken. But how did the virtuous and able men of our author labour for this great end? They took no one step towards it. On the contrary, they countenanced, and indeed, as far as it depended on them, recognised it in all its parts, for our plenipotentiary treated with those who acted for the two crowns as if they had been different ministers of the same monarch. The Spanish minister received his instructions not from Madrid, but from Versailles. This was not hid from our ministers at home, and the discovery ought to have alarmed them, if the good of their country had been the object of their anxiety. They could not but have seen that the whole Spanish monarchy was melted down into the cabinet of Versailles. But they thought this circumstance an advantage, as it enabled them to go through with their work the more expeditiously. Expedition was everything to them, because France might happen during a protracted negotiation to discover the great imposition of our victories. In the same spirit they negotiated the terms of the peace. If it were thought advisable not to take any positive security from Spain, the most obvious principles of policy dictated that the burden of the sessions ought to fall upon France, and that everything which was of grace and favour should be given to Spain. Spain could not, on her part, have executed a capital article in the family compact, which obliged her to compensate the losses of France. At least she could not do it in America, for she was expressly precluded by the Treaty of Utrecht from ceding any territory or giving any advantage in trade to that power. What did our ministers do? They took from Spain the territory of Florida, an object of no value except to show our dispositions to be quite equal, at least, towards both powers and they enabled France to compensate Spain by the gift of Louisiana, loading us with all the harshness, leaving the act of kindness with France, and opening thereby a door to the fulfilling of this, the most consolidating article of the family compact. Accordingly, that dangerous league, thus abetted and authorised by the English ministry, without an attempt to invalidate it in any way, or in any of its parts, exists to this hour and has grown stronger and stronger every hour of its existence. As to the second component of a good piece, compensation, I have but little trouble. The author has said nothing upon that head. He has nothing to say. After a war of such expense, this ought to have been a capital consideration, but on what he has been so prudently silent, I think it right to speak plainly. All our new acquisitions together, at this time, scarce afford matter of revenue, either at home or abroad, sufficient to defray the expense of their establishments. Not one shilling towards the reduction of our debt. Guadeloupe or Martinico alone would have given us material aid, much in the way of duties, much in the way of trade and navigation. A good ministry would have considered how a renewal of the asiento might have been obtained. 
we had as much right to ask it at the Treaty of Paris as at the Treaty of Utrecht. We had incomparably more in our hands to purchase it. Floods of treasure would have poured into this kingdom from such a source, and, under proper management, no small part of it would have taken a public direction and have fructified an exhausted exchequer. If this gentleman's hero of finance, instead of flying from a treaty, which, though he now defends, he could not approve and would not oppose, if he, instead of shifting into an office, which removed him from the manufacture of the treaty, had, by his credit with the then great director, acquired for us these, or any of these objects, the possession of Guadeloupe or Martinico, or the renewal of the Asiento, he might have held his head high in his country, because he would have performed real service, ten thousand times more real service, than all the economy of which this writer is perpetually talking, or all the little tricks of finance which the expertest juggler of the treasury can practice, could amount to in a thousand years. But the occasion is lost, the time is gone, perhaps for ever. As to the third requisite, alliance, there too the author is silent. What strength of that kind did they acquire? They got no one new ally, they stripped the enemy of not a single old one. They disgusted, how justly or unjustly matters not, every ally we had, and from that time to this we stand friendless in Europe. But of this naked condition of their country, I know some people are not ashamed. They have their system of politics. Our ancestors grew great by another. In this manner, these virtuous men concluded the peace, and their practice is only consonant to their theory. Many things more might be observed on this curious head of our author's speculations, but, taking leave of what the writer says in his serious part, if he be serious in any part, I shall only just point out a piece of his pleasantry. No man, I believe, ever denied that the time for making peace is that in which the best terms may be obtained. But what that time is, together with the use that has been made of it, we are to judge by seeing whether terms adequate to our advantages and to our necessities have been actually obtained. Here is the pinch of the question to which the author ought to have set his shoulders in earnest. Instead of doing this, he slips out of the harness by a jest, and sneeringly tells us that, to determine this point, we must know the secrets of the French and Spanish cabinets, and that Parliament was pleased to approve the Treaty of Peace without calling for the correspondence concerning it. How just this sarcasm on that Parliament may be, I say not, but how becoming in the author, I leave it to his friends to determine. End of section 19Chapter 20 of the Works of the Right Honourable Edmund Burke, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. The Works of the Right Honourable Edmund Burke, Volume 1 by Edmund Burke. Chapter 20 Part 3 of observations on a late publication entitled The Present State of the Nation. Having thus gone through the questions of war and peace, the author proceeds to state our debt and the interest which it carried at the time of the treaty, with the unfairness and inaccuracy, however, which distinguish all his assertions and all his calculations. To detect every fallacy and rectify every mistake would be endless, it will be enough to point out a few of them, in order to show how unsafe it is to place anything like an implicit trust in such a writer. The interest of debt contracted during the war is stated by the author at £2,614,892. The particulars appear in pages 14 and 15. 
Among them is stated the unfunded debt, £9,975,017, supposed to carry interest on a medium at 3%, which amounts to £299,250. We are referred to the Considerations on the Trade and Finances of the Kingdom, page 22, for the particulars of that unfunded debt. Turn to the work, and to the place referred to by the author himself, if you have a mind to see a clear detection of a capital fallacy of this article in his account. You will see there that this unfunded debt consists of the nine following articles. The remaining subsidy to the Duke of Brunswick, the remaining dédommagement to the Landgrave of Hesse, the German demands, the army and ordnance extraordinaries, the deficiencies of grants and funds, Mr. Touché's claim, the debts due to Nova Scotia and Barbados, exchequer bills, and navy debt. The extreme fallacy of this state cannot escape any reader who will be at the pains to compare the interest money, with which he affirms us to have been loaded, in his State of the Nation, with the items of the principal debt to which he refers in his Considerations. The reader must observe that of this long list of nine articles, only two, the Exchequer Bills and part of the Navy debt, carried any interest at all. The first amounted to £1,800,000, and this undoubtedly carried interest. The whole Navy debt indeed amounted to £4,576,915, but of this only a part carried interest. The author of the Considerations, etc., labours to prove this very point in page 18, and Mr. G. has always defended himself upon the same ground for the insufficient provision he made for the discharge of that debt. The reader may see their own authority for it. Mr. G. did in fact provide no more than £2,150,000 for the discharge of these bills in two years. It is much to be wished that these gentlemen would lay their heads together, that they would consider well this matter, and agree upon something. For when the scanty provision made for the unfunded debt is to be vindicated, then we are told it is a very small part of that debt which carries interest. But when the public is to be represented in a miserable condition, and the consequences of the late war to be laid before us in dreadful colours, then we are to be told that the unfunded debt is within a trifle of ten millions, and so large a portion of it carries interest that we must not compute less than three per cent upon the whole. In the year 1764, Parliament voted £650,000 towards the discharge of the Navy debt. This sum could not be applied solely to the discharge of bills carrying interest, because part of the debt due on seamen's wages must have been paid, and some bills carried no interest at all. Notwithstanding this, we find by an account in the journals of the House of Commons, in the following session, that the Navy debt carrying interest was, on the 31st of December, 1764, no more than £1,687,442. I am sure, therefore, that I admit too much when I admit the Navy debt carrying interest after the creation of the Navy annuities in the year 1763, to have been £2,200,000. Add the Exchequer bills, and the whole unfunded debt carrying interest will be four millions instead of ten, and the annual interest paid for it at four per cent will be £160,000 instead of £299,250, an error of no small magnitude and which could not have been owing to inadvertency. The misrepresentation of the increase of the peace establishment is still more extraordinary than that of the interest of the unfunded debt. The increase is great, undoubtedly. However, the author finds no fault with it, and urges it only as a matter of argument to support the strange chimerical proposals he is to make us in the close of his work for the increase of revenue. The greater he made that establishment, the stronger he expected to stand in argument. But, 
whatever he expected or proposed, he should have stated the matter fairly. He tells us that this establishment is nearly one million five hundred thousand pounds more than it was in 1752, 1753 and other years of peace. This he has done in his usual manner by assertion, without troubling himself either with proof or probability. For he has not given us any state of the peace establishment in the years 1753 and 1754, the time which he means to compare with the present. As I am obliged to force him to that position, from which he always flies as from his most dangerous enemy, I have been at the trouble to search the journals in the period between the two last wars, and I find that the peace establishment, consisting of the navy, the ordnance, and the several incidental expenses, amounted to two million three hundred and forty six thousand five hundred and ninety four pounds. Now is this writer wild enough to imagine that the peace establishment of seventeen sixty four and the subsequent years, made up from the same articles, is three million eight hundred thousand pounds and upwards? His assertion, however, goes to this, but I must take the liberty of correcting him in this gross mistake, and from an authority he cannot refuse, from his favourite work and standing authority, the Considerations. We find there, page 43, the peace establishment of 1764 and 1765, stated at £3,609,700. This is near £200,000 less than that given in the State of the Nation. But even from this, in order to render the articles which compose the peace establishment in the two periods correspondent, for otherwise they cannot be compared, we must deduct first his articles of the deficiency of land and malt, which amount to £300,000. They certainly are no part of the establishment, nor are they included in that sum, which I have stated above for the establishment in the time of the former peace. If they were proper to be stated at all, they ought to be stated in both accounts. We must also deduct the deficiencies of funds, £202,400. These deficiencies are the difference between the interest charged on the public for monies borrowed and the produce of the tax laid for the discharge of that interest. Annual provision is indeed to be made for them by Parliament, but in the inquiry before us, which is only what charge is brought on the public by interest paid, or to be paid for money borrowed, the utmost that the author should do is to bring into the account the full interest for all that money. This he has done in page 15, and he repeats it in page 18, the very page I am now examining, £2,614,892. To comprehend afterwards in the peace establishment, the deficiency of the fund created for payment of that interest, would be laying twice to the account of the war part of the same sum. Suppose ten millions borrowed at four per cent, and the fund for payment of the interest to produce no more than two hundred thousand pounds. The whole annual charge on the public is four hundred thousand pounds. It can be no more. But to charge the interest in one part of the account, and then the deficiency in the other, would be charging £600,000. The deficiency of funds must therefore be also deducted from the peace establishment in the considerations, and then the peace establishment in that author will be reduced to the same articles with those included in the sum I have already mentioned for the peace establishment before the last war in the year 1753 and 1754. Peace establishment in the considerations three million six hundred and nine thousand seven hundred pounds deduct deficiency of land and malt three hundred thousand pounds ditto of funds two hundred and two thousand four hundred pounds total three million one hundred and seven thousand three hundred pounds peace establishment before the late war in which no deficiencies of land and malt or funds are included two million £346,594. Difference, 
seven hundred and sixty thousand seven hundred and six pounds being about half the sum which our author has been pleased to suppose it let us put the whole together the author states difference of peace establishment before and since the war one million five hundred thousand pounds interest of debt contracted by the war two million six hundred and fourteen thousand eight hundred and ninety two pounds total four million one hundred and fourteen thousand eight hundred and ninety two pounds the real difference in the peace establishment is seven hundred and sixty thousand seven hundred and six pounds the actual interest of the funded debt including that charged on the sinking fund two million three hundred and fifteen thousand six hundred and forty two pounds the actual interest of unfunded debt at most one hundred and sixty thousand pounds total interest of debt contracted by the war two million four hundred and seventy five thousand six hundred and forty two pounds increase of peace establishment and interest of new debt three million two hundred and thirty six thousand three hundred and forty eight pounds error of the author eight hundred and seventy eight thousand five hundred and forty four pounds it is true the extraordinaries of the army have been found considerably greater than the author of the considerations was pleased to foretell they would be the author of the present state avails himself of that increase and finding it suit his purpose sets the whole down in the peace establishment of the present times if this is allowed him his error perhaps may be reduced to seven hundred thousand pounds but i doubt the author of the considerations will not thank him for admitting two hundred thousand pounds and upwards as the peace establishment for extraordinaries when that author has so much laboured to confine them within thirty five thousand pounds these are some of the capital fallacies of the author to break the thread of my discourse as little as possible i have thrown into the margin many instances though god knows far from the whole of his inaccuracies inconsistencies and want of common care i think myself obliged to take some notice of them in order to take off from any authority this writer may have and to put an end to the deference which careless men are apt to pay to one who boldly arrays his accounts and marshals his figures in perfect confidence that their correctness will never be examined however for argument i am content to take his state of it the debt was and is enormous the war was expensive the best economy had not perhaps been used but i must observe that war and economy are things not easily reconciled and that the attempt of leaning towards parsimony in such a state may be the worst management and in the end the worst economy in the world hazarding the total loss of all the charge incurred and of everything along with it but cui bono all this detail of our debt has the author given a single light towards any material reduction of it not a glimmering we shall see in its place what sort of thing he proposes but before he commences his operations in order to scare the public imagination he raises by art magic a thick mist before our eyes through which glare the most ghastly and horrible phantoms hunc igitur terrorem animi tenebrasque necesses est non radii solis neque lucida tela dei discutiant sed nature species ratioque let us therefore calmly if we can for the fright into which he has put us appreciate those dreadful and deformed gorgons and hydras which inhabit the joyless regions of an imagination fruitful in nothing but the production of monsters his whole representation is founded on the supposed operation of our debt upon our manufactures and our trade to this cause he attributes a certain supposed dearness of the necessaries of life which must compel our manufacturers to emigrate to cheaper countries particularly to france and with them the manufacture thence consumption declining and with it revenue he will not permit the real balance of our trade to be estimated so high 
as two million five hundred thousand pounds, and the interest of the debt to foreigners carries off one million five hundred thousand pounds of that balance. France is not in the same condition. Then follow his wailings and lamentations, which he renews over and over according to his custom, a declining trade and decreasing specie on the point of becoming tributary to France, of losing Ireland, of having the colonies torn away from us. The first thing upon which I shall observe is, what he takes for granted as the clearest of all propositions, the emigration of our manufacturers to France, I undertake to say that this assertion is totally groundless, and I challenge the author to bring any sort of proof of it. If living is cheaper in France, that is, to be had for less specie, wages are proportionably lower. No manufacturer, let the living be what it will, was ever known to fly for refuge to low wages. Money is the first thing which attracts him. Accordingly, our wages attract artificers from all parts of the world. From two shillings to one shilling is a fall in all men's imaginations, which no calculation upon a difference in the price of the necessaries of life can compensate. But it will be hard to prove that a French artificer is better fed, clothed, lodged and warmed than one in England. For that is the sense, and the only sense, of living cheaper. If, in truth and fact, our artificer fares as well in all these respects as one in the same state in France, how stands the matter in point of opinion and prejudice, the springs by which people in that class of life are chiefly actuated? The idea of our common people concerning French living is dreadful, altogether as dreadful as our authors can possibly be of the state of his own country, a way of thinking that will hardly ever prevail on them to desert to France. But, leaving the author's speculations, the fact is that they have not deserted, and of course the manufacture cannot be departed, or departing with them. I am not indeed able to get at all the details of our manufactures, though I think I have taken full as much pains for that purpose as our author. Some I have by me, and they do not hitherto, thank God, support the author's complaint, unless a vast increase in the quantity of goods manufactured be a proof of losing the manufacture. On a view of the registers in the West Riding of Yorkshire, for three years before the war, and for the three last, it appears that the quantity of cloths entered were as follows. 1752. Pieces broad, 60,724. Pieces narrow, 72,442. 1753. Pieces broad, 55,358. Pieces narrow, 71,618. 1754. Pieces broad, 56,070. Pieces narrow, 72,394. Total pieces broad, 172,152. Total pieces narrow, 216,454. 1765. Pieces broad, 54,660. Pieces narrow, 77,419. 1766. Pieces broad, 72,575. Pieces narrow, 78,893. 1767. Pieces broad, 102,428. Pieces narrow, 78,819. Three years ending 1767. Pieces broad, 229,663. Pieces narrow, 235,131. Three years ending 1754. Pieces broad, 172,152. Pieces narrow, 216,464. Increase, pieces broad, 57,511. Pieces narrow, 18,677. In this manner, this capital branch of manufacture has increased under the increase of taxes. 
and this is not from a declining, but from a greatly flourishing period of commerce. I may say the same on the best authority of the fabric of thin goods at Halifax, of the bays at Rochdale, and of that infinite variety of admirable manufactures that grow and extend every year among the spirited, inventive, and enterprising traders of Manchester. A trade sometimes seems to perish when it only assumes a different form. Thus the coarsest woollens were formerly exported in great quantities to Russia. The Russians now supply themselves with these goods. But the export thither of finer cloths has increased in proportion as the other has declined. Possibly some parts of the kingdom may have felt something like a languor in business. Objects like trade and manufacture, which the very attempt to confine would certainly destroy, frequently change their place, and thereby, far from being lost, are often highly improved. Thus some manufactures have decayed in the west and south, which have made new and more vigorous shoots when transplanted into the north. And here it is impossible to pass by, though the author has said nothing upon it, the vast addition to the mass of British trade, which has been made by the improvement of Scotland. What does he think of the commerce of the city of Glasgow, and of the manufactures of Paisley and all the adjacent country? Has this anything like the deadly aspect, and Facies Hippocratica, which the false diagnostic of our state physician has given to our trade in general? Has he not heard of the ironworks of such magnitude, even in their cradle, which are set up on the Caron, and which at the same time have drawn nothing from Sheffield, Birmingham, or Wolverhampton? This might perhaps be enough to show the entire falsity of the complaint concerning the decline of our manufactures. But every step we advance, this matter clears up more, and the false terrors of the author are dissipated, and fade away as the light appears. The trade and manufactures of this country, says he, going to ruin, and a diminution of our revenue from consumption, must attend the loss of so many seamen and artificers. Nothing more true than the general observation, nothing more false than its application to our circumstances. Let the revenue on consumption speak for itself, Average of net excise since the new duties, three years ending 1767, £4,590,734. Ditto before the new duties, three years ending 1759, £3,261,694. Average increase, £1,329,040. Here is no diminution. Here is, on the contrary, an immense increase. This is owing, I shall be told, to the new duties, which may increase the total bulk, but at the same time may make some diminution of the produce of the old. Were this the fact, it would be far from supporting the author's complaint. It might have proved that the burden lay rather too heavy, but it would never prove that the revenue from consumption was impaired which it was his business to do. But what is the real fact? Let us take, as the best instance for the purpose, the produce of the old hereditary and temporary excise granted in the reign of Charles II, whose object is that of most of the new impositions, from two averages, each of eight years. Average, first period, eight years, ending 1754, 525,317 pounds. Ditto, second period, eight years ending 1767, 538,542 pounds. Increase, 613,225 pounds. I have taken these averages as including in each a war and a peace period, the first before the imposition of the new duties, the other since those impositions, and such is the state of the oldest branch of the revenue from consumption. Besides the acquisition of so much new, this article, to speak of no other, has rather increased under the pressure of all those additional taxes to which the author is pleased to attribute its destruction. But as the author has made his grand effort against those moderate, judicious and necessary levies, 
which support all the dignity, the credit, and the power of his country, the reader will excuse a little further detail on this subject, that we may see how little oppressive those taxes are on the shoulders of the public, with which he labours so earnestly to load its imagination. For this purpose, we take the state of that specific article upon which the two capital burdens of the war leaned the most immediately, by the additional duties on malt and upon beer. Average of strong beer, brewed in eight years before the additional malt and beer duties, 3,895,059 barrels. Average of strong beer, eight years since the duties, 4,060,726 barrels. Increase in the last period, 165,667 barrels. Here is the effect of two such daring taxes as three pence by the bushel additional on malt and three shillings by the barrel additional on beer. Two impositions laid without remission one upon the neck of the other and laid upon an object which before had been immensely loaded. They did not in the least impair the consumption. It has grown under them. It appears that, upon the whole, the people did not feel so much inconvenience from the new duties as to oblige them to take refuge in the private brewery. Quite the contrary happened in both these respects in the reign of King William, and it happened from much slighter impositions. No people can long consume a commodity for which they are not well able to pay. An enlightened reader laughs at the inconsistent chimera of our author, of a people universally luxurious and at the same time oppressed with taxes and declining in trade. For my part, I cannot look on these duties as the author does. He sees nothing but the burden. I can perceive the burden as well as he, but I cannot avoid contemplating also the strength that supports it. From thence I draw the most comfortable assurances of the future vigour and the ample resources of this great misrepresented country and can never prevail on myself to make complaints which have no cause, in order to raise hopes which have no foundation. End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 of the Works of the Right Honourable Edmund Burke, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Works of the Right Honourable Edmund Burke, Volume 1 by Edmund Burke. Chapter 21 Part 4 of Observations when a representation is built on truth and nature one member supports the other and mutual lights are given and received from every part thus as our manufacturers have not deserted nor the manufacture left us nor the consumption declined nor the revenue sunk so neither has trade which is at once the result measure and cause of the whole in the least decayed as our author has thought proper sometimes to affirm constantly to suppose as if it were the most indisputable of all propositions the reader will see below the comparative state of our trade in three of the best years before our increase of debts and taxes and with it the three last years since the author's date of our ruin in the last three years the whole of our exports was between forty four and forty five millions in the three years preceding the war it was no more than from thirty five to thirty six millions the average balance of the former period was three million seven hundred and six thousand livres of the latter something above four millions it is true that whilst the impressions of the author's destructive war continued our trade was greater than it is at present one of the necessary consequences of the peace was that france must gradually recover a part of those markets of which she had been originally in possession however after all these deductions still the gross trade in the worst year of the present is better than in the best year of any former period of peace a very great part of our taxes if not the greatest has been imposed since the beginning of the century on the author's principles this continual increase of taxes must have ruined our trade 
or at least entirely checked its growth but i have a manuscript of davenant which contains an abstract of our trade for the years seventeen o three and seventeen o four by which it appears that the whole export from england did not then exceed six million five hundred and fifty two thousand and nineteen livres it is now considerably more than double that amount yet england was then a rich and flourishing nation the author endeavours to derogate from the balance in our favour as it stands on the entries and reduces it from four millions as it there appears to no more than two million five hundred thousand livres his observation on the looseness and inaccuracy of the export entries is just and that the error is always an error of excess i readily admit but because as usual he has wholly omitted some very material facts his conclusion is as erroneous as the entries he complains of on this point of the custom-house entries i shall make a few observations first the inaccuracy of these entries can extend only to free goods that is to such british products and manufactures as are exported without drawback and without bounty which do not in general amount to more than two-thirds at the very utmost of the whole export even of our home products the valuable articles of corn malt leather hops beer and many others do not come under this objection of inaccuracy the article of certificate goods re-exported a vast branch of our commerce admits of no error except some smaller frauds which cannot be estimated as they have all a drawback of duty and the exporter must therefore correctly specify their quantity and kind the author therefore is not warranted from the known error in some of the entries to make a general defalcation from the whole balance in our favour this error cannot affect more than half if so much of the export article secondly in the account made up at the inspector-general's office they estimate only the original cost of british products as they are here purchased and on foreign goods only the prices in the country from whence they are sent this was the method established by mr davenant and as far as it goes it certainly is a good one but the profits of the merchant at home and of our factories abroad are not taken into the account which profit on such an immense quantity of goods exported and re-exported cannot fail of being very great five per cent upon the whole i should think a very moderate allowance thirdly it does not comprehend the advantage arising from the employment of six hundred thousand tons of shipping which must be paid by the foreign consumer and which in many bulky articles of commerce is equal to the value of the commodity this can scarcely be rated at less than a million annually fourthly the whole import from ireland and america and from the west indies is set against us in the ordinary way of striking a balance of imports and exports whereas the import and export are both our own this is just as ridiculous as to put against the general balance of the nation how much more goods cheshire receives from london than london from cheshire the whole revolves and circulates through this kingdom and is so far as regards our profit in the nature of home trade as much as if the several countries of america and ireland were all pieced to cornwall the course of exchange with all these places is fully sufficient to demonstrate that this kingdom has the whole advantage of their commerce when the final profit upon a whole system of trade rests and centres in a certain place a balance struck in that place merely on the mutual sale of commodities is quite fallacious fifthly the custom-house entries furnish a most effective and indeed ridiculous idea of the most valuable branch of trade we have in the world that with newfoundland observe what you export thither a little spirits provision fishing lines and fishing hooks is this export the true idea of the newfoundland trade in the light of a beneficial branch of commerce nothing less examine our imports from thence it seems upon this vulgar idea of exports and imports to turn the balance against you but your exports to newfoundland are your own goods your import is your own food as much as your own as that you raise with your ploughs out of your own soil and not your loss but your gain your riches not your poverty but so fallacious is this way of judging that neither the export nor import nor both together supply any idea approaching to adequate of that branch of business the vessels in that trade go straight from newfoundland to the foreign market 
and the sale there not the import here is the measure of its value that trade which is one of your greatest and best is hardly so much as seen in the custom-house entries and it is not of less annual value to this nation than four hundred thousand livres sixthly the quality of your imports must be considered as well as the quantity to state the whole of the foreign import as loss is exceedingly absurd all the iron hemp flax cotton spanish wool raw silk woollen and linen yarn which we import are by no means to be considered as the matter of a merely luxurious consumption which is the idea too generally and loosely annexed to our import article these above mentioned are materials of industry not of luxury which are wrought up here in many instances to ten times and more of their original value even where they are not subservient to our exports they still add to our internal wealth which consists in the stock of useful commodities as much as in gold and silver in looking over the specific articles of our export and import i have often been astonished to see for how small a part of the supply of our consumption either luxurious or convenient we are indebted to nations properly foreign to us these considerations are entirely passed over by the author they have been but too much neglected by most who have speculated on this subject but they ought never to be omitted by those who mean to come to anything like the true state of the british trade they compensate and they more than compensate everything which the author can cut off with any appearance of reason for the over-entry of british goods and they restore to us that balance of four millions which the author has thought proper on such a very poor and limited comprehension of the object to reduce to two million five hundred thousand livres in general this author is so circumstanced that to support his theory he is obliged to assume his facts and then if you allow his facts they will not support his conclusions but if all he says of the state of this balance were true did not the same objections always lie to custom-house entries do they defalcate more from the entries of seventeen sixty six than from those of seventeen fifty four if they prove us ruined we were always ruined some ravens have always indeed croaked out this kind of song they have a malignant delight in presaging mischief when they are not employed in doing it they are miserable and disappointed at every instance of the public prosperity they overlook us like the malevolent being of the poet tritonita conspicit arcum ingenuus opibusque et festa pace where rentum wix que tenet lacrimas quia nil lacrimabile carinet it is in this spirit that some have looked upon those accidents that cast an occasional damp upon trade their imaginations entail these accidents upon us in perpetuity we have had some bad harvests this must very disadvantageously affect the balance of trade and the navigation of a people so large a part of whose commerce is in grain but in knowing the cause we are morally certain that according to the course of events it cannot long subsist in the three last years we have exported scarcely any grain in good years that export hath been worth twelve hundred thousand pounds and more in the two last years far from exporting we have been obliged to import to the amount perhaps of our former exportation so that in this article the balance must be two million livres against us that is one million in the ceasing of gain the other in the increase of expenditure but none of the author's promises or projects could have prevented this misfortune and thank god we do not want him or them to relieve us from it although if his friends should now come into power i doubt not but they will be ready to take credit for any increase of trade or excise that may arise from the happy circumstance of a good harvest disconnects with his loud laments and melancholy prognostications concerning the high price of the necessaries of life and the products of labour with all his others i deny this fact i again call upon him to prove it take average and not accident the grand and first necessary of life is cheap in this country and that too is weighed not against labour which is its true counterpoise but against money does he call the price of wheat at this day between thirty-two and forty shillings per quarter in london dear he must know that fuel an object of the highest order in the necessaries of life and of the first necessity in almost every kind of manufacture is in many of our provinces cheaper than in any part of the globe meat is on the whole not excessively dear whatever its price may be at particular times and from particular accidents if it has had anything like an 
uniform rise this enhancement may easily be proved not to be owing to the increase of taxes but to uniform increase of consumption and of money diminish the latter and meat in your markets will be sufficiently cheap in account but much dearer in effect because fewer will be in a condition to buy thus your apparent plenty will be real indigence at present even under temporary disadvantages the use of flesh is greater here than anywhere else it is continued without any interruption of lents or meagre days it is sustained and growing even with the increase of our taxes but some have the art of converting even the signs of national prosperity into symptoms of decay and ruin and our author who so loudly disclaims popularity never fails to lay hold of the most vulgar popular prejudices and humours in hopes to captivate the crowd even those peevish dispositions which grow out of some transitory suffering those passing clouds which float in our changeable atmosphere are by him industriously figured into frightful shapes in order first to terrify and then to govern the populace it is not enough for the author's purpose to give this false and discouraging picture of the state of his own country it did not fully answer his end to exaggerate her burdens to depreciate her successes and to vilify her character nothing had been done unless the situation of france were exalted in proportion as that of england had been abased the reader will excuse the citation i make at length from his book he outdoes himself upon this occasion his confidence is indeed unparalleled and altogether of the heroic cast if our rival nations were in the same circumstances with ourselves the augmentation of our taxes would produce no ill consequences if we were obliged to raise our prices they must from the same causes do the like and could take no advantage by underselling and underworking us but the alarming consideration to great britain is that france is not in the same condition her distresses during the war were great but they were immediate her want of credit as has been said compelled her to impoverish her people by raising the greatest part of her supplies within the year but the burdens she imposed on them were in a great measure temporary and must be greatly diminished by a few years of peace she could procure no considerable loans therefore she has mortgaged no such oppressive taxes as those great britain has imposed in perpetuity for payment of interest peace must therefore soon re-establish her commerce and manufactures especially as the comparative lightness of taxes and the cheapness of living in that country must make france an asylum for british manufacturers and artificers on this the author rests the merit of his whole system and on this point i will join issue with him if france is not at least in the same condition even in that very condition which the author falsely represents to be ours if the very reverse of his proposition be not true then i will admit his state of the nation to be just and all his inferences from that state to be logical and conclusive it is not surprising that the author should hazard our opinion of his veracity that is a virtue on which great statesmen do not perhaps pique themselves so much but it is somewhat extraordinary that he should stake on a very poor calculation of chances all credit for care for accuracy and for knowledge of the subject of which he treats he is rash and inaccurate because he thinks he writes to a public ignorant and inattentive but he may find himself in that respect as in many others greatly mistaken in order to contrast the light and vigorous condition of france with that of england weak and sinking under her burdens he states in his tenth page that france had raised fifty million three hundred and fourteen thousand three hundred and seventy eight livres sterling by taxes within the several years from the year seventeen fifty six to seventeen sixty two both inclusive all englishmen must stand aghast at such a representation to find france able to raise within the year sums little inferior to all that we were able even to borrow on interest with all the resources of the greatest and most established credit in the world europe was filled with astonishment when they saw england borrow in one year twelve millions it was thought it very justly no small proof of national strength and financial skill to find a fund for the payment of the interest upon this sum the interest of this computed with the one per cent annuities amounted only to six hundred thousand livres a year this i say was thought a surprising effort even of credit but this author talks as of a thing not worth proving but just worth observing that france in one year raised sixteen times that sum 
without borrowing and continued to raise sums not far from equal to it for several years together suppose some jacob henry case had proposed in the year seventeen sixty two to prevent a perpetual charge on the nation by raising ten millions within the year he would have been considered not as a harsh financier who laid a heavy hand on the public but as a poor visionary who had run mad on supplies and taxes they who know that the whole land tax of england at four shillings in the pound raises but two millions will not easily apprehend that any such sums as the author has conjured up can be raised even in the most opulent nations france owed a large debt and was encumbered with heavy establishments before that war the author does not formally deny that she borrowed something in every year of its continuance let him produce the funds for this astonishing annual addition to all her vast preceding taxes in addition equal to the whole excise customs land and malt taxes of england taken together but what must be the reader's astonishment perhaps his indignation if he should find that this great financier has fallen into the most unaccountable of all errors no less an error than that of mistaking the identical sums borrowed by france upon interest for supplies raised within the year can it be conceived that any man only entered into the first rudiments of finance should make so egregious a blunder should write it should print it should carry it to a second edition should take it not collaterally and incidentally but lay it down as the cornerstone of his whole system in such an important point as the comparative states of france and england but it will be said that it was his misfortune to be ill-informed not at all a man of any loose general knowledge and of the most ordinary sagacity never could have been misinformed in so gross a manner because he would have immediately rejected so wild and extravagant an account the fact is this the credit of france bad as it might have been did enable her not to raise within the year but to borrow the very sums the author mentions that is to say one billion one hundred and six million nine hundred and sixteen thousand two hundred and sixty one livres making in the author's computation fifty million three hundred fourteen thousand three hundred seventy eight livres the credit of france was low but it was not annihilated she did not derive as our author chooses to assert any advantages from the debility of her credit its consequence was the natural one she borrowed but she borrowed upon bad terms indeed on the most exorbitant usury End of chapter twenty one Section 22 of the Works of the Right Honourable Edmund Burke, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Works of the Right Honourable Edmund Burke, Volume 1, by Edmund Burke. Part 5 of Observations on a Late Publication, intitulated The Present State of the Nation. In speaking of a foreign revenue, the very pretense to accuracy would be the most inaccurate thing in the world. Neither the author nor I can with certainty authenticate the information we communicate to the public, nor in an affair of eternal fluctuation arrive at perfect exactness all we can do and this we may be expected to do is to avoid gross errors and blunders of a capital nature we cannot order the proper officer to lay the accounts before the house but the reader must judge on the probability of the accounts we lay before him the author speaks of france as raising her supplies for war by taxes within the year and of her debt as a thing scarcely worthy of notice I affirm that she borrowed large sums in every year and has thereby accumulated an immense debt. This debt continued after the war infinitely to embarrass her affairs, and to find some means for its reduction was then and has ever since been the first object of her policy. But she has so little succeeded in all her efforts that the perpetual debt of France is at this hour little short of one hundred million pounds sterling and she stands charged with at least forty million of english pounds on life rents and tontines 
the annuities paid at this day at the hotel de ville of paris which are by no means her sole payments of that nature amount to one hundred and thirty nine million of livres that is to six million three hundred and eighteen thousand pounds besides billets au porteur and various detached and unfunded debts to a great amount and which bear an interest at the end of the war the interest payable on her debt amounted to upwards of seven millions sterling monsieur de la verdi the last hope of the french finances was called in to aid in the reduction of an interest so light to our author so intolerably heavy upon those who are to pay it after many unsuccessful efforts towards reconciling arbitrary reduction with public credit he was obliged to go the plain high road of power and to impose a tax of ten per cent upon a very great part of the capital debt of that kingdom and this measure of present ease to the destruction of future credit produced about five hundred thousand pounds a year which was carried to their caisse d'amortissement or sinking fund but so unfaithfully and unsteadily has this and all the other articles which compose that fund been applied to their purposes that they have given the state but very little even of present relief since it is known to the whole world that she is behindhand on every one of her establishments since the year seventeen sixty three there has been no operation of any consequence on the french finances and in this enviable condition is france at present with regard to her debt everybody knows that the principle of the debt is but a name the interest is the only thing which can distress a nation take this idea which will not be disputed and compare the interest paid by england with that paid by france interest paid by france funded and unfunded for perpetuity or on lives after the tax of ten per cent six million five hundred thousand pounds interest paid by england as stated by the author page twenty seven four million six hundred thousand pounds interest paid by france exceeds that paid by england one million nine hundred thousand pounds the author cannot complain that i state the interest paid by england as too low he takes it himself as the extremist term nobody who knows anything of the french finances will affirm that i state the interest paid by that kingdom too high it might be easily proved to amount to a great deal more even this is near two millions above what is paid by england there are three standards to judge of the good condition of a nation with regard to its finances first the relief of the people second the equality of supplies to establishments third the state of public credit try france on all these standards although our author very liberally administers relief to the people of france its government has not been altogether so gracious since the peace she has taken off but a single vingtieme or shilling in the pound and some small matter in the capitation but if the government has relieved them in one point it has only burdened them the more heavily in another the taille footnote a tax rated by the intendant in each generality on the presumed fortune of every person below the degree of a gentleman End footnote. the taille that grievous and destructive imposition which all their financiers lament without being able to remove or to replace has been augmented no less than six millions of livres or two hundred and seventy thousand pounds english a further augmentation of this or other duties is now talked of and it is certainly necessary to their affairs so exceedingly remote from either truth or verisimilitude is the author's amazing assertion quote, that the burdens of france in the war were in a great measure temporary and must be greatly diminished by a few years of peace end quote. in the next place if the people of france are not lightened of taxes so neither is the state disburdened of charges 
I speak from very good information, that the annual income of that state is at this day thirty millions of livres, or one million three hundred and fifty thousand pounds sterling, short of a provision for their ordinary peace establishment. So far are they from the attempt or even hope to discharge any part of the capital of their enormous debt. Indeed, under such extreme straightness and distraction, labours the whole body of their finances. So far does their charge outrun their supply in every particular, that no man, I believe, who has considered their affairs with any degree of attention or information, but must hourly look for some extraordinary convulsion in that whole system, the effect of which on France, and even on all Europe, it is difficult to conjecture. In the third point of view, their credit. Let the reader cast his eye on a table of the price of French funds, as they stood a few weeks ago, compared with the state of some of our English stocks, even in their present low condition. French, 5 per cent, 63. 4 per cent, not taxed, 57. 3 per cent, not taxed, 49. British, bank stock, 5.5, 159. 4% cons, 100. 3% cons, 88. This state of the funds of France and England is sufficient to convince even prejudice and obstinacy that if France and England are not in the same condition, as the author affirms they are not, the difference is infinitely to the disadvantage of France. This deprecation of their funds has not much the air of a nation lightening burdens and discharging debts. Such is the true comparative state of the two kingdoms in those capital points of view. Now as to the nature of the taxes which provide for this debt, as well as for their ordinary establishments, the author has thought proper to affirm that they are comparatively light, that she has mortgaged no such oppressive taxes as ours, his effrontery on this head is intolerable. Does the author recollect a single tax in England to which something parallel in nature and as heavy in burden does not exist in France? Does he not know that the lands of the noblesse are still under the load of the greater part of the old feudal charges from which the gentry of England have been relieved for upwards of a hundred years and which were in kind as well as burden? much worse than our modern land tax. Besides that, all the gentry of France serve in the army on very slender pay, and to the utter ruin of their fortunes, all those who are not noble have their lands heavily taxed. Does he not know that wine, brandy, soap, candles, leather, saltpetre, gunpowder are taxed in France? Has he not heard that government in France has made a monopoly of that great article of salt, that they compel the people to take a certain quantity of it and at a certain rate, both rate and quantity fixed at the arbitrary pleasure of the imposer. Footnote. Before the war, it was sold to, or rather forced on, the consumer at 11 sous, or about five pence the pound. What it is at present, I am not informed. Even this will appear no trivial imposition. In London, salt may be had at a penny farthing per pound from the last retailer. End footnote. That they pay in France the taille, an arbitrary imposition on presumed property. That a tax is laid in fact and name on the same arbitrary standard upon the acquisitions of their industry. And that in France a heavy capitation tax is also paid from the highest to the very poorest sort of people. Have we taxes of such weight, or anything at all of the compulsion in the article of salt? Do we pay any taillage, any faculty tax, any industry tax? Do we pay any capitation tax whatsoever? I believe the people of London would fall into an agony to hear of such taxes proposed upon them as are paid at Paris. There is not a single article of provision for man or beast which enters that great city 
and is not excised. Corn, hay, meal, butcher's meat, fish, fowls, everything. I do not here mean to censure the policy of taxes laid on the consumption of great luxurious cities. I only state the fact. We should be with difficulty brought to hear of a tax of fifty shillings upon every ox sold in Smithfield. Yet this tax is paid in Paris. Wine, the lower sort of wine, little better than English small beer, pays tuppence a bottle. We indeed tax our beer, but the imposition on small beer is very far from heavy. In no part of England are eatables of any kind the object of taxation. In almost every other country in Europe they are excised, more or less. I have by me the state of the revenues of many of the principal nations on the continent, and on comparing them with ours, I think I am fairly warranted to assert that England is the most lightly taxed of any of the great states of Europe. They whose unnatural and sullen joy arises from a contemplation of the distresses of their country will revolt at this position. But if I am called upon, I will prove it beyond all possibility of dispute, even though this proof should deprive these gentlemen of the singular satisfaction of considering their country as undone, and though the best civil government, the best constituted, and the best managed revenue that ever the world beheld should be thoroughly vindicated from their perpetual clamours and complaints. As to our neighbour and rival France, in addition to what I have here suggested, I say, and when the author chooses formally to deny, I shall formally prove it, that her subjects pay more than England, on a computation of the wealth of both countries, that her taxes are more injudiciously and more oppressively imposed, more vexatiously collected, come in a smaller proportion to the royal coffers, and are less applied by far to the public service. I am not one of those who choose to take the author's word for this happy and flourishing condition of the French finances, rather than attend to the changes, the violent pushes, and the despair of all her own financiers. Does he choose to be referred for the easy and happy condition of the subject in France to the remonstrances of their own parliaments? written with such an eloquence, feeling, and energy, as I have not seen exceeded in any other writings. The author may say their complaints are exaggerated, and the effects of faction. I answer that they are the representations of numerous, grave, and most respectable bodies of men upon the affairs of their own country. But allowing that discontent and faction may prevent the judgment of such venerable bodies in France, we have as good a right to suppose that the same causes may fool as probably have produced from a private, however respectable person, that frightful, and I trust I have shown, groundless, representation of our own affairs in England. The author is so conscious of the dangerous effects of that representation that he thinks it necessary, and very necessary it is, to guard against them. He assures us, quote, that he has not made that display of the difficulties of his country to expose her councils to the ridicule of other states, or to provoke a vanquished enemy to insult her, nor to excite the people's rage against their governors, or sink them into a despondency of the public welfare, end quote. I readily admit this apology for his intentions. God forbid I should think any man capable of entertaining so execrable and senseless a design. The true cause of his drawing so shocking a picture is no more than this, and it ought rather to claim our pity than excite our indignation. He finds himself out of power, and this condition is intolerable to him. The same sun which gilds all nature and exhilarates the whole creation, does not shine upon disappointed ambition. It is something that rays out of darkness, and inspires nothing but gloom and melancholy. Men in this deplorable state of mind find a comfort in spreading the contagion of their spleen. 
they find an advantage too for it is a general popular error to imagine the loudest complainers for the public to be the most anxious for its welfare if such persons can answer the ends of relief and profit to themselves they are apt to be careless enough about either the means or the consequences whatever this complainant's motives may be the effects can by no possibility be other than those which he so strongly and i hope truly disclaims all intention of producing to verify this the reader has only to consider how dreadful a picture he has drawn in his thirty-second page of the state of this kingdom such a picture as i believe has hardly been applicable without some exaggeration to the most degenerate and undone commonwealth that ever existed let this view of things be compared with the prospect of a remedy which he proposes in the page directly opposite and the subsequent i believe no man living could have imagined it possible except for the sake of burlesquing a subject to propose remedies so ridiculously disproportionate to the evil so full of uncertainty in their operation and depending for their success in every step upon the happy event of so many new dangerous and visionary projects it is not amiss that he has thought proper to give the public some little notice of what they may expect from his friends when our affairs shall be committed to their management let us see how the accounts of disease and remedy are balanced in his state of the nation in the first place on the side of evils he states quote, an impoverished and heavily burdened public a declining trade and decreasing specie the power of the crown never so much extended over the great but the great without influence over the lower sort parliament losing its reverence with the people the voice of the multitude set up against the sense of the legislature a people luxurious and licentious impatient of rule and despising all authority government relaxed in every sinew and a corrupt selfish spirit pervading the whole an opinion of many that the form of government is not worth contending for no attachment in the bulk of the people towards the constitution no reverence for the customs of our ancestors no attachment but to private interest nor any zeal but for selfish gratifications trade and manufactures going to ruin great britain in danger of becoming tributary to france and the descent of the crown dependent on her pleasure ireland in case of a war to become a prey to france and great britain unable to recover ireland ceded by treaty note the author never can think of a treaty without making sessions End note. in order to purchase peace for herself the colonies left exposed to the ravages of a domestic or the conquest of a foreign enemy End quote. gloomy enough god knows the author well observes quote, that a mind not totally devoid of feeling cannot look upon such a prospect without horror and a heart capable of humanity must be unable to hear its description End quote he ought to have added that no man of common discretion ought to have exhibited it to the public if it were true or of common honesty if it were false but now for the comfort the day-star which is to rise in our hearts the author's grand scheme for totally reversing this dismal state of things and making us quote, happy at home and respected abroad formidable in war and flourishing in peace End quote. in this great work he proceeds with a facility equally astonishing and pleasing never was financier less embarrassed by the burden of establishments or with the difficulty of finding ways and means if an establishment is troublesome to him he lops off at a stroke just as much of it as he chooses he mows down without giving quarter or assigning reason army navy ordnance ordinary extraordinaries nothing can stand before him then when he comes to provide amalthea's horn is in his hand and he pours out with an inexhaustible bounty 
taxes, duties, loans, and revenues, without uneasiness to himself, or burden to the public. Insomuch that, when we consider the abundance of his resources, we cannot avoid being surprised at the extraordinary attention to savings, but it is all the exuberance of his goodness. This book has so much of a certain tone of power that one would be almost tempted to think it written by some person who has been high in office. A man is generally rendered somewhat a worse reasoner for having been a minister. In private, the assent of listening and obsequious friends. In public, the venal cry and prepared vote of a passive senate confirm him in habits of begging the question with impunity and asserting without thinking himself obliged to prove. Had it not been for some such habits, the author could never have expected that we should take his estimate for a peace establishment solely on his word. The estimate which he gives is the great groundwork of his plan for the national redemption, and it ought to be well and firmly laid, or what must become of the superstructure. One would have thought the natural method in a plan of reformation would be to take the present existing estimates as they stand, and then to show what may be practicably and safely defalcated from them. This would, I say, be the natural course, and what would be expected from a man of business. But this author takes a very different method. For the ground of his speculation of a present peace establishment, he resorts to a former speculation of the same kind, which was in the mind of the minister of the year 1764. Indeed, it never existed anywhere else. Quote, the plan, says he, with his usual ease, has been already formed and the outline drawn by the administration of 1764. I shall attempt to fill up the void and obliterated parts and trace its operation. The standing expense of the present, note, his projected, end note, peace establishment, improved by the experience of the two last years, may be thus estimated, end quote. And he estimates it at £3,468,161. Here too, it would be natural to expect some reasons for condemning the subsequent actual establishments, which have so much transgressed the limits of his plan of 1764, as well as some arguments in favour of his new project, which has in some articles exceeded, in others fallen short, but on the whole is much below his old one. Hardly a word on any of these points. The only points, however, that are in the least essential. For unless you assign reasons for the increase or diminution of the several articles of public charge, the playing at establishments and estimates is an amusement of no higher order and of much less ingenuity than questions and commands, or what is my thought like? To bring more distinctly under the reader's view this author's strange method of proceeding, I will lay before him the three schemes, namely, the idea of the ministers in 1764, the actual estimates of the two last years as given by the author himself, and lastly, the new project of his political millennium. Plan of Establishment for 1764, as by Considerations, page 43, £3,609,700. Footnote. The figures in the Considerations are wrongly cast up. It should be £3,608,700. End footnote. Medium of 1767 and 1768, as by State of the Nation, page 29 and 30, 3 million nine hundred and nineteen thousand three hundred and seventy five pounds. Present peace establishment, as by the project in State of the Nation, page 33, 3 million four hundred and sixty eight thousand one hundred and sixty one pounds. It is not from anything our author has anywhere said that you are enabled to find the ground, much less the justification, of the immense difference between these several systems. 
you must compare them yourself, article by article. No very pleasing employment, by the way, to compare the agreement or disagreement of two chimeras. I now only speak of the comparison of his own two projects. As to the latter of them, it differs from the former by having some of the articles diminished and others increased. I find the chief article of reduction arises from the smaller deficiency of land and malt and of the annuity funds, which he brings down to £295,561. In his new estimate, from £502,400, which he had allowed for those articles in the considerations. With this reduction, owing as it must be merely to a smaller deficiency of funds, he has nothing at all to do. It can be no work and no merit of his. But with regard to the increase, the matter is very different. It is all his own. The public is loaded, for anything we can see to the contrary, entirely gratis. The chief articles of the increase are on the Navy, and on the Army and Ordnance Extraordinaries, the Navy being estimated in his State of the Nation £50,000 a year more, and the Army and Ordnance Extraordinaries £40,000 more, than he had thought proper to allow for them in that estimate of his considerations, which he makes the foundation of his present project. He has given no sort of reason, stated no sort of necessity, for this additional allowance, either in the one article or the other. What is still stranger, he admits that his allowance for the army and ordnance extras is too great and expressly refers you to the considerations, where, far from giving £75,000 a year to that service, as the state of the nation has done, the author apprehends his own scanty provision of £35,000 to be by far too considerable, and thinks it may well admit of further reductions. Footnote. The author of The State of the Nation, page 34, informs us that the sum of £75,000 allowed by him for the extras of the army and ordnance is far less than was allowed for the same service in the years 1767 and 1768. It is so undoubtedly, and by at least £200,000. He sees that he cannot abide by the plan of the considerations in this point, nor is he willing wholly to give it up. Such an enormous difference as that between £35,000 and £300,000 puts him to a stand. Should he adopt the latter plan of increased expense, he must then confess that he had, on a former occasion, egregiously trifled with the public. At the same time, all his future promises of reduction must fall to the ground. If he stuck to the £35,000, he was sure that everyone must expect from him some account how this monstrous charge came to continue ever since the war, where it was clearly unnecessary, how all those successions of ministers, his own included, came to pay it, and why his great friend in Parliament and his partisans without doors came not to pursue to ruin, at least to utter shame, the authors of so groundless and scandalous a profusion. In this strait he took a middle way, and, to come nearer the real state of the service, he outbid the considerations at one stroke, forty thousand pounds. At the same time he hints to you that you may expect some benefit also from the original plan. But the author of the considerations will not suffer him to escape it. He has pinned him down to his £35,000, for that is the sum he has chosen, not as what he thinks will probably be required, but as making the most ample allowance for every possible contingency. See that author, pages 42 and 43. End footnote. Thus, according to his own principles, this great economist falls into a vicious prodigality and is as far, in his estimate, from a consistency with his own principles as with the real nature of the services. Still, however, his present establishment differs from its archetype of 1764 
by being, though raised in particular parts, upon the whole about £141,000 smaller. It is improved, he tells us, by the experience of the last two years. One would have concluded that the peace establishment of these two years had been less than that of 1764, in order to suggest to the author his improvements, which enabled him to reduce it. But how does that turn out? Peace establishment. Footnote. He has done great injustice to the establishment of 1768, but I have not here time for this discussion, nor is it necessary to this argument. End footnote. Peace establishment, 1767 and 1768, medium, £3,919,375. Ditto, estimate in the considerations for 1764, three million six hundred and nine thousand seven hundred pounds difference three hundred and nine thousand six hundred and seventy five pounds a vast increase instead of diminution the experience then of the two last years ought naturally to have given the idea of a heavier establishment but this writer is able to diminish by increasing and to draw the effects of subtraction from the operations of addition by means of these new powers, he may certainly do whatever he pleases. He is indeed moderate enough in the use of them, and condescends to settle his establishments at £3,468,161 a year. However, he has not yet done with it. He has further ideas of saving and new resources of revenue. These additional savings are principally two. First, it is to be hoped, says he, that the sum of £250,000, which in the estimate he allows for the deficiency of land and malt, will be less by £37,924. Footnote. In making up this account, he falls into a surprising error of arithmetic. Quote, the deficiency of the land tax in the year 1754 and 1755, when it was at two shillings, amounted to no more on a medium than £49,372, to which, if we add half the sum, it will give us £79,058 as the peace deficiency at three shillings, end quote. Total £49,372, add the half £24,686, makes seventy-four thousand and fifty-eight pounds which he makes seventy-nine thousand and fifty-eight pounds this is indeed in disfavour of his argument but we shall see that he has ways by other errors of reimbursing himself End footnote. second that the sum of twenty thousand pounds allowed for the foundling hospital and one thousand eight hundred pounds for american surveys will soon cease to be necessary, as the services will be completed. What follows with regard to the resources is very well worthy the reader's attention. Of this estimate, says he, quote, upwards of £300,000 will be for the plantation service, and that sum, I hope, the people of Ireland and the colonies might be induced to take off Great Britain, and defray between them in the proportion of £200,000 by the colonies and £100,000 by Ireland, end quote. Such is the whole of this mighty scheme. Take his reduced estimate and his further reductions and his resources altogether, and the result will be, he will certainly lower the provision made for the navy. He will cut off largely, God knows what or how, from the army and ordnance extraordinaries. He may be expected to cut off more. He hopes that the deficiencies on land and malt will be less than usual, and he hopes that America and Ireland might be induced to take off £300,000 of our annual charges. If any of these hopes, mights, insinuations, expectations and inducements should fail him, there will be a formidable gaping breach in his whole project. If all of them should fail, 
he has left the nation without a glimmering of hope in this thick night of terrors which he has thought fit to spread about us. If every one of them which attended with success would signify anything to our revenue can have no effect but to add to our distractions and dangers, we shall be, if possible, in a still worse condition from his projects of cure than he represents us from our original disorders. Before we examine into the consequences of these schemes and the probability of these savings, let us suppose them all real and all safe, and then see what it is they amount to and how he reasons on them. Deficiency on land and malt less by £37,000. Foundling Hospital, £20,000. American Surveys, £1,800. Total, £58,800. This is the amount of the only articles of saving he specifies, and yet he chooses to assert, quote, that we may venture on the credit of them to reduce the standing expenses of the estimate Note from three million four hundred and sixty eight thousand one hundred and sixty one pounds end note to three million three hundred thousand pounds end quote. that is for a saving of fifty eight thousand pounds he is not ashamed to take credit for a defalcation from his own ideal establishment in a sum of no less than one hundred and sixty eight thousand one hundred and sixty one pounds Suppose even that we were to take up the estimate of the considerations, which is, however, abandoned in the state of the nation, and reduce his £75,000 extraordinaries to the original £35,000, still all these savings joined together give us but £98,800, that is, near £70,000 short of the credit he calls for, and for which he has neither given any reason nor furnished any data whatsoever for others to reason upon. Such are his savings as operating on his own project of a peace establishment. Let us now consider them as they affect the existing establishment and our actual services. He tells us the sum allowed in his estimate for the Navy is, quote, £69,321 less than the grant for that service in 1767. But in that grant, £30,000 was included for the purchase of hemp, and a saving of about £25,000 was made in that year. End quote. The author has got some secret in arithmetic. These two sums put together amount, in the ordinary way of computing, to £55,000 and not to £69,321. On what principle has he chosen to take credit for £14,321 more? To what this strange inaccuracy is owing, I cannot possibly comprehend, nor is it very material where the logic is so bad and the policy so erroneous, whether the arithmetic be just or otherwise. But in a scheme for making this nation, quote, happy at home and respected abroad, formidable in war and flourishing in peace, end quote. It is surely a little unfortunate for us that he has picked out the Navy as the very first object of his economical experiments. Of all the public services, that of the Navy is the one in which tampering may be of the greatest danger, which can worst be supplied upon an emergency, and of which any failure draws after it the longest and heaviest train of consequences. I am far from saying that this or any service ought not to be conducted with economy, but I will never suffer the sacred name of economy to be bestowed upon arbitrary defalcation of charge. The author tells us himself, quote, that to suffer the navy to rot in harbour for want of repairs and marines would be to invite destruction. End quote. It would be so. When the author talks, therefore, of savings on the Navy estimate, it is incumbent on him to let us know not what sums he will cut off, but what branch of that service he deems superfluous. Instead of putting us off with unmeaning generalities, he ought to have stated what naval force, what naval works, and what naval stores, with the lowest estimated expense, 
are necessary to keep our marine in a condition commensurate to its great ends and this too not for the contracted and deceitful space of a single year but for some reasonable term everybody knows that many charges cannot be in their nature regular or annual in the year seventeen sixty seven a stock of hemp and so on was to be laid in that charge intermits but it does not end other charges of other kinds take their place great works are now carrying on at portsmouth but not of greater magnitude than utility and they must be provided for a year's estimate is therefore no just idea at all of a permanent peace establishment had the author opened this matter upon these plain principles a judgment might have been formed how far he had contrived to reconcile national defence with public economy till he has done it those who had rather depend on any man's reason than the greatest man's authority will not give him credit on this head for the saving of a single shilling as to those savings which are already made or in course of being made whether right or wrong he has nothing at all to do with them they can be no part of his project considered as a plan of reformation i greatly fear that the error has not lately been on the side of profusion end of section twenty two Chapter twenty three of the works of the right honourable Edmund Burke, volume one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The works of the right honourable Edmund Burke, volume one by Edmund Burke. Chapter twenty three, part six of observations another head is the saving on the army and ordnance extraordinaries particularly in the american branch what or how much reduction may be made none of us i believe can with any fairness pretend to say very little i am convinced the state of america is extremely unsettled more troops have been sent thither new dispositions have been made and this augmentation of number and change of disposition has rarely i believe the effect of lessening the bill for extraordinaries which if not this year yet in the next we must certainly feel care has not been wanting to introduce economy into that part of the service the author's great friend has made i admit some regulations his immediate successors have made more and better this part will be handled more ably and more minutely at another time but no one can cut down this bill of, of extraordinaries at his pleasure the author has given us nothing but his word for any certain or considerable reduction and this we ought to be the more cautious in taking as he has promised great savings and his considerations which he has not chosen to abide by in his state of the nation on this head also of the american extraordinaries he can take credit for nothing as to his next the lessening of the deficiency of the land and malt tax particularly of the malt tax any person the least conversant in that subject cannot avoid a smile this deficiency arises from charge of collection from anticipation and from defective produce what has the author said on the reduction of any head of this deficiency upon the land tax on these points he is absolutely silent as to the deficiency on the malt tax which is chiefly owing to a defective produce he has and can have nothing to propose if this deficiency should be lessened by the increase of malting in any years more than in others as it is a greatly fluctuating object how much of this obligation shall we owe to this author's ministry will it not be the case under any administration must it not go to the general service of the year in some way or other let the finances be in whose hands they will but why take credit for so extremely reduced a deficiency at all i can tell him he has no rational ground for it in the produce of the year seventeen sixty seven and i suspect will have full as little reason from the produce of the year seventeen sixty eight 
that produce may indeed become greater and the deficiency of course will be less it may too be far otherwise a fair and judicious financier will not as this writer has done for the sake of making out a specious account select a favourable year or two at remote periods and ground his calculations on those in seventeen sixty eight he will not take the deficiencies of seventeen fifty three and seventeen fifty four for his standard sober men have hitherto and must continue this course to preserve this character taken indifferently the mediums of the years immediately preceding but a person who has a scheme from which he promises much to the public ought to be still more cautious he should ground his speculation rather on the lowest mediums because all new schemes are known to be subject to some defect or failure not foreseen and which therefore every prudent proposer will be ready to allow for in order to lay his foundation as low and as solid as possible quite contrary is the practice of some politicians they first propose savings which they well know cannot be made in order to get a reputation for economy in due time they assume another but a different method by providing for the service they had before cut off or straightened and which they can then very easily prove to be necessary in the same spirit they raise magnificent ideas of revenue on funds which they know to be insufficient afterwards who can blame them if they do not satisfy the public desires they are great artificers but they cannot work without materials there are some of the little arts of great statesmen to such we leave them and follow where the author leads us to his next resource the foundling hospital whatever particular virtue there is in the mode of this saving there seems to be nothing at all new and indeed nothing wonderfully important in it the sum annually voted for the support of the foundling hospital has been in a former parliament limited to the establishment of the children then in the hospital when they are apprenticed this provision will cease it will therefore fall in more or less at different times and will at length cease entirely but until it does we cannot reckon upon it as the saving on the establishment of any given year nor can any one conceive how the author comes to mention this any more than some other articles as a part of a new plan of economy which is to retrieve our affairs this charge will indeed cease in its own time but will no other succeed to it has he ever known the public free from some contingent charge either for the just support of royal dignity or for national magnificence or for public charity or for public service does he choose to flatter his readers that no such will ever return or does he in good earnest declare that let the reason or necessity be what they will he is resolved not to provide for such services another resource of economy yet remains for he gleans the field very closely eighteen hundred livres for the american surveys why what signifies a dispute about trifles he shall have it but while he is carrying it off i shall just whisper in his ear that neither the saving that is allowed nor that which is doubted of can at all belong to that future proposed administration whose touch is to cure all our evils both the one and the other belong equally as indeed all the rest do to the present administration to any administration because they are the gift of time and not the bounty of the exchequer i have now done with all the minor preparatory parts of the author's scheme the several articles of saving which he proposes at length comes the capital operation his new resources three hundred thousand pounds a year from america and ireland alas alas if that too should fail us what will become of this poor undone nation the author in a tone of great humility hopes they may be induced to pay it well if that be all we may hope so too and for any light he is pleased to give us into the ground of this hope and the ways and means of this inducement here is a speedy and both of the question and the revenue it is the constant custom of this author in all his writings to take it for granted that he has given you a revenue whenever he can point out to you where you may have money if you can contrive how to get at it and this seems to be the masterpiece of his financial ability i think however in his way of proceeding he has behaved rather like a harsh stepdame than a kind nursing mother to his country why stop at three hundred thousand livres 
if his state of things be at all founded america and ireland are much better able to pay six hundred thousand livres than we are to satisfy ourselves with half that sum however let us forgive him this one instance of tenderness towards ireland and the colonies he spends a vast deal of time in an endeavour to prove that ireland is able to bear greater impositions he is of opinion that the poverty of the lower class of people there is in a great measure owing to a want of judicious taxes that a land tax will enrich her tenants that taxes are paid in england which are not paid there that the colony trade has increased above one hundred thousand livres since the peace that she ought to have further indulgence in that trade and ought to have further privileges in the woollen manufacture from these premises of what she has what she has not and what she ought to have he infers that ireland will contribute one hundred thousand livres towards the extraordinaries of the american establishment i shall make no objections whatsoever logical or financial to this reasoning many occur but they would lead me from my purpose from which i do not intend to be diverted because it seems to me of no small importance it will be just enough to hint what i dare say many readers have before observed that when any man proposes new taxes in a country with which he is not personally conversant by residence or office he ought to lay open its situation much more minutely and critically than this author has done or than perhaps he is able to do he ought not to content himself with saying that a single article of her trade has increased one hundred thousand livres a year he ought if he argues from the increase of trade to the increase of taxes to state the whole trade and not one branch of trade only he ought to enter fully into the state of its remittances and the course of its exchange he ought likewise to examine whether all its establishments are increased or diminished and whether it incurs or discharges debts annually but i pass over all this and am content to ask a few plain questions does the author then seriously mean to propose in parliament a land tax or any tax for one hundred thousand livres a year upon ireland if he does and if fatally by his temerity and our weakness he should succeed then i say he will throw the whole empire from one end of it to the other into mortal convulsions what is it that can satisfy the furious and perturbed mind of this man is it not enough for him that such projects have alienated our colonies from the mother country and not to propose violently to tear our sister kingdom also from our side and to convince every dependent part of the empire that when a little money is to be raised we have no sort of regard to their ancient customs their opinions their circumstances or their affections he has however a due sir for ireland in his pocket benefits in trade by opening the woollen manufacture to that nation a very right idea in my opinion but not more strong in reason than likely to be opposed by the most powerful and most violent of all local prejudices and popular passions first a fire is already kindled by his schemes of taxation in america he then proposes one which will set all ireland in a blaze and his way of quenching both is by a plan which may kindle perhaps ten times a greater flame in britain will the author pledge himself previously to his proposal of such a tax to carry this enlargement of the irish trade if he does not then the tax will be certain the benefit will be less than problematical in this view his compensation to ireland vanishes into smoke the tax to their prejudices will appear stark naked in the light of an act of arbitrary power and oppression but if he should propose the benefit and tax together then the people of ireland a very high and spirited people would think it the worst bargain in the world they would look upon the one as wholly vitiated and poisoned by the other and if they could not be separated would infallibly resist them both together here would be taxes indeed amounting to a handsome sum one hundred thousand livres very effectually voted and passed through the best and most authentic forms but how to be collected this is his perpetual manner one of his projects depends for success upon another project and this upon a third all of them equally visionary his finances like the indian philosophy his earth is poised on the horns of a bull his bull stands upon an elephant his elephant is supported by a tortoise and so on for ever as to his american two hundred thousand livres a year he is satisfied to repeat gravely as he has done a hundred times before that the americans are able to pay it well and what then does he lay open any part of his plan how they may be compelled to pay it without plunging ourselves into calamities that outweigh tenfold the proposed benefit or does he show how they may be induced to submit to it quietly or does he give any satisfaction concerning the mode of levying it 
in commercial colonies one of the most important and difficult of all considerations nothing like it to the stamp act whatever its excellences may be i think he will not in reality recur or even choose to assert that he means to do so in case his minister should come again into power if he does i will predict that some of the fastest friends of that minister will desert him upon this point as to poor duties he has damned them all in the lump by declaring them contrary to the first principles of colonization and not less prejudicial to the interests of great britain than to those of the colonies surely this single observation of his ought to have taught him a little caution he ought to have begun to doubt whether there is not something in the nature of commercial colonies which renders them an unfit object of taxation when poor duties so large a fund of revenue in all countries are by himself found in this case not only improper but destructive however he has here pretty well narrowed the field of taxation stamp act hardly to be resumed poor duties mischievous excises i believe he will scarcely think worth the collection if any revenue should be so in america land tax notwithstanding his opinion of its immense use to agriculture he will not directly propose before he has thought again and again on the subject indeed he very readily recommends it for ireland and seems to think it not improper for america because he observes they already raise most of their taxes internally including this tax a most curious reason truly because their lands are already heavily burdened he thinks it right to burden them still further but he will recollect for surely he cannot be ignorant of it that the lands of america are not as in england let at a rent certain in money and therefore cannot as here be taxed at a certain pound rate they value them in gross among themselves and none but themselves and their several districts can value them without their hearty concurrence and cooperation it is evident we cannot advance a step in the assessing or collecting any land tax as to the taxes which in some places the americans pay by the acre they are merely duties of regulation they are small and to increase them notwithstanding the secret virtues of a land tax would be the most effectual means of preventing that cultivation they are intended to promote besides the whole country is heavily in arrear already for land taxes and quit rents they have different methods of taxation in the different provinces agreeable to their several local circumstances in new england by far the greatest part of their revenue is raised by faculty taxes and capitations such as the method and many others it is obvious that parliament unassisted by the colonies themselves cannot take so much as a single step in this mode of taxation then what tax is it he will impose why after all the boasting speeches and writings of his faction for these four years after all the vain expectations which they have held out to a deluded public this their great advocate after twisting the subject every way after writhing himself in every posture after knocking at every door is obliged fairly to abandon every mode of taxation whatsoever in america he thinks it the best method of parliament to impose the sum and reserve the account to itself leaving the mode of taxation to the colonies but how and in what proportion what does the author say oh not a single syllable on this the most material part of the whole question will he in parliament undertake to settle the proportions of such payments from nova scotia to nevis in no fewer than six and twenty different countries varying in almost every possible circumstance one from another if he does i tell him he adjourns his revenue to a very long day if he leaves it to themselves and settle these proportions he adjourns it to doomsday then what does he get by this method on the side of acquiescence will the people of america relish this course of giving and granting and applying their money the better because their assemblies are made commissioners of the taxes this is far worse than all his former projects for here if the assembly shall refuse or delay or be negligent or fraudulent in this new imposed duty we are wholly without remedy and neither our custom-house officers nor our troops or nor our armed ships can be of the least use in the collection no idea can be more contemptible i will not call it an oppressive one the harshness is lost in the folly and that of proposing to get any revenue from the americans but by their freest and most cheerful consent most moneyed men know their own interest right well and are as able as any financier in the valuation of risks yet i think this financier will scarcely find that adventure hardy enough at any premium to advance a shilling upon a vote of such taxes let him name the man or set of men 
that would do it this is the only proof of the value of revenues what would an interested man rate them at his subscription would be at ninety nine per cent discount the very first day of its opening here is our only national security from ruin a security upon which no man in his senses would venture a shilling of his fortune yet he puts down those articles as gravely in his supply for the peace establishment as if the money had been all fairly lodged in the exchequer american revenue two hundred thousand pounds ireland one hundred thousand pounds very handsome indeed but if supply is to be got in such a manner farewell and lucrative mystery of finance if you are to be credited for savings without showing how why or with what safety they are to be made and for revenues without specifying on what articles or by what means or at what expense they are to be collected there is not a clerk in a public office who may not outbid this author or his friend for the department of chancellor of the exchequer not an apprentice in the city that will not strike out with the same advantages the same or a much larger plan of supply here is the whole of what belongs to the author's scheme for saving us from impending destruction take it even in its most favourable point of view as a thing within possibility and imagine what must be the wisdom of this gentleman or his opinion of ours who could first think of representing this nation in such a state as no friend can look upon but with horror and scarcely an enemy without compassion and afterwards of diverting himself with such inadequate impracticable puerile methods for our relief if these had been the dreams of some unknown unnamed and nameless writer they would excite no alarm their weakness had been an antidote to their malignity but as they are universally believed to be written by the hand or what amounts to the same thing under the immediate direction of a person who has been in the management of the highest affairs and may soon be in the same situation i think it is not to be reckoned amongst our greatest consolations that the yet remaining power of this kingdom is to be employed in an attempt to realize notions that are at once so frivolous and so full of danger that consideration will justify me in dwelling a little longer on the difficulties of the nation and the solutions of our author i am then persuaded that he cannot be in the least alarmed about our situation let his outcry be what he pleases i will give him a reason for my opinion which i think he cannot dispute all that he bestows upon the nation which it does not possess without him and supposing it all sure money amounts to no more than a sum of three hundred thousand livres a year this he thinks will do the business completely and render us flourishing at home and respectable abroad if the option between glory and shame if our salvation or destruction depended on this sum it is possible that he should have been active and made a merit of that activity in taking off a shilling in the pound of the land tax which came up to his grand desideratum and upwards of one hundred thousand livres more by this manoeuvre he left our trade navigation and manufactures on the verge of destruction our finances in ruin our credit expiring ireland on the point of being ceded to france the colonies of being torn to pieces the succession of the crown at the mercy of our great rival and the kingdom itself on the very point of becoming tributary to that haughty power all this for want of three hundred thousand livres for i defy the reader to point out any other revenue or any other precise and defined scheme of politics which he assigns for our redemption i know that two things may be said in his defence as bad reasons are always at hand in an indifferent case that he was not sure the money would be applied as he thinks it ought to be by the present ministers i think as ill of them as he does to the full they have done very near as much mischief as they can do to a constitution so robust as this is nothing can make them more dangerous but that as they are already in general composed of his disciples and instruments they may add to the public calamity of their own measures the adoption of his projects to be the ministers what they made the author knows that they could not avoid applying this four hundred and fifty thousand livres to the service of the establishment as faithfully as he or any other minister could do i say they could not avoid it and have no merit at all for the application but supposing that they should greatly mismanage this revenue here is a good deal of room for mistake and prodigality before you come to the edge of ruin the difference between the amount of that real and his imaginary revenue is a hundred and fifty thousand livres a year at least a tolerable sum for them to play with this might compensate the difference between the author's economy and their profusion and still notwithstanding their vices and ignorance the nation might be saved the author ought also to recollect that a good man would hardly deny even to the worst of ministers the means of doing their duty 
especially in a crisis when our being depended on supplying them with some means or other in such a case their penury of mind in discovering resources would make it rather the more necessary not to strip such poor providers of the little stock they had in hand besides here is another subject of distress and a very serious one which puts us again to a stand the author may possibly not come into power i only state the possibility he may not always continue in it and if the contrary to all this should fortunately for us happen what insurance on his life can be made for a sum adequate to his loss then we are thus unluckily situated that the chance of an american and irish revenue of three hundred thousand livres to be managed by him is to save us from ruin two or three years hence at best to make us happy at home and glorious abroad and the actual possession of four hundred thousand livres english taxes cannot so much as protract our ruin without him so we are staked on four chances his power its permanence the success of his projects and the duration of his life any one of these failing we are gone propia haec si dona fuissent this is no unfair representation ultimately all hangs on his life because in his account of every set of men that have held or supported administration he finds neither virtue nor ability in any but himself indeed he pays through their measures some compliments to lord boot and lord dispenser but to the latter this is i suppose but a civility to old acquaintance to the former a little stroke of politics we may therefore fairly say that our only hope is his life and he has to make it the more so taken care to cut off any resource which we possessed independently of him in the next place it may be said to excuse any appearance of inconsistency between the author's actions and his declarations that he thought it right to relieve the landed interest and lay the burden where it ought to lie on the colonies what to take off a revenue so necessary to our being before anything whatsoever was acquired in the place of it imprudence he ought to have waited at least for the first quarter's receipt of the new anonymous american revenue and irish land tax is there something so specific for art disorders in american and something so poisonous in english money that one is to heal the other to destroy us to say that the landed interest could not continue to pay it for a year or two longer is more than the author will attempt to prove to say that they would pay it no longer is to treat the landed interest in my opinion very scurvily to suppose that the gentry clergy and freeholders of england do not rate the commerce the credit the religion the liberty the independency of their country and the succession of their crown at a shilling in the pound land tax they never gave him reason to think so meanly of them and if i am rightly informed when that measure was debated in parliament a very different reason was assigned by the author's great friend as well as by others for that reduction one very different from the critical and almost desperate state of our finances some people then endeavoured to prove that the reduction might be made without detriment to the national credit or the due support of a proper peace establishment otherwise it is obvious that the reduction could not be defended in argument so that this author cannot despair so much of the commonwealth without this american and irish revenue as he pretends to do if he does the reader sees how handsomely he is provided for us by voting away one revenue and by giving us a pamphlet on the other i do not mean to blame the relief which was then given by parliament to the land it was grounded on very weighty reasons the administration contended only for its continuance for a year in order to have the merit of taking off the shilling in the pound immediately before the elections and thus to bribe the freeholders of england with their own money it is true the author in his estimate of ways and means takes credit for four hundred thousand livres a year indian revenue but he will not very positively insist that we should put this revenue to the account of his plans or his power and for a very plain reason we are already near two years in possession of it by what means we came to that possession is a pretty long story however i shall give nothing more than a short abstract of the proceeding in order to see whether the author will take to himself any part in that measure the fact is this the east india company had for a good while solicited the ministry for a negotiation by which they proposed to pay largely for some advantage in their trade and for the renewal of their charter this had been the former method of transacting with that body government having only leased the monopoly for short terms the company has been obliged to resort to it frequently for renewals these two parties had always negotiated on the true principle of credit not as government and subject but as equal dealers on the footing of mutual advantage 
the public had derived great benefit from such dealing but at that time new ideas prevailed the ministry instead of listening to the proposals of that company chose to set up a claim of the crown to their possessions the original plan seems to have been to get the house of commons to compliment the crown with a sort of juridical declaration of a title to the company's acquisitions in india which the crown on its part with the best air in the world was to bestow upon the public then it would come to the turn of the house of commons again to be liberal and grateful to the crown the civilist debts were to be paid off with perhaps a pretty augmentation of income all this was to be done on the most public-spirited principles and with a politeness and mutual interchange of good offices that could not but have charmed but what was best of all these civilities were to be without a farthing of charge to either of the kind and obliging parties the east india company was to be covered with infamy and disgrace and at the same time was to pay the whole bill in consequence of this scheme the tears of a parliamentary inquiry were hung over them a judicature was asserted in parliament to try this question but lest this judicial character should chance to inspire certain stubborn ideas of law and right it was argued that the judicature was arbitrary and ought not to determine by the rules of law but by their opinion of policy and expediency nothing exceeded the violence of some of the managers except their impotence they were bewildered by their passions and by their want of knowledge or want of consideration of the subject the more they advanced the further they found themselves from their object all things ran into confusion the ministers quarrelled among themselves they exclaimed one another they suspended violence and shrunk from treaty the inquiry was almost at its last gasp when some active persons of the company were given to understand that this hostile proceeding was only set up in terrorum that government was far from an intention of seizing upon the possessions of the company administration they said was sensible that the idea was in every light full of absurdity and that such a seizure was not more out of their power than remote from their wishes and therefore if the company would come in a liberal manner to the house they certainly could not fail of putting a speedy end to this disagreeable business of opening a way to an advantageous treaty on this hint the company acted they came at once to a resolution of getting rid of the difficulties which arose from the complication of their trade with their revenue a step which despoiled them of their best defensive armour and put them at once into the power of administration they threw their whole stock of every kind the revenue the trade and even their debt from government into one fund which they computed on the surest grounds would amount to eight hundred thousand livres with a large probable surplus for the payment of debt then they agreed to divide this sum in equal portions between themselves and the public four hundred thousand livres to each this gave to the proprietors of that fund an annual augmentation of no more than eighty thousand livres in dividend they ought to receive from government a hundred and twenty thousand livres for the loan of their capital so that in fact the whole which on this plan they reserved to themselves from their vast revenues from their extensive trade in consideration of the great risks and mighty expenses which purchased these advantages amounted to no more than two hundred eighty thousand livres whilst government was to receive as i said four hundred thousand livres this proposal was thought by themselves liberal indeed and they expected the highest applauses for it however their reception was very different from their expectations when they brought up their plan to the house of commons the offer as it was natural of four hundred thousand livres was very well relished but nothing could be more disgustful than the eighty thousand livres which the company had divided amongst themselves a violent tempest of public indignation and fury rose against them heads of people turned the company was held well able to pay four hundred thousand livres a year to government but bankrupts if they attempted to divide the fifth part of it among themselves an ex post facto law was brought in with great precipitation for annulling this dividend in the bill was inserted a clause which suspended for about a year the right which under the public faith the company enjoyed of making their own dividends such was the disposition and temper of the house that although the plain face of facts reason arithmetic all the authority parts and eloquence in the kingdom were against this bill though all the chancellors of the exchequer had held that office from the beginning of this reign 
opposed it yet a few placemen of the subordinate departments sprung out of their ranks took the lead and by an opinion of some sort of secret support carried the bill with a high hand leaving the then secretary of state and the chancellor of the exchequer in a very moderate minority in this distracted situation the managers of the bill notwithstanding their triumph did not venture to propose the payment of the civil list debt the chancellor of the exchequer was not in good humour enough after his late defeat by his own troops to cooperate in such a design so they made an act to lock up the money in the exchequer until they should have time to look about them and settle among themselves what they were to do with it thus ended this unparalleled transaction the author i believe will not claim any part of the glory of it he will leave it whole and entire to the authors of the measure the money was the voluntary free gift of the company the rescinding bill was the act of legislature to which they and we owe submission the author has nothing to do with the one or with the other however he cannot avoid rubbing himself against this subject merely for the pleasure of stirring controversies and gratifying a certain pruriency of taxation that seems to infect his blood it is merely to indulge himself in speculation of taxing that he chooses to harangue on this subject for he takes credit for no greater sum than the public is already in possession of he does not hint that the company means or has ever shown any disposition if managed with common prudence to pay less in future and he cannot doubt that the present ministry are as well inclined to drive them by their mock inquiries and real rescinding bills as he can possibly be with his taxes besides it is obvious that as great a sum might have been drawn from that company without affecting property or shaking the constitution or endangering the principle of public credit or running into his golden dreams of cockets on the ganges or visions of stamp duties on parawanas dustics kissed bundies and huskookums for once i will disappoint him in this part of the dispute and only in the very few words recommend to his consideration how he is to get off the dangerous idea of taxing a public fund if he levies those duties in england and if he is to levy them in india what provision he has made for a revenue establishment there supposing that he undertakes this new scheme of finance independently of the company and against its inclinations so much for these revenues which are nothing but his visions or already the national possessions without any act of his it is easy to parade with a high talk of parliamentary rights of the universality of legislative powers and of uniform taxation men of sense when new projects come before them always think of discourse proving the mere right or mere power of acting in the manner proposed to be no more than a very unpleasant way of misspending time they must see the object to be of proper magnitude to engage them they must see the means of compassing it to be next to certain the mischiefs not to counterbalance the profit they will examine how a proposed imposition or regulation agrees with the opinion of those who are likely to be affected by it they will not despise the consideration even of their habitudes and prejudices they wish to know how it accords or disagrees with the true spirit of prior establishments whether of government or of finance because they well know that in the complicated economy of great kingdoms and immense revenues which in the length of time and by a variety of accidents have coalesced into a sort of body an attempt towards a compulsory equality in all circumstances and an exact practical definition of the supreme rights in every case is the most dangerous and chimerical of all enterprises the old building stands well enough though part gothic part grecian and part chinese until an attempt is made to square it into uniformity then it may come down upon our heads altogether in much uniformity of ruin and great will be the fall thereof some people instead of inclining to debate the matter only feel a sort of nausea when they are told that protection calls for supply and that all the parts ought to contribute to the support of the whole strange argument for great and grave deliberation as if the same end may not and must not be compassed according to its circumstances by a great diversity of ways thus in great britain some of our establishments are apt for the support of credit they stand therefore upon a principle of their own distinct from and in some respects contrary to the relation between prince and subject it is a new species of contract superinduced upon the old contract of the state the idea of power must as much as possible be banished from it for power and credit are things adverse 
incompatible non bene convenient nec in una sede morantur such establishments are our great money companies to tax them would be critical and dangerous and contradictory to the very purpose of their institution which is credit and cannot therefore be taxation but the nation when it gave up that power did not give up the advantage but supposed and with reason that government was overpaid in credit for what it seemed to lose in authority in such a case the talk of the rights of sovereignty is quite idle other establishments supply other modes of public contribution our trading companies as well as individual importers are a fit subject of revenue by customs some establishments pay us by a monopoly of their consumption and their produce this nominally no tax in reality comprehends all taxes such establishments are our colonies to tax them will be as erroneous in policy as rigorous in equity ireland supplies us by furnishing troops in war and by bearing part of our foreign establishment in peace she aids us at all times by the money that her absentees spend amongst us which is no small part of the rental of that kingdom thus ireland contributes her part some objects bear port duties some are fitter for an inland excise this mode varies the object is the same to strain these from their old and inveterate leanings might impair the old benefit and not answer the end of the new project among all the great men of antiquity procrustes shall never be my hero of legislation with his iron bed the allegory of his government and the type of some modern policy by which the long limb was to be cut short and the short tortured into length such was the state bed of uniformity he would i conceive be a very indifferent farmer who complained that his sheep did not plough or his horses yield in wool though it would be an idea full of equality they may think this right in rustic economy who think it available in the politic qui bavium non odit amet tua carmina my we atque idem jungat wolpus et mulgeat hercos end of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of the works of the right honourable edmund burke volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the works of the right honourable edmund burke volume one by edmund burke chapter twenty four part seven of observations as the author has stated this indian taxation for no visible purpose relative to his plan of supply so he has stated many other projects with as little if any distinct end unless perhaps to show you how full he is of projects for the public good and what vast expectations may be formed of him or his friends if they should be translated into administration it is also from some opinion that the speculations may one day become our public measures that i think it worth while to trouble the reader at all about them two of them stand out in high relievo beyond the rest the first is a change in the internal representation of this country by enlarging our number of constituents the second is an addition to our representatives by new american members of parliament i pass over here all considerations how far such a system will be an improvement of our constitution according to any sound theory not that i mean to condemn such speculative inquiries concerning this great object of the national attention they may tend to clear doubtful points and possibly may lead as they have often done to real improvements what i object to is their introduction into a discourse relating to the immediate state of our affairs and recommending plans of practical government in this view i see nothing in them but what is usual with the author an attempt to raise discontent in the people of england 
to balance those discontents which the measures of his friends had already raised in america what other reason can he have for suggesting that we are not happy enough to enjoy a sufficient number of voters in england i believe that most sober thinkers on this subject are rather of opinion that our fault is on the other side and that it would be more in the spirit of our constitution and more agreeable to the pattern of our best laws by lessening the number to add to the weight and independency of our voters and truly considering the immense and dangerous charge of elections the prostitute and daring venality the corruption of manners the idleness and profligacy of the lower sort of voters no prudent men would propose to increase such an evil if it be as i fear it is out of our power to administer to it any remedy the author proposes nothing further if he has any improvements that may balance or may lessen this inconvenience he has thought proper to keep them as usual in his own breast since he has been so reserved i should have wished he had been as cautious with regard to the project itself first because he observes justly that his scheme however it might improve the platform can add nothing to the authority of the legislature much i fear it will have a contrary operation for authority depending on opinion at least as much as on duty an idea circulated among the people that our constitution is not so perfect as it ought to be before you are sure of mending it is a certain method of lessening it in the public opinion of this irreverent opinion of parliament the author himself complains in one part of his book and he endeavours to increase it in the other has he well considered what an immense operation any change in our constitution is how many discussions parties and passions it will necessarily excite and when you open it to inquiry in one part where the inquiry will stop experience shows us that no time can be fit for such changes but a time of general confusion when good men finding everything already broken up think it right to take advantage of the opportunity of such derangement in favour of an useful alteration perhaps a time of the greatest security and tranquillity both at home and abroad may likewise be fit but will the author affirm this to be just such a time transferring an idea of military to civil prudence he ought to know how dangerous it is to make an alteration of your disposition in the face of an enemy now comes his american representation here too as usual he takes no notice of any difficulty nor says anything to obviate those objections that must naturally arise in the minds of his readers he throws you his politics as he does his revenue do you make something of them if you can is not the reader a little astonished at the proposal of an american representation from that quarter it is proposed merely as a project of speculative improvement not from the necessity in the case not to add anything to the authority of parliament but that we may afford a greater attention to the concerns of the americans and give them a better opportunity of stating their grievances and of obtaining redress i am glad to find the author has at length discovered that we have not given a sufficient attention to their concerns or a proper redress to their grievances his great friend would once have been exceedingly displeased with any person who should tell him that he did not attend sufficiently to those concerns he thought he did so when he regulated the colonies over and over again he thought he did so when he formed two general systems of revenue one of port duties and the other of internal taxation these systems supposed or ought to suppose the greatest attention to and the most detailed information of all their affairs 
however by contending for the american representation he seems at last driven virtually to admit that great caution ought to be used in the exercise of all our legislative rights over an object so remote from our eye and so little connected with our immediate feelings that in prudence we ought not to be quite so ready with our taxes until we can secure the desired representation in parliament perhaps it may be some time before this hopeful scheme can be brought to perfect maturity although the author seems to be in no wise aware of any obstructions that lie in the way of it he talks of his union just as he does of his taxes and his savings with as much sang froid and ease as if his wish and the enjoyment were exactly the same thing he appears not to have troubled his head with the infinite difficulty of settling that representation on a fair balance of wealth and numbers throughout the several provinces of america and the west indies under such an infinite variety of circumstances it cost him nothing to fight with nature and to conquer the order of providence which manifestly opposes itself to the possibility of such a parliamentary union but let us to indulge his passions for projects and power suppose the happy time arrived when the author comes into the ministry and is to realize his speculations the writs are issued for electing members for america and the west indies some provinces receive them in six weeks some in ten some in twenty a vessel may be lost and then some provinces may not receive them at all but let it be that they all receive them at once and in the shortest time a proper space must be given for proclamation and for the election some weeks at least but the members are chosen and if ships are ready to sail in about six more they arrive in london in the meantime the parliament has sat in business far advanced without american representatives nay by this time it may happen that the parliament is dissolved and then the members ship themselves again to be again elected the writs may arrive in america before the poor members of a parliament in which they never sat can arrive at their several provinces a new interest is formed and they find other members are chosen whilst they are on the high seas but if the writs and members arrive together here is at best a new trial of skill amongst the candidates after one set of them have well aired themselves with their two voyages of six thousand miles however in order to facilitate everything to the author we will suppose them all at once more elected and steering again to old england with a good heart and a fair westerly wind in their stern on their arrival they find all in a hurry and bustle in and out condolence and congratulation the crown is demised another parliament is to be called away back to america again on a fourth voyage and to a third election does the author mean to make our kings as immortal in their personal as in their politic character or whilst he bountifully adds to their life will he take from them their prerogative of dissolving parliaments in favour of the american union or are the american representatives to be perpetual and to feel neither demises of the crown nor dissolutions of parliament but these things may be granted to him without bringing him much nearer to his point what does he think of re-election is the american member the only one who is not to take a place or the only one to be exempted from the ceremony of re-election how will this great politician preserve the rights of electors the fairness of returns and the privilege of the house of commons as the sole judge of such contests it would undoubtedly be a glorious sight to have eight or ten petitions or double returns from boston and barbados from philadelphia and jamaica the members returned and the petitioners with all their train of attorneys solicitors mayors selectmen provost marshals and above five hundred or a thousand witnesses come to the bar of the house of commons possibly we might be interrupted in the enjoyment of this pleasing spectacle 
if a war should break out and our constitutional fleet loaded with members of parliament returning officers petitions and witnesses the electors and elected should become a prize to the french or spaniards and be conveyed to cartagena or to la Veracruz, and from thence perhaps to mexico or lima there to remain until a cartel for members of parliament can be settled or until the war is ended in truth the author has little studied this business or he might have known that some of the most considerable provinces of america such for instance as connecticut and massachusetts bay have not in each of them two men who can afford at a distance from their estates to spend a thousand pounds a year how can these provinces be represented at westminster if their province pays them they are american agents with salaries and not independent members of parliament it is true that formerly in england members had salaries from their constituents but they all had salaries and were all in this way upon a par if these american representatives have no salaries then they must add to the list of our pensioners and dependents at court or they must starve there is no alternative enough of this visionary union in which much extravagance appears without any fancy and the judgment is shocked without anything to refresh the imagination it looks as if the author had dropped down from the moon without any knowledge of the general nature of this globe of the general nature of its inhabitants without the least acquaintance with the affairs of this country governor pownall has handled the same subject to do him justice he treats it upon far more rational principles of speculation and much more like a man of business he thinks erroneously i can see but he does think that our legislative rights are incomplete without such a representation it is no wonder therefore that he endeavours by every means to obtain it not like our author who is always on velvet he is aware of some difficulties and he proposes some solutions but nature is too hard for both these authors and america is and ever will be without actual representation in the house of commons nor will any minister be wild enough even to propose such a representation in parliament however he may choose to throw out that project together with others equally far from his real opinions and remote from his designs merely to fall in with the different views and captivate the affections of different sorts of men whether these projects arise from the author's real political principles are only brought out in subservience to his political views they compose the whole of anything that is like precise and definite which the author has given us to expect from that administration which is so much the subject of his praises and prayers as to his general propositions that there is a deal of difference between impossibilities and great difficulties that a great scheme cannot be carried unless made the business of successive administrations that virtuous and able men are the fittest to serve their country all this i look on as no more than so much rubble to fill up the spaces between the regular masonry pretty much in the same light i cannot forbear considering his detached observations on commerce such as that the system for colony regulations would be very simple and mutually beneficial to great britain and her colonies if the old navigation laws were adhered to that the transportation should be in all cases in ships belonging to british subjects that even british ships should not be generally received into the colonies from any part of europe except the dominions of great britain that it is unreasonable that corn and such like products should be restrained to come first to a british port what do all these fine observations signify some of them condemn as ill practices things that were never practised at all some recommend to be done things that always have been done others indeed convey though obliquely and loosely some insinuations highly dangerous to our commerce if i could prevail on myself to think the author meant to ground any practice upon these general propositions i should think it very necessary 
to ask a few questions about some of them for instance what does he mean by talking of an adherence to the old navigation laws does he mean that the particular law twelve car two c nineteen commonly called the act of navigation is to be adhered to and that the several subsequent additions amendments and exceptions ought to be all repealed if so he will make a strange havoc in the whole system of our trade laws which have been universally acknowledged to be full as well founded in the alterations and exceptions as the act of charles the second in the original provisions and to pursue full as wisely the great end of that very politic law the increase of the british navigation i fancy the writer could hardly propose anything more alarming to those immediately interested in that navigation than such a repeal if he does not mean this he has got no farther than a nugatory proposition which nobody can contradict and for which no man is the wiser that the regulations for the colony trade would be few and simple if the old navigation laws were adhered to i utterly deny as a fact that they ought to be so sounds well enough but this proposition is of the same nugatory nature with some of the former the regulations for the colony trade ought not to be more nor fewer nor more nor less complex than the occasion requires and as that trade is in a great measure a system of art and restriction they can neither be few nor simple it is true that the very principle may be destroyed by multiplying to excess the means of securing it never did a minister depart more from the author's ideas of simplicity or more embarrass the trade of america with the multiplicity and intricacy of regulations and ordinances than his boasted minister of seventeen sixty four that minister seemed to be possessed with something hardly short of a rage for regulation and restriction he had so multiplied bonds certificates affidavits warrants sufferances and cockets had supported them with such severe penalties and extended them without the least consideration of circumstances to so many objects that had they all continued in their original force commerce must speedily have expired under them some of them the ministry which gave them birth was obliged to destroy with their own hand they signed the condemnation of their own regulations confessing in so many words in the preamble of their act of the fifth george the third that some of these regulations had laid an unnecessary restraint on the trade and correspondence of his majesty's american subjects this in that ministry was a candid confession of a mistake but every alteration made in those regulations by their successors is to be the effect of envy and american misrepresentation so much for the author's simplicity in regulation i have now gone through all which i think immediately essential in the author's idea of war of peace of the comparative states of england and france of our actual situation in his projects of economy of finance of commerce and of constitutional improvement there remains nothing now to be considered except his heavy censures upon the administration which was formed in seventeen sixty five which is commonly known by the name of the marquis of rockingham's administration as the administration which preceded it is by that of mr grenville these censures relate chiefly to three heads one to the repeal of the american stamp act two to the commercial regulations then made three to the course of foreign negotiations during that short period a person who knew nothing of public affairs but from the writings of this author would be led to conclude that at the time of the change in june seventeen sixty five some well-digested system of administration founded in national strength and in the affections of the people proceeding in all points with the most reverential and tender regard to the laws and pursuing with equal wisdom and success 
everything which could tend to the internal prosperity and to the external honour and dignity of this country had been all at once subverted by an eruption of a sort of wild licentious unprincipled invaders who wantonly and with a barbarous rage had defaced a thousand fair monuments of the constitutional and political skill of their predecessors it is natural indeed that this author should have some dislike to the administration which was formed in seventeen sixty five his views in most things were different from those of his friends in some altogether opposite to them it is impossible that both of these administrations should be the objects of public esteem their different principles compose some of the strongest political lines which discriminate the parties even now subsisting amongst us the ministers of seventeen sixty four are not indeed followed by very many in their opposition yet a large part of the people now in office entertain or pretend to entertain sentiments entirely conformable to theirs while some of the former colleagues of the ministry which was formed in seventeen sixty five however they may have abandoned the connection and contradicted by their conduct the principles of their former friends pretend on their part still to adhere to the same maxims all the lesser divisions which are indeed rather names of personal attachment than of party distinction fall in with the one or the other of these leading parties i intend to state as shortly as i am able the general condition of public affairs and the disposition of the minds of men at the time of the remarkable change of system in seventeen sixty five the reader will have thereby a more distinct view of the comparative merits of these several plans and will receive more satisfaction concerning the ground and reason of the measures which were then pursued than i believe can be derived from the perusal of those partial representations contained in the state of the nation and the other writings of those who have continued for now nearly three years in the undisturbed possession of the press this will i hope be some apology for my dwelling a little on this part of the subject on the resignation of the earl of bute in seventeen sixty three our affairs had been delivered into the hands of three ministers of his recommendation mr grenville the earl of egremont and the earl of halifax this arrangement notwithstanding the retirement of lord bute announced to the public a continuance of the same measures nor was there more reason to expect a change from the death of the earl of egremont the earl of sandwich supplied his place the duke of bedford and the gentlemen who act in that connection and whose general character and politics were sufficiently understood added to the strength of the ministry without making any alteration in their plan of conduct such was the constitution of the ministry which was changed in seventeen sixty five as to their politics the principles of the peace of paris governed in foreign affairs in domestic the same scheme prevailed of contradicting the opinions and disgracing most of the persons who had been countenanced and employed in the late reign the inclinations of the people were little attended to and a disposition to the use of forcible methods ran through the whole tenor of administration the nation in general was uneasy and dissatisfied sober men saw causes for it in the constitution of the ministry and the conduct of the ministers the ministers who have usually a short method on such occasions attributed their unpopularity wholly to the efforts of faction however this might be the licentiousness and tumults of the common people and the contempt of government of which our author so often and so bitterly complains as owing to the mismanagement of the subsequent administrations had at no time risen to a greater or more dangerous height the measures taken to suppress that spirit were as violent and licentious as the spirit itself injudicious precipitate and some of them illegal instead of allaying they tended infinitely to inflame the distemper and whoever will be at the least pains to examine will find those measures not only the causes of the tumults which then prevail but the real sources of almost all the disorders which have arisen since that time 
more intent on making a victim to party than an example of justice they blundered in the method of pursuing their vengeance by this means a discovery was made of many practices common indeed in the office of secretary of state but wholly repugnant to our laws and to the genius of the english constitution one of the worst of these was the wanton and indiscriminate seizure of papers even in cases where the safety of the state was not pretended in justification of so harsh a proceeding the temper of the ministry had excited a jealousy which made the people more than commonly vigilant concerning every power which was exercised by government the abuse however sanctioned by custom was evident but the ministry instead of resting in a prudent inactivity or what would have been still more prudent taking the lead in quieting the minds of the people and ascertaining the law upon those delicate points made use of the whole influence of government to prevent a parliamentary resolution against these practices of office and less the colourable reasons offered in argument against this parliamentary procedure should be mistaken for the real motives of their conduct all the advantage of privilege all the arts and finenesses of pleading and great sums of public money were lavished to prevent any decision upon those practices in the courts of justice in the meantime in order to weaken since they could not immediately destroy the liberty of the press the privilege of parliament was voted away in all accusations for a seditious libel the freedom of debate in parliament itself was no less menaced officers of the army of long and meritorious service and of small fortunes were chosen as victims for a single vote by an exertion of ministerial power which have been very rarely used and which is extremely unjust as depriving men not only of a place but a profession and is indeed of the most pernicious example both in a civil and a military light whilst all things were managed at home with such a spirit of disorderly despotism abroad there was a proportionable abatement of all spirit some of our most just and valuable claims were in a manner abandoned this indeed seemed not very inconsistent conduct in the ministers who had made the treaty of paris with regard to our domestic affairs there was no want of industry but there was a great deficiency of temper and judgment and manly comprehension of the public interest the nation certainly wanted relief and government attempted to administer it two ways were principally chosen for this great purpose the first by regulations the second by new funds of revenue agreeably to this plan a new naval establishment was formed at a good deal of expense and to little effect to aid in the collection of the customs regulation was added to regulation and the strictest and most unreserved orders were given for a prevention of all contraband trade here and in every part of america a teasing custom-house and a multiplicity of perplexing regulations ever have and ever will appear the masterpiece of finance to people of narrow views as a paper against smuggling and the importation of french finery never fails of furnishing a very popular column in a newspaper the greatest part of these regulations were made for america and they fell so indiscriminately on all sorts of contraband or supposed contraband that some of the most valuable branches of trade were driven violently from our ports which caused an universal consternation throughout the colonies every part of the trade was infinitely distressed by them men of war now for the first time armed with regular commissions of custom-house officers invested the coasts and gave to the collection of revenue the air of hostile contribution about the same time that these regulations seemed to threaten the destruction of the only trade from whence the plantations derived any specie an act was made putting a stop to the future emission of paper currency which used to supply its place among them hand in hand with this went another act for obliging the colonies to provide quarters for soldiers instantly followed another law 
for levying throughout all america new port duties upon a vast variety of commodities of their consumption and some of which lay heavy upon objects necessary for their trade and fishery immediately upon the heels of these and amidst the uneasiness and confusion produced by a crowd of new impositions and regulations some good some evil some doubtful all crude and ill-considered came another act for imposing an universal stamp duty on the colonies and this was declared to be little more than an experiment and a foundation of future revenue to render these proceedings the more irritating to the colonies the principal argument used in favour of their ability to pay such duties was the liberality of the grants of their assemblies during the late war never could any argument be more insulting and mortifying to a people habituated to the granting of their own money taxes for the purpose of raising revenue had hitherto been sparingly attempted in america without ever doubting the extent of its lawful power parliament always doubted the propriety of such impositions and the americans on their part never thought of contesting a right by which they were so little affected their assemblies in the main answered all the purposes necessary to the internal economy of a free people and provided for all the exigencies of government which arose amongst themselves in the midst of that happy enjoyment they never thought of critically settling the exact limits of a power which was necessary to their union their safety their equality and even their liberty thus the two very difficult points superiority in the presiding state and freedom in the subordinate were on the whole sufficiently that is practically reconciled without agitating those vexatious questions which in truth rather belong to metaphysics than politics and which can never be moved without shaking the foundations of the best governments that have ever been constituted by human wisdom by this measure was let loose that dangerous spirit of disquisition not in the coolness of philosophical inquiry but inflamed with all the passions of a haughty resentful people who thought themselves deeply injured and that they were contending for everything that was valuable in the world in england our ministers went on without the least attention to these alarming dispositions just as if they were doing the most common things in the most usual way and among a people not only passive but pleased they took no one step to divert the dangerous spirit which began even then to appear in the colonies to compromise with it to mollify it or to subdue it no new arrangements were made in civil government no new powers or instructions were given to governors no augmentation was made or new disposition of forces never was so critical a measure pursued with so little provision against its necessary consequences as if all common prudence had abandoned the ministers and as if they meant to plunge themselves and us headlong into that gulf which stood gaping before them by giving a year's notice of the project of their stamp act they allowed time for all the discontents of that country to fester and come to a head and for all the arrangements which factious men could make towards an opposition to the law at the same time they carefully concealed from the eye of parliament those remonstrances which they had actually received and which in the strongest manner indicated the discontent of some of the colonies and the consequences which might be expected they concealed them even in defiance of an order of council that they should be laid before parliament thus by concealing the true state of the case they rendered the wisdom of the nation as improvident as their own temerity either in preventing or guarding against the mischief it has indeed from the beginning to this hour been the uniform policy of this set of men in order at any hazard to obtain a present credit to propose whatever might be pleasing as attended with no difficulty and afterwards to throw all the disappointment of the wild expectations they had raised upon those who have the hard task of freeing the public from the consequences of their 
pernicious projects whilst the commerce and tranquillity of the whole empire were shaken in this manner our affairs grew still more distracted by the internal dissensions of our ministers treachery and ingratitude were charged from one side despotism and tyranny from the other the vertigo of the regency bill the awkward reception of the silk bill in the house of commons and the inconsiderate and abrupt rejection of it in the house of lords the strange and violent tumults which arose in consequence and which were rendered more serious by being charged by the ministers upon one another the report of a gross and brutal treatment of the blank by a minister at the same time odious to the people all conspired to leave the public at the close of the session of seventeen sixty five in as critical and perilous a situation as ever the nation was or could be in a time when she was not immediately threatened by her neighbours end of chapter twenty four section twenty five of the works of the right honorable edmund burke volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by teresa e cow the works of the right honorable edmund burke volume one by edmund burke section twenty five it was at this time and in these circumstances that a new administration was formed professing even industriously in this public matter to avoid anecdotes i say nothing of those famous reconciliations and quarrels which weakened the body that should have been the natural support of this administration i run no risk in affirming that surrounded as they were with difficulties of every species nothing but the strongest and most uncorrupt sense of their duty to the public could have prevailed upon some of the persons who composed it to undertake the king's business at such a time their preceding character their measures while in power and the subsequent conduct of many of them i think leave no room to charge this assertion to flattery having undertaken the commonwealth what remained of them to do to piece their conduct upon the broken chain of former measures if they had been so inclined the ruinous nature of those measures which began instantly to appear would not have permitted it scarcely had they entered into office when letters arrived from all parts of america making loud complaints backed by strong reasons against several of the principal regulations of the late ministry as threatening destruction to many valuable branches of commerce these were attended with representations from many merchants and capital manufacturers at home who had all their interest involved in the support of lawful trade and in the suppression of every sort of contraband whilst these things were under consideration that conflagration blazed out at once in north america and universal disobedience and open resistance to the stamp act and in consequence an universal stop to the course of justice and to trade and navigation throughout that great important country an interval during which the trading interest of england lay under the most dreadful anxiety which it ever felt the repeal of that act was proposed it was much too serious a measure and attended with too many difficulties upon every side for the then ministry to have undertaken it as some paltry writers have asserted from envy and dislike to their predecessors in office as little could it be owing to personal cowardice and dread of consequences to themselves ministers timorous from their attachment to place and power will fear more from the consequences of one court intrigue than from a thousand difficulties to the commerce and credit of their country by disturbances at three thousand miles distance 
from which of these ministers had most to apprehend at that time is known, I presume universally. Nor did they take that resolution from a want of the fullest sense of the inconveniences which must necessarily attend a measure of concession from the sovereign to the subject. That it must increase the insolence of the mutinous spirit in America was but too obvious. No great measure indeed at a very difficult crisis can be pursued, which is not attended with some mischief. None but conceited pretenders in public business will hold any other language, and none but weak and unexperienced men will believe them, if they should. If we were found in such a crisis, let those whose bold designs and whose defective arrangements brought us into it answer for the consequences." The business of the then ministry evidently was to take such steps not as the wishes of an author or as their own wishes dictated, but as the bad situation in which their predecessors had left them absolutely required. The disobedience to this act was universal throughout America. Nothing, it was evident, but the sending of very strong military, backed by a very strong naval force, would reduce the seditious to obedience. To send it to one town would not be sufficient. Every province of America must be traversed and must be subdued. I do not entertain the least doubt, but this could be done. We might, I think, without much difficulty, have destroyed our colonies. This destruction might be effected probably in a year or in two at the utmost. If the question was upon a foreign nation where every successful stroke adds to your own power and takes from that of a rival, a just war with such a certain superiority would be undoubtedly an advisable measure. But four million of debt due to our merchants, the total cessation of a trade annually worth four million more, a large foreign traffic, much home manufacture, a very capital immediate revenue arising from colony imports, indeed the produce of every one of our revenues greatly depending on this trade, all these were very weighty accumulated considerations, at least well to be weighted, before that sword was drawn, which even by its victories must produce all the evil effects of the greatest national defeat. How public credit must have suffered, I need not say. If the condition of the nation at the close of our foreign war was what this author represents it, such a civil war would have been a bad couch on which to repose our wearied virtue. Far from being able to have entered into new plans of economy, we must have launched into a new sea, I fear a boundless sea, of expense. Such an addition of debt, with such a diminution of revenue and trade, would have left us in no want of a state of the nation to aggravate the picture of our distresses. Our trade felt this to its vitals, and our then ministers were not ashamed to say that they sympathized with the feelings of our merchants. The universal alarm of the whole trading body of England will never be laughed at by them as an ill-grounded or a pretended panic. The universal desire of that body will always have great weight with them in every consideration connected with commerce. Neither ought the opinion of that body to be slighted, notwithstanding the contemptuous and indecent language of this author and his associates, in any consideration whatsoever of revenue. Nothing amongst us is more quickly or deeply affected by taxes of any kind than trade, and if an American tax was a real relief to England, no part of the community would be sooner or more materially relieved by it than our merchants. But they well know that the trade of England must be more burdened by one penny raised in America than by three in England. And if that penny be raised with the uneasiness, the discontent, and the confusion of America, more than by ten. If the opinion and wish of the landed interest is a motive, and it is a fair and just one, for taking away a real and large revenue, the desire of the trading interest of England ought to be a just ground for taking away a tax of little better than speculation, which was to be collected by a war, 
which was to be kept up with the perpetual discontent of those who were to be affected by it, and the value of whose produce, even after the ordinary charges of collection, was very uncertain. After the extraordinary, the dearest purchased revenue that ever was made by any nation. These were some of the motives drawn from principles of convenience for that repeal. When the object came to be more narrowly inspected, every motive concurred. These colonies were evidently founded in subservience to the commerce of Great Britain. From this principle, the whole system of our laws concerning them became a system of restriction. A double monopoly was established on the part of the parent country. One, a monopoly of their whole import, which is to be altogether from Great Britain. Two, a monopoly of all their export, which is to be nowhere but to Great Britain, as far as it can serve any purpose here. On the same idea, it was contrived that they should send all their products to us raw and in their first state, and that they should take everything from us in the last stage of manufacture. Wherever a people under such circumstances, that is, a people who were to export raw and to receive manufactured, and this not a few luxurious articles, but all articles, even to those of the grossest, most vulgar, and necessary consumption, a people who were in the hands of a general monopolist, wherever such a people suspected of a possibility of becoming a just object of revenue, all the ends of their foundation must be supposed utterly contradicted before they could become such an object. Every trade law we have made must have been eluded and become useless before they could be in such a condition. The partisans of the new system, who on most occasions take credit for full as much knowledge as they possess, think proper on this occasion to counterfeit an extraordinary degree of ignorance, and in consequence of it to assert that the balance between the colonies and Great Britain is unknown, and that no important conclusion can be drawn from premises so very uncertain. Now to what can this ignorance be owing? Were the navigation laws made? that this balance should be unknown? Is it from the course of exchange that it is unknown, which all the world knows to be greatly and perpetually against the colonies? Is it from the doubtful nature of the trade we carry on with the colonies? Are not these schemists well apprised that the colonists, particularly those of the northern provinces, import more from Great Britain, ten times more, than they send to return to us? that a great part of their foreign balance is and must be remitted to London. I shall be ready to admit that the colonies ought to be taxed to the revenues of this country when I know that they are out of debt to its commerce. This author will furnish some ground to his theories and communicate a discovery to the public, if he can show this by any medium. But he tells us that their seas are covered with ships and their rivers floating with commerce. This is true, but it is with our ships that these seas are covered and their rivers float with British commerce. The American merchants are our factors, all in reality, most even in name. The Americans trade, navigate, cultivate with English capitals, to their own advantage to be sure, for without these capitals their plows would be stopped and their ships wind bound. But he who furnishes the capital must, on the whole, be the person principally benefited. The person who works upon it profits on his part too, but he profits in a subordinate way, as our colonies do. That is, as the servant of a wise and indulgent master, and no otherwise. We have all, except the perculium, without which even slaves will not labor. If the author's principles, which are the common notions, be right, that the price of our manufacturers is so greatly enhanced by our taxes, then the Americans already pay in that way a share of our impositions. He is not ashamed to assert that France and China may be said on the same principle to bear a part of our charges for they consume our commodities. Was ever such a method of reasoning heard of? Do not the laws absolutely confine the colonies to buy from us, whether foreign nations sell cheaper or not? On what other idea 
are all our prohibitions, regulations, guards, penalties, and forfeitures framed? To secure to us not a commercial preference, which stands in need of no penalties to enforce it, it finds its own way, but to secure to us a trade, which is a creature of law and institution. What has this to do with the principles of a foreign trade, which is under no monopoly and which we cannot raise the price of our goods without hazarding the demand for them? None but the authors of such measures could ever think of making use of such arguments. Whoever goes about to reason on any part of the policy of this country with regard to America, upon the mere abstract principles of government, or even upon those of our own ancient constitution, will be often misled. Those who resort for arguments to the most respectable authorities, ancient or modern, or rest upon the clearest maxims drawn from the experience of other states and empires, will be liable to the greatest errors imaginable. The object is wholly new in the world. It is singular. It has grown up to this magnitude and importance without the memory of man. Nothing in history is parallel to it. All the reasonings about it that are likely to be at all solid must be drawn from its actual circumstances. In this new system, a principle of commerce, of artificial commerce, must predominate. This commerce must be secured by a multitude of restraints very alien from the spirit of liberty, and a powerful authority must reside in the principal state in order to enforce them. But the people who are to be the subjects of these restraints are descendants of Englishmen, and of a high and free spirit. To hold over them a government made up of nothing but restraints and penalties and taxes in the granting of which they can have no share will neither be wise nor long practicable. People must be governed in a manner agreeable to their temper and disposition, and men of free character and spirit must be ruled with at least some condescension to this spirit and this character. The British colonist must see something which will distinguish him from the colonists of other nations. Those seasonings, which infer from the many restraints under which we have already laid America, to our right to lay it under still more, and indeed under all manner of restraints, are conclusive, conclusive as to right, but the very reverse as to policy and practice. We ought rather to infer from our having laid the colonies under many restraints that it is reasonable to compensate them by every indulgence that can by any means be reconciled to our interest. We have a great empire to rule, composed of a vast mass of heterogeneous governments, all more or less free and popular in their forms, all to be kept in peace and kept out of conspiracy with one another, all to be held in subordination to this country. While the spirit of an extensive and intricate and trading interest pervades the whole, always qualifying and often controlling every general idea of constitution and government, it is a great and difficult object and I wish we may possess wisdom and temper enough to manage it as we ought. Its importance is infinite. I believe the reader will be struck, as I have been, with one singular fact. In the year 1704, but 65 years ago, the whole trade with our plantations was but a few thousand pounds more in the export article and a third less in the import than that which we now carry on with the single island of Jamaica. Total English plantations in 1704. Exports, 488,265 pounds. Imports, 814,491 pounds. Jamaica, 1767. Exports, 467,681 pounds. Imports, 1,243,742 pounds. From the same information I find that our dealing with most of the European nations is but little increased, these nations have been pretty much at a stance since that time, and we have rivals in their trade. This colony intercourse is a new world of commerce in a manner created. It stands upon principles of its own, principles hardly worth endangering for any little consideration of extorted revenue. The reader sees that I do not enter so fully into this matter as obviously I might. I have already been led into greater lengths than I intended. 
It is enough to say that before the ministers of 1765 had determined to propose the repeal of the Stamp Act in Parliament, they had the whole of the American Constitution and commerce very fully before them. They considered maturely, they decided with wisdom, let me add with firmness, for they resolved as a preliminary to that repeal to assert in the fullest and least equivocal terms the unlimited legislative right of this country over its colonies, and having done this, to propose the repeal on principles not of constitutional right, but on those of expediency, of equity, of lenity, and of the true interests present and future of that great object for which alone the colonies were founded, navigation and commerce. This plan, I say, required an uncommon degree of firmness, when we consider that some of those persons who might be of the greatest use in promoting the repeal violently withstood the declaratory act, and they who agreed with administration in the principles of the law equally made, as well the reasons on which the declaratory act itself stood, as those on which it was opposed, grounds for the in opposition to the repeal. If the then ministry resolved first to declare the right, it was not from any opinion they entertained of its future use in regular taxation. Their opinions were full and declared against the ordinary use of such a power. But it was plain that the general reasonings which were employed against that power went directly to our whole legislative right. And one part of it could not be yielded to such arguments without a virtual surrender of all the rest. Besides, if that very specific power of levying money in the colonies were not retained as a sacred trust in the hands of Great Britain, to be used, not in the first instance for supply, but in the last exigence for control, it is obvious that the presiding authority of Great Britain, as the head, the arbiter, and director of the whole empire, would vanish into an empty name without operation or energy. With the habitual exercise of such a power in the ordinary course of supply, no trace of freedom could remain to America. If Great Britain were stripped of this right, every principle of unity and subordination in the empire was gone forever. Whether all this can be reconciled in legal speculation is a matter of no consequence. It is reconciled in policy, and politics ought to be adjusted not to human reasonings, but to human nature, of which the reason is but a part, and by no means the greatest part. Founding the repeal on this basis, it was judged proper to lay before Parliament the whole detail of the American affairs, as fully as it had been laid before the ministry themselves. Ignorance of those affairs had misled Parliament. Knowledge alone could bring it into the right road. Every paper of office was laid upon the table of the two houses. Every denomination of men, either in America or connected with it by office, by residence, by commerce, by interest, even by injury. Men of civil and military capacity, officers of the revenue, merchants, manufacturers of every species, and from every town in England, attended at the bar. Such evidence never was laid before Parliament. If an emulation arose among the ministers and members of Parliament, as the author rightly observes, for the repeal of this act, as well as for the other regulations, it was not on the competent assertions, the airy speculations, or the vain promises of ministers that it arose. It was the sense of Parliament on the evidence before them. No one so much as suspects that ministerial allurements or terrors had any share in it. Our author is very much displeased that so much credit was given to the testimony of merchants. He has a habit of railing at them, and he may, if he pleases, indulge himself in it. It will not do great mischief to that respectable set of men. The substance of their testimony was that their debts in America were very great, that the Americans declined to pay them or to renew their orders, whilst this act continued, that under these circumstances they despaired of the recovery of their debts or the renewal of their trade in the country, that they apprehended a general failure of mercantile credit. The manufacturers deposed to the same general purpose with this addition that many of them had discharged several of their artificers and if the law and the resistance to it should continue, must dismiss them all. This testimony is treated with great contempt by our author. It must be, I suppose, because it was contradicted by the plain nature of things. 
Suppose then that the merchants had, to gratify this author, given a contrary evidence, and had deposed that while America remained in a state of resistance, whilst four million of debt remained unpaid, whilst the course of justice was suspended for want of stamped paper, so that no debt could be recovered, whilst there was a total stop to trade because every ship was subject to seizure for want of stamped clearances, and while the colonies were to be declared in rebellion and subdued by armed force, that in these circumstances they would still continue to trade cheerfully and fearlessly as before. Would not such witnesses provoke universal indignation for their folly or their wickedness and be deservedly hooted from the bar? Would any human faith have given credit to such assertions? The testimony of the merchants were necessary for the detail and to bring the matter home to the feeling of the house as to the general reasons they spoke abundantly for themselves. Upon these principles was the act repealed, and it produced all the good effect which was expected from it. Quiet was restored, trade generally returned to its ancient channels, time and means were furnished for the better strengthening of government there, as well as for recovering by judicious measures the affections of the people, had that ministry continued, or had a ministry succeeded with dispositions to improve that opportunity. Such an administration did not succeed. Instead of profiting of that season of tranquility, in the very next year they chose to return to measures of the very same nature with those which had been so solemnly condemned, though upon a smaller scale. The effects have been correspondent. America is again in disorder, not indeed in the same degree as formerly, nor anything like it. Such good effects have attended the repeal of the Stamp Act that the colonies have actually paid the taxes, and they have sought their redress upon however improper principles, not in their own violence as formerly, but in the experience benignity of Parliament. They are not easy indeed, nor ever will be so, under this author's schemes of taxation, but we see no longer the same general fury and confusion which attended the resistance to the Stamp Act. The author may rail at the repeal, and those who proposed it, as he pleases, those honest men suffer all as obloquy with pleasure in the midst of the quiet which they have been the means of giving to their country and would think his praises for their perseverance in a pernicious scheme, a very bad compensation for the disturbance of our peace and the ruin of our commerce. Whether the return to the system 1764 for raising a revenue in America, the discontents which have ensued in consequence of it, the general suspension of the assemblies in consequence of these discontents, the use of the military power, and the new and dangerous commissions which now hang over them will produce equally good effects, is greatly to be doubted. Never, I fear, will this nation and the colonies fall back upon their true center of gravity and natural point of repose until the ideas of 1766 are resumed and steadily pursued. As to the regulations, a great subject of the author's accusation, they are of two sorts, one of a mixed nature of revenue and trade, the other simply relative to trade. With regard to the former, I shall observe that in all deliberations concerning America, the ideas of that administration were principally these, to take trade as the primary end and revenue, but as a very subordinate consideration. Where trade was likely to suffer, they did not hesitate for an instant to prefer it to taxes, whose produce, at best, was contemptible, in comparison of the object which they might endanger. The other of their principles was to suit the revenue to this object. Where the difficulty of collection from the nature of the country and of the revenue establishment is so very notorious, it was their policy to hold out as few temptations to smuggling as possible, by keeping the duties as nearly as they could on a balance with the risk. On these principles, they made many alterations in the port duties of 1764, both in the mode and in the quantity. The author has not attempted to prove them erroneous. He complains enough to show that he is in an ill humor, not that his adversaries have done amiss. As to the regulations which were merely relative to commerce, many were then made and they were all made upon this principle that many of the colonies and those some of the most abounding in people were so situated as to have very few means of traffic with this country. 
It became, therefore, our interest to let them into as much foreign trade as could be given them without interfering with our own, and to secure by every method the returns to the mother country. Without some such scheme of enlargement, it was obvious that any benefit we could expect from these colonies must be extremely limited. Accordingly, many faculties were given to their trade with the foreign plantations and with the southern parts of Europe. As to the confining the returns to this country, administration saw the mischief and folly of a plan of indiscriminate restraint. They applied their remedy to that part where the disease existed and to that only. On this idea, they established regulations far more likely to check the dangerous clandestine trade with Hamburg and Holland than this author's friends or any of their predecessors had ever done. The friends of the author have a method surely a little whimsical in all this sort of discussions. They have made an innumerable multitude of commercial regulations at which the trade of England exclaimed with one voice, and many of which have been altered on the unanimous opinion of that trade. Still they go on, just as before, in a sort of droning panderic on themselves. Talking of these regulations as prodigies of wisdom, and instead of appealing to those who are most affected and the best judges, they turn round in a perpetual circle of their own reasonings and pretenses. They hand you over from one of their own pamphlets to another. See, say they, this demonstrates in the regulations of the colonies. See, this satisfactorily proved in the considerations. By and by, we shall have another. See, for this, the state of the nation. I wish to take another method in vindicating the opposite system. I refer to the petitions of merchants for these regulations, to their thanks when they were obtained, and to the strong and grateful sense they have ever since expressed of the benefits received under that administration. All administrations have in their commercial regulations been generally aided by the opinion of some merchants, too frequently by that of a few and those a sort of favorites. They have been directed by the opinion of one or two merchants who were to merit in flatteries and to be paid in contracts, who frequently advise not for the general good of trade but for their private advantage. During the administration of which this author complains, the meetings of merchants upon the business of trade were numerous and public, sometimes at the house of the Marquise of Rockingham, sometimes at Mr. Doddswell's, sometimes at Sir George Saville's, a house always open to every deliberation favorable to the liberty or the commerce of his country. Nor were these meetings confined to the merchants of London. Merchants and manufacturers were invited from all the considerable towns in England. They conferred with the ministers and active members of Parliament. No private views, no local interests prevailed. Never were points in trade settled upon a larger scale of information. They who attended these meetings well know what ministers they were, who heard the most patiently, who comprehended the most clearly, and who provided the most wisely. Let then this author and his friends still continue in position of the practice of exalting their own abilities in their pamphlets and in the newspapers. They never will persuade the public that the merchants of England were in a general confederacy to sacrifice their own interests to those of North America and to destroy the vent of their own goods in favor of the manufacturers of France and Holland. Had the friends of this author taken these means of information, his extreme terrors of contraband in the West India Islands would have been greatly quieted, and his objections to the opening of the ports would have ceased. He would have learned from the most satisfactory analysis of the West India trade that we have the advantage in every essential article of it, and that almost every restriction on our communication with our neighbors there is a restriction unfavorable to ourselves. Such were the principles that guided and the authority that sanctioned these regulations. No man ever said that in the multiplicity of regulations made in the administration of their predecessors, none were useful. Some certainly were so, and I defy the author to show a commercial regulation of that period, which he can prove from any authority except his own, to have a tendency beneficial to commerce that has been repealed. So far were that ministry from being guided by a spirit of contradiction or of innovation. The author's attack on that administration for their neglect of our claims on foreign powers 
is by much the most astonishing instance he has given, or that I believe any man ever did give, of an intrepid effrontery. It relates to the Manila Ransom, to the Canada Bills, and to the Russian Treaty. Could one imagine that these very things which he thus chooses to object to others have been the principal subject of charge against his favorite ministry? Instead of clearing them of these charges, he appears not so much as to have heard of them, but throws them directly upon the administration, which succeeded to that of his friends. End of section 25. Section 26 of the Works of the Right Honourable Edmund Burke, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. The Works of the Right Honourable Edmund Burke, Volume 1, by Edmund Burke. Part 9 of Observations on a Late Publication, entitled The Present State of the Nation. It is not always very pleasant to be obliged to produce the detail of this kind of transactions to the public view. I will content myself, therefore, with giving a short state of facts, which, when the author chooses to contradict, he shall see proved, more perhaps to his conviction than to his liking. The first fact, then, is that the demand for the Manila ransom had been in the author's favourite administration so neglected as to appear to have been little less than tacitly abandoned. At home, no countenance was given to the claimants, and when it was mentioned in Parliament, the then leader did not seem, at least, a very sanguine advocate in favour of the claim. These things made it a matter of no small difficulty to resume and press that negotiation with Spain. However, so clear was our right that the then ministers resolved to revive it, and so little time was lost that though that administration was not completed until the 9th of July, 1765, on the 20th of the following August, General Conway transmitted a strong and full remonstrance on that subject to the Earl of Rochford. The argument, on which the Court of Madrid most relied, was the dereliction of that claim by the preceding ministers. However, it was still pushed with so much vigour that the Spaniards, from a positive denial to pay, offered to refer the demand to arbitration. That proposition was rejected, and the demand being still pressed, there was all the reason in the world to expect it being brought to a favourable issue, when it was thought proper to change the administration. Whether under their circumstances, and in the time they continued in power, more could be done, the reader will judge, who will hear with astonishment a charge of remissness from those very men whose inactivity, to call it by no worse a name, laid the chief difficulties in the way of the revived negotiation. As to the Canada bills, this author thinks proper to assert that the proprietors found themselves under a necessity of compounding their demands upon the French court and accepting terms which they had often rejected and which the Earl of Halifax had declared he would sooner forfeit his hand than sign. When I know that the Earl of Halifax says so, the Earl of Halifax shall have an answer but I persuade myself that his lordship has given no authority for this ridiculous rant. In the meantime, I shall only speak of it as a common concern of that ministry. In the first place, then, I observe that a convention for the liquidation of the Canada bills was concluded under the administration of 1766, when nothing was concluded under that of the favourites of this author. Two, this transaction was, in every step of it, carried on in concert with the persons interested and was terminated to their entire satisfaction. They would have acquiesced perhaps in terms somewhat lower than those which were obtained. The author is indeed too kind to them. He will, however, let them speak for themselves, 
and show what their own opinion was of the measures pursued in their favour. In what manner the execution of the Convention has been since provided for, it is not my present business to examine. 3. The proprietors had absolutely despaired of being paid, at any time, any proportion of their demand until the change of that ministry. The merchants were checked and discountenanced. They had often been told, by some in authority, of the cheap rate at which these Canada bills had been procured. Yet the author can talk of the composition of them as a necessity induced by the change in administration. They found themselves indeed, before that change, under a necessity of hinting somewhat of bringing the matter into Parliament. But they were soon silenced and put in mind of the fate which the Newfoundland business had there met with. Nothing struck them more than the strong contrast between the spirit and method of proceeding of the two administrations. 4. The Earl of Halifax never did, nor could, refuse to sign this convention, because this convention, as it stands, never was before him. The author's last charge on that ministry, with regard to foreign affairs, is the Russian Treaty of Commerce, which the author thinks fit to assert was concluded on terms the Earl of Buckinghamshire had refused to accept of and which had been deemed by former ministers disadvantageous to the nation and by the merchants unsafe and unprofitable. Both the assertions in this paragraph are equally groundless. The treaty then concluded by Sir George McCartney was not on the terms which the Earl of Buckinghamshire had refused. The Earl of Buckinghamshire never did refuse terms, because the business never came to the point of refusal or acceptance. All he did was to receive the Russian project for a treaty of commerce and to transmit it to England. This was in November 1764, and he left Petersburg the January following, before he could even receive an answer from his own court. The conclusion of the treaty fell to his successor, Whoever will be at the trouble to compare it with the Treaty of 1734 will, I believe, confess that, if the former ministers could have obtained such terms, they were criminal in not accepting them. But the merchants deemed them unsafe and unprofitable. What merchants? As no treaty ever was more maturely considered, so the opinion of the Russia merchants in London was all along taken and all the instructions sent over were in exact conformity to that opinion. Our minister there made no step without having previously consulted our merchants resident in Petersburg, who, before the signing of the treaty, gave the most full and unanimous testimony in its favour. In their address to our minister at that court, among other things they say, it may afford some additional satisfaction to Your Excellency to receive a public acknowledgement of the entire and unreserved approbation of every article in this treaty from us who are so immediately and so nearly concerned in its consequences. This was signed by the Consul General and every British merchant in Petersburg. The approbation of those immediately concerned in the consequences is nothing to this author. He and his friends have so much tenderness for people's interests and understand them so much better than they do themselves that, whilst these politicians are contending for the best of possible terms, the claimants are obliged to go without any terms at all. One of the first and justest complaints against the administration of the author's friends was the want of rigour in their foreign negotiations. Their immediate successors endeavoured to correct that error, along with others, and there was scarcely a foreign court in which the new spirit that had arisen was not sensibly felt, acknowledged, and sometimes complained of. On their coming into administration, they found the demolition of Dunkirk entirely at a stand. Instead of demolition, they found construction, for the French were then at work on the repair of the jetties. On the remonstrances of General Conway, 
some parts of these jetties were immediately destroyed. The Duke of Richmond personally surveyed the place and obtained a fuller knowledge of its true state and condition than any of our ministers had done, and, in consequence, had larger offers from the Duke of Chazelle than had ever been received. But, as these were short of our just expectations under the treaty, he rejected them. Our then ministers, knowing that, in their administration, the people's minds were set at ease upon all the essential points of public and private liberty, and that no project of theirs could endanger the concord of the empire, were under no restraint from pursuing every just demand upon foreign nations. The author, towards the end of this work, falls into reflections upon the state of public morals in this country. He draws use from this doctrine by recommending his friend to the king and the public as another Duke of Sully, and he concludes the whole performance with a very devout prayer. The prayers of politicians may sometimes be sincere, and as this prayer is in substance that the author or his friends may be soon brought into power, I have great reason to believe it is very much from the heart. It must be owned, too, that after he has drawn such a picture, such a shocking picture, of the state of this country, he has great faith in thinking the means he prays for sufficient to relieve us. After the character he has given of its inhabitants of all ranks and classes, he has great charity in caring much about them, and indeed no less hope in being of opinion, that such a detestable nation can ever become the care of providence. He has not even found five good men in our devoted city. He talks, indeed, of men of virtue and ability. But where are his men of virtue and ability to be found? Are they in the present administration? Never were a set of people more blackened by this author. Are they among the party of those? no small body, who adhere to the system of 1766? These it is the great purpose of this book to calumniate. Are they the persons who acted with his great friend since the change in 1762 to his removal in 1765? Scarcely any of these are now out of employment, and we are in possession of his desideratum. Yet I think he hardly means to select even some of the highest of them, as examples fit for the reformation of a corrupt world. He observes that the virtue of the most exemplary prince that ever swayed a sceptre can never warm or illuminate the body of his people if foul mirrors are placed so near him as to refract and dissipate the rays at their first emanation. Without observing upon the propriety of this metaphor, or asking how mirrors come to have lost their old quality of reflecting, and to have acquired that of refracting and dissipating rays, and how far their foulness will account for this change, the remark itself is common and true. No less true, and equally surprising from him, is that which immediately precedes it. It is in vain to endeavour to check the progress of irreligion and licentiousness by punishing such crimes in one individual, if others equally culpable are rewarded with the honours and emoluments of the state. I am not in the secret of the author's manner of writing, but it appears to me that he must intend these reflections as a satire upon the administration of his happy years. Were ever the honours and emoluments of the state more lavishly squandered upon persons scandalous in their lives than during that period? In these scandalous lives, was there anything more scandalous than the mode of punishing one culpable individual? In that individual, is anything more culpable than his having been seduced by the example of some of those very persons by whom he was thus persecuted? The author is so eager to attack others that he provides but indifferently for his own defence. I believe, without going beyond the page I have now before me, he is very sensible that I have sufficient matter of further, and if possible, 
of heavier charge against his friends upon his own principle. But it is because the advantage is too great that I decline making use of it. I wish the author had not thought that all methods are lawful in party. Above all, he ought to have taken care not to wound his enemies through the sides of his country. This he has done by making that monstrous and overcharged picture of the distresses of our situation. No wonder that he, who finds this country in the same condition with that of France at the time of Henry the Fourth, could also find a resemblance between his political friend and the Duke of Sully. As to those personal resemblances, people will often judge of them from their affections. They may imagine in these clouds whatsoever figures they please, but what is the confirmation of that eye which can discover a resemblance of this country and these times to those with which the author compares them? France, a country just recovered out of twenty-five years of the most cruel and desolating civil war that perhaps was ever known. The kingdom, under the veil of momentary quiet, full of the most atrocious political, operating upon the most furious fanatical factions. Some pretenders even to the crown, and those who did not pretend to the whole, aimed at the partition of the monarchy. There were almost as many competitors as provinces, and all abetted by the greatest, the most ambitious, and most enterprising power in Europe. No place safe from treason, no not the bosoms on which the most amiable prince that ever lived reposed his head, not his mistresses, not even his queen. As to the finances, they had scarce an existence, but as a matter of plunder to the managers, and of grants to insatiable and ungrateful courtiers. How can our author have the heart to describe this as any sort of parallel to our situation? To be sure, an April shower has some resemblance to a water spout, for they are both wet, and there is some likeness between a summer evening's breeze and a hurricane. They are both wind. But who can compare our disturbances, our situation, or our finances to those of France in the time of Henry? Great Britain is indeed at this time wearied, but not broken, with the efforts of a victorious foreign war not sufficiently relieved by an inadequate peace, but somewhat benefited by that peace, and infinitely by the consequences of that war. The powers of Europe awed by our victories and lying in ruins upon every side of us. Burdened indeed we are with debt, but abounding with resources. We have a trade, not perhaps equal to our wishes, but more than ever we possessed. In effect, no pretender to the crown, nor nutriment for such desperate and destructive factions as have formerly shaken this kingdom. As to our finances, the author trifles with us. When Sully came to those of France, in what order was any part of the financial system, or what system was there at all? There is no man in office who must not be sensible that ours is without the act of any parading minister, the most regular and orderly system, perhaps, that was ever known, the best secured against all frauds in the collection and all misapplication in the expenditure of public money. I admit that, in this flourishing state of things, there are appearances enough to excite uneasiness and apprehension. I admit there is a cankerworm in the rose. Medio del fonte leporum, surgit amari a liquid, quod in ipsis floribus angat. This is nothing else than a spirit of disconnection, of distrust, and of treachery among public men. It is no accidental evil, nor has its effect been trusted to the usual frailty of nature. The distemper has been inoculated. The author is sensible of it, and we lament it together. This distemper is alone sufficient to take away considerably from the benefits of our constitution and situation 
and perhaps to render their continuance precarious. If these evil dispositions should spread much farther, they must end in our destruction, for nothing can save a people destitute of public and private faith. However, the author, for the present state of things, has extended the charge by much too widely, as men are but too apt to take the measure of all mankind from their own particular acquaintance. Barren as this age may be in the growth of honour and virtue, the country does not want, at this moment, as strong, and those not a few examples, as were ever known, of an unshaken adherence to principle, an attachment to connection, against every allurement of interest. Those examples are not furnished by the great alone, nor by those whose activity in public affairs may render it suspected that they may make such a character one of the rounds in their ladder of ambition, but by men more quiet and more in the shade, on whom an unmixed sense of honour alone could operate. Such examples, indeed, are not furnished in great abundance amongst those who are the subjects of the author's panegyric. He must look for them in another camp. He who claims of the ill effects of a divided and heterogeneous administration is not justifiable in labouring to render odious in the eyes of the public those men whose principles, whose maxims of policy, and whose personal character can alone administer a remedy to this capital evil of the age. Neither is he consistent with himself in constantly extolling those whom he knows to be the authors of the very mischief of which he complains, and which the whole nation feels so deeply. The persons who are the object of his dislike and complaint are many of them of the first families and weightiest properties in the kingdom, but infinitely more distinguished for their untainted honour, public and private, and their zealous but sober attachment to the constitution of their country than they can be by any birth or any station. If they are the friends of any one great man rather than another, it is not that they make his aggrandisement the end of their union, or because they know him to be the most active in cabling for his connections the largest and speediest emoluments. It is because they know him, by personal experience, to have wise and enlarged ideas of the public good, and an invincible constancy in adhering to it, because they are convinced, by the whole tenor of his actions, that he will never negotiate away their honour or his own, and that, in or out of power, change of situation will make no alteration in his conduct. This will give to such a person, in such a body, an authority and respect that no minister ever enjoyed among his venal dependents, in the highest plenitude of his power. Such as civility never can give, such as ambition can never receive or relish. This body will often be reproached by their adversaries for want of ability in their political transactions. They will be ridiculed for missing many favourable conjunctures and not profiting of several brilliant opportunities of fortune. But they must be contented to endure that reproach, for they cannot acquire the reputation of that kind of ability without losing all the other reputation they possess. They will be charged, too, with a dangerous spirit of exclusion and proscription for being unwilling to mix in schemes of administration which have no bond of union or principle of confidence. That charge, too, they must suffer with patience. If the reason of the thing had not spoken loudly enough, the miserable examples of the several administrations constructed upon the idea of systematic discord would be enough to frighten them from such monstrous and ruinous conjunctions. It is, however, false that the idea of a united administration carries with it that of a proscription of any other party. It does indeed imply the necessity of having the great strongholds of government in well-united hands, in order to secure the predominance of right and uniform principles, of having the capital offices of deliberation and execution 
of those who can deliberate with mutual confidence and who will execute what is resolved with firmness and fidelity. If this system cannot be rigorously adhered to in practice, and what system can be so, it ought to be the constant aim of good men to approach as nearly to it as possible. No system of that kind can be formed which will not leave room fully sufficient for healing coalitions. But no coalition, which under the specious name of independency, carries in its bosom the unreconciled principles of the original discord of parties, ever was or will be a healing coalition. Nor will the mind of our sovereign ever know repose, his kingdom settlement, or his business order, efficiency, or grace with his people, until things are established upon the basis of some set of men who are trusted by the public and who can trust one another. This comes rather nearer to the mark than the author's description of a proper administration under the name of men of ability and virtue, which conveys no definite idea at all, nor does it apply specifically to our grand national distemper. All parties pretend to these qualities. The present ministry, no favourites of the author, will be ready enough to declare themselves persons of virtue and ability, and if they choose a vote for that purpose, perhaps it would not be quite impossible for them to procure it. But, if the disease be this distrust and disconnection, it is easy to know who are sound and who are tainted, who are fit to restore us to health, who to continue and to spread the contagion, the present ministry being made up of drafts from all parties in the kingdom, if they should profess any adherence to the connections they have left, they must convict themselves of the blackest treachery. They therefore choose rather to renounce the principle itself and to brand it with the name of pride and faction. This test with certainty discriminates the opinions of men. The other is a description vague and unsatisfactory. As to the unfortunate gentleman who may at any time compose that system, which, under the plausible title of an administration, subsists but for the establishment of weakness and confusion, they fall into different classes, with different merits. I think the situation of some people in that state may deserve a certain degree of compassion, at the same time that they furnish an example, which, it is to be hoped, by being a severe one, will have its effect at least on the growing generation. If an original seduction, on plausible but hollow pretenses, into loss of honour, friendship, consistency, security and repose, can furnish it. It is possible to draw, even from the very prosperity of ambition, examples of terror and motives to compassion. I believe the instances are exceedingly rare of men immediately passing over a clear marked line of virtue into declared vice and corruption. There are a sort of middle tints and shades between the two extremes. There is something uncertain on the confines of the two empires which they first pass through and which renders the change easy and imperceptible. There are even a sort of splendid imposition so well contrived that, at the very time the path of rectitude is quitted for ever, men seem to be advancing into some higher and nobler road of public conduct. Not that such impositions are strong enough in themselves, but a powerful interest, often concealed from those whom it affects, works at the bottom and secures the operation. Men are thus debauched away from those legitimate connections, which they had formed on a judgment, early perhaps, but sufficiently mature and wholly unbiased. They do not quit them upon any ground of complaint, for grounds of just complaint may exist, but upon the flattering and most dangerous of all principles, that of mending what is well. Gradually they are habituated to other company, and a change in their habitudes soon makes a way for the change in their opinions. Certain persons are no longer so very frightful when they are come to be known and to be serviceable. 
As to their old friends, the transition is easy. From friendship to civility, from civility to enmity, few other steps from dereliction to persecution. People not very well grounded in the principles of public morality find a set of maxims in office ready-made for them, which they assume as naturally and inevitably as any of the insignia or instruments of the situation. A certain tone of the solid and practical is immediately acquired. Every former profession of public spirit is to be considered as a debauch of youth or, at best, as a visionary scheme of unattainable perfection. The very idea of consistency is exploded. The convenience of the business of the day is to furnish the principle for doing it. Then the whole ministerial cant is quickly got by heart. The prevalence of faction is to be lamented. All opposition is to be regarded as the effect of envy and disappointed ambition. All administrations are declared to be alike. The same necessity justifies all their measures. It is no longer a matter of discussion who or what administration is, but that administration is to be supported is a general maxim. Flattering themselves that their power is become necessary to the support of all order and government, everything which tends to the support of that power is sanctified and becomes a part of the public interest. Growing every day more form to affairs and better knit in their limbs when the occasion, now the only rule, requires it, they become capable of sacrificing those very persons to whom they had before sacrificed their original friends. It is now only in the ordinary course of business to alter an opinion or to betray a connection. Frequently relinquishing one set of men and adopting another, they grow into a total indifference to human feeling, as they had before to moral obligation, until at length no one original impression remains upon their minds. Every principle is obliterated, every sentiment effaced. In the meantime, that power, which all these changes aimed at securing, remains still as tottering and as uncertain as ever. They are delivered up into the hands of those who feel neither respect for their persons nor gratitude for their favours, who are put about them in appearance to serve, in reality to govern them, and when the signal is given to abandon and destroy them in order to set up some new dupe of ambition, who in his turn is to be abandoned and destroyed. Thus living in a state of continual uneasiness and ferment, softened only by the miserable consolation of giving now and then preferments to those for whom they have no value, they are unhappy in their situation, yet find it impossible to resign. Until, at length, soured in temper and disappointed by the very attainment of their ends, in some angry, in some haughty, or some negligent moment, they incur the displeasure of those upon whom they have rendered their very being dependent. Then, perierunt tempora longi servitii, they are cast off with scorn, they are turned out, emptied of all natural character, of all intrinsic worth, of all essential dignity, and deprived of every consolation of friendship. Having rendered all retreat to old principles ridiculous, and to old regards impracticable, not being able to counterfeit pleasure or to discharge discontent, nothing being sincere or right or balanced in their minds, it is more than a chance that, in the delirium of the last stage of their distempered power, they make an insane political testament by which they throw all their remaining weight and consequence into the scale of their declared enemies, and the avowed authors of their destruction. Thus they finish their course. Had it been possible that the whole, or even a great part of these effects on their minds, I say nothing of the effect upon their fortunes, could have appeared to them in their first departure from the right line, it is certain they would have rejected every temptation with horror. The principle of these remarks, 
like every good principle in morality, is trite, but its frequent application is not the less necessary. As to others, who are plain, practical men, they have been guiltless at all times of all public pretense. Neither the author nor anyone else has reason to be angry with them. They belonged to his friend for their interest. For their interest, they quitted him and when it is their interest, he may depend upon it, they will return to their former connection. Such people subsist at all times, and though the nuisance of all, are at no time a worthy subject of discussion. It is false virtue and plausible error that do the mischief. If men come to government with right dispositions, they have not that unfavourable subject which this author represents to work upon. Our circumstances are indeed critical, but then they are the critical circumstances of a strong and mighty nation. If corruption and meanness are greatly spread, they are not spread universally. Many public men are hitherto examples of public spirit and integrity. Whole parties, as far as large bodies can be uniform, have preserved character. However they may be deceived in some particulars, I know of no set of men amongst us which does not contain persons on whom the nation, in a difficult exigence, may well value itself. Private life, which is the nursery of the commonwealth, is yet in general pure, and on the whole disposed to virtue, and the people at large want neither generosity nor spirit. No small part of that very luxury, which is so much the subject of the author's declamation, but which, in most parts of life, by being well balanced and diffused, is only decency and convenience, has perhaps as many or more good than evil consequences attending it. It certainly excites industry, nourishes emulation, and inspires some sense of personal value into all ranks of people. What we want is to establish more fully an opinion of uniformity, and consistency of character in the leading men of the state, such as will restore some confidence to profession and appearance, such as will fix subordination upon esteem. Without this, all schemes are begun at the wrong end. All who join in them are liable to their consequences. All men who, under whatever pretext, take a part in the formation or the support of systems constructed in such a manner as must, in their nature, disable them from the execution of their duty, have made themselves guilty of all the present distraction, and of the future ruin which they may bring upon their country. It is a serious affair, this studied disunion in government. In cases where union is most consulted in the constitution of a ministry, and where persons are best disposed to promote it, differences, from the various ideas of men, will arise, and from their passions will often ferment into violent heats, so as greatly to disorder all public business. What must be the consequence, when the very distemper is made the basis of the constitution, and the original weakness of human nature is still further enfeebled by art and contrivance? It must subvert government from the very foundation, it turns our public councils into the most mischievous cabals, where the consideration is not how the nation's business shall be carried on, but how those who ought to carry it on shall circumvent each other. In such a state of things, no order, uniformity, dignity or effect can appear in our proceedings, either at home or abroad, nor will it make much difference whether some of the constituent parts of such an administration are men of virtue or ability, or not, supposing it possible that such men, with their eyes open, should choose to make a part in such a body. The effects of all human contrivances are in the hand of providence. I do not like to answer, as our author so readily does, for the event of any speculation, but surely the nature of our disorders, if anything, must indicate the proper remedy. Men who act steadily on the principles I have stated, 
may in all events be very serviceable to their country. In one case, by furnishing, if their sovereign should be so advised, an administration formed upon ideas very different from those which have for some time been unfortunately fashionable. But, if this should not be the case, they may be still serviceable, for the example of a large body of men, steadily sacrificing ambition to principle, can never be without use. It will certainly be prolific, and draw others to an imitation. Vera gloria radicis agit, atque etiam propagator. I do not think myself of consequence enough to imitate my author in troubling the world with the prayers or wishes I may form for the public. Full as little am I disposed to imitate his professions. Those professions are long since worn out in the political service. If the work will not speak for the author, his own declarations deserve but little credit. End of section 26Section 27 of the Works of the Right Honourable Edmund Burke, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. The Works of the Right Honourable Edmund Burke, Volume 1, by Edmund Burke. Section 27. Appendix to Observations on a Late Publication, entitled The Present State of the Nation. So much misplaced industry has been used by the author of The State of the Nation, as well as by other writers, to infuse discontent into the people, on account of the late war and of the effects of our national debt, that nothing ought to be omitted which may tend to disabuse the public upon these subjects. When I had gone through the foregoing sheets, I recollected that in pages 58, 59, 60, I only gave the comparative states of the duties collected by the excise at large, together with the quantities of strong beer brewed in the two periods which are there compared. It might still be thought that some other articles of popular consumption, of general convenience, and connected with our manufactures, might possibly have declined. I therefore now think it right to lay before the reader the state of the produce of three capital duties on such articles, duties which have frequently been made the subject of popular complaint. The duty on candles, that on soap, paper, and so forth, and that on hides. Average of net produce of duty on soap, and so forth, for eight years ending 1767, £264,902. Average of ditto for eight years ending 1754, £228,114. Average increase, £36,788. Average of net produce of duty on candles, for eight years ending 1767, one hundred and fifty five thousand seven hundred and eighty nine pounds average of ditto for eight years ending seventeen fifty four a hundred and thirty six thousand seven hundred and sixteen pounds average increase nineteen thousand and seventy three pounds average of net produce of duty on hides eight years ending seventeen sixty seven a hundred and eighty nine thousand two hundred and sixteen pounds ditto eight years ending seventeen fifty four a hundred and sixty eight thousand two hundred pounds average increase twenty one thousand and sixteen pounds the increase has not arisen from any additional duties none have been imposed on these articles during the war notwithstanding the burdens of the war and the late dearness of provisions the consumption of all these articles has increased, 
and the revenue along with it. There is another point in the state of the nation, to which I fear I have not been so full in my answer as I ought to have been, and as I am well warranted to be. The author has endeavoured to throw a suspicion, or something more, on the salutary and indeed necessary measure of opening the ports in Jamaica. Orders were given, says he, in August 1765, for the free admission of Spanish vessels into all the colonies. He then observes that the exports to Jamaica fell 40,904 L, short of those of 1764, and that the exports of the succeeding year, 1766, fell short of those of 1765, about £80, pounds, from whence he wisely infers that this decline of exports, being, since the relaxation of the laws of trade, there is a just ground of suspicion that the colonies have been supplied with foreign commodities instead of British. Here, as usual with him, the author builds on a fact which is absolutely false, and which, being so, renders his whole hypothesis absurd and impossible. He asserts that the order for admitting Spanish vessels was given in August 1765. That order was not signed at the Treasury Board until the 15th day of November following, and therefore, so far from affecting the exports of the year 1765, that supposing all possible diligence in the commissioners of the customs in expediting that order, and every advantage of vessels ready to sail, and the most favourable wind, it would hardly even arrive in Jamaica within the limits of that year. This order could therefore by no possibility be a cause of the decrease of exports in 1765. If it had any mischievous operation, it could not be before 1766. In that year, according to our author, the exports fell short of the preceding, just £80. He is welcome to that diminution and to all the consequences he can draw from it. But as an auxiliary to account for this dreadful loss, he brings in the Freeport Act, which he observes for his convenience, to have been made in spring 1766. But, for his convenience likewise, he forgets that by the express provision of the Act, the regulation was not to be in force in Jamaica until the November following. Miraculous must be the activity of that contraband, whose operation in America could, before the end of that year, have reacted upon England and checked the exportation from hence, unless he chooses to suppose that the merchants at whose solicitation this act had been obtained were so frightened at the accomplishment of their own most earnest and anxious desire that, before any good or evil effect from it could happen, they immediately put a stop to all further exportation. It is obvious that we must look for the true effect of that act at the time of its first possible operation, that is, in the year 1767. On this idea, how stands the account? 1764, exports to Jamaica, 456,000. £528. 1765. £415,624. 1766. £415,544. 1767. First year of the Freeport Act. £467,681. This author for the sake of a present momentary credit, will hazard any future and permanent disgrace. At the time he wrote, the account of 1767 could not be made up. This was the first year of the trial of the Freeport Act, and we find that the sale of British commodities is so far from being lessened by that Act, that the export of 1767 amounts to 52,000 L, more than that of either of the two preceding years, and is 11,000 L above that of his standard year, 1764. 
If I could prevail on myself to argue in favour of a great commercial scheme from the appearance of things in a single year, I should from this increase of export infer the beneficial effects of that measure. In truth, it is not wanting. Nothing but the thickest ignorance of the Jamaica trade could have made any one entertain a fancy that the least ill effect on our commerce could follow from this opening of the ports. But if the author argues the effect of regulations in the American trade from the export of the year in which they are made, or even the following, why did he not apply this rule to his own? He had the same paper before him, which I have now before me. He must have seen that in his standard year, the year 1764, the principal year of his new regulations, the export fell no less than 128,450 L, short of that in 1763. Did the export trade revive by these regulations in 1765, during which year they continued in their full force? It fell about 40,000 L, still lower. Here is a fall of 168,000 L, to account for which would have become the author much better than piddling for an 80 L fall in the year 1766, the only year in which the order he objects to could operate, or in presuming a fall of exports from a regulation which took place only in November 1766, whose effects could not appear until the following year, and which, when they do appear, utterly overthrow all his flimsy reasons and affected suspicions upon the effect of opening the ports. This author in the same paragraph says that it was asserted by the American factors and agents that the commanders of our ships of war and tenders, having custom house commissions and the strict orders given in 1764 for a due execution of the laws of trade in the colonies, had deterred the Spaniards from trading with us, that the sale of British manufacturers in the West Indies had been greatly lessened, and the receipt of large sums of specie prevented. If the American factors and agents asserted this, they had good ground for their assertion. They knew that the Spanish vessels had been driven from our ports. The author does not positively deny the fact. If he should, it will be proved. When the factors connected this measure and its natural consequences with an actual fall in the exports to Jamaica to no less an amount than 128,460L in one year and with a further fall in the next is their assertion very wonderful. The author himself is full as much alarmed by a fall of only 40,000L for giving him the facts which he chooses to coin it is no more. The expulsion of the Spanish vessels must certainly have been one cause, if not of the first declension of the exports, yet of their continuance in their reduced state. Other causes had their operation, without doubt. In what degree each cause produced its effect, it is hard to determine. But the fact of a fall of exports upon the restraining plan and of a rise upon the taking place of the enlarging plan, is established beyond all contradiction. This author says that the facts relative to the Spanish trade were asserted by American factors and agents, insinuating that the Ministry of 1766 had no better authority for their plan of enlargement than such assertions. The moment he chooses it, he shall see the very same thing asserted, by governors of provinces, by commanders of men of war, and by officers of the customs. Persons the most bound in duty to prevent contraband, and the most interested in the seizures to be made in consequence of strict regulation. I suppress them for the present, wishing that the author may not drive me to a more full discussion of this matter than it may be altogether prudent to enter into. I wish he had not made any of these discussions necessary. End of section 27
Section 28 of the Works of the Right Honourable Edmund Burke, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. The Works of the Right Honourable Edmund Burke, Volume 1 by Edmund Burke. Section 28 on the cause of the present discontents, part one. Hoc vero occultum intestinum domesticum malum, non modo non existit, verum etium opprimit, antiquam perspicere atque explore potueris. 1770. It is an undertaking of some degree of delicacy to examine into the cause of public disorders. If a man happens not to succeed in such an inquiry, he will be thought weak and visionary. If he touches the true grievance, there is a danger that he may come near to persons of weight and consequence, who will rather be exasperated at the discovery of their errors than thankful for the occasion of correcting them. If he should be obliged to blame the favourites of the people, he will be considered as the tool of power. If he censures those in power, he will be looked on as an instrument of faction. But in all exertions of duty, something is to be hazarded. In cases of tumult and disorder, our law has invested every man, in some sort, with the authority of a magistrate. When the affairs of the nation are distracted, Private people are, by the spirit of the law, justified in stepping a little out of their ordinary sphere. They enjoy a privilege of somewhat more dignity and effect than that of idle lamentation over the calamities of their country. They may look into them narrowly, they may reason upon them liberally, and if they should be so fortunate as to discover the true source of the mischief, and to suggest any probable method of removing it. Though they may displease the rulers for the day, they are certainly of service in the cause of government. Government is deeply interested in everything which, even through the medium of some temporary uneasiness, may tend finally to compose the minds of the subject, and to conciliate their affections. I have nothing to do here with the abstract value of the voice of the people, but as long as reputation, the most precious possession of every individual, and as long as opinion, the great support of the state, depend entirely upon that voice, it can never be considered as a thing of little consequence, either to individuals or to governments. Nations are not primarily ruled by laws, less by violence. Whatever original energy may be supposed, either in force or regulation, the operation of both is, in truth, merely instrumental. Nations are governed by the same methods and on the same principles by which an individual without authority is often able to govern those who are his equals or his superiors, by a knowledge of their temper and by a judicious management of it. I mean, when public affairs are steadily and quietly conducted, not when government is nothing but a continued scuffle between the magistrate and the multitude, in which sometimes the one and sometimes the other is uppermost, in which they alternately yield and prevail in a series of contemptible victories and scandalous submissions. The temper of the people amongst whom he presides ought therefore to be the first study of a statesman, and the knowledge of this temper it is by no means impossible for him to attain. If he has not an interest in being ignorant of what it is his duty to learn, to complain of the age we live in, to murmur at the present possessors of power, to lament the past, to conceive extravagant hopes of the future, are the common dispositions of the greatest part of mankind. Indeed, the necessary effects of the ignorance and levity of the vulgar such complaints and humours have existed in all times, yet as all times have not been alike, true political sagacity 
manifests itself in distinguishing that complaint which only characterises the general infirmity of human nature from those which are symptoms of the particular distemperature of our own air and season. Nobody, I believe, will consider it merely as the language of spleen or disappointment. If I say that there is something particularly alarming in the present conjuncture, there is hardly a man in or out of power who holds any other language. That government is at once dreaded and contemned, that the laws are despoiled of all their respected and salutary terrors, that their inaction is a subject of ridicule and their exertion of abhorrence, that rank and office and title and all the solemn plausibilities of the world have lost their reverence and effect, that our foreign policies are as much deranged as our domestic economy, that our dependencies are slackened in their affection and loosened from their obedience, that we know neither how to yield nor how to enforce, that hardly anything above or below, abroad or at home, is sound and entire, but that disconnection and confusion in offices, in parties, in families, in parliament, in the nation, prevail beyond the disorders of any former time. These are facts universally admitted and lamented. This state of things is the more extraordinary, because the great parties which formerly divided and agitated the kingdom are known to be in a manner entirely dissolved. No great external calamity has visited the nation. No pestilence or famine. We do not labour at present under any scheme of taxation, new or oppressive, in the quantity or in the mode. Nor are we engaged in unsuccessful war, in which our misfortunes might easily pervert our judgment and our minds, sore from the loss of national glory, might feel every blow of fortune as a crime in government. It is impossible that the cause of this strange distemper should not sometimes become a subject of discourse. It is a compliment due, and which I willingly pay, to those who administer our affairs, to take notice in the first place of their speculation. Our ministers are of opinion that the increase of our trade and manufactures that our growth by colonisation and by conquest have concurred to accumulate immense wealth in the hands of some individuals, and this again being dispersed among the people, has rendered them universally proud, ferocious and ungovernable, that the insolence of some from their enormous wealth and the boldness of others from a guilty poverty have rendered them capable of the most atrocious attempts so that they have trampled upon all subordination and violently borne down the unarmed laws of a free government. Barriers too feeble against the fury of a populace so fierce and licentious as ours. They contend that no adequate provocation has been given for so spreading a discontent. Our affairs having been conducted throughout with remarkable temper and consummate wisdom. The wicked industry of some libellers, joined to the intrigues of a few disappointed politicians, have, in their opinion, been able to produce this unnatural ferment in the nation. Nothing indeed can be more unnatural than the present convulsions of this country. If the above account be a true one, I confess I shall assent to it with great reluctance, and only on the compulsion of the clearest and firmest proofs, because their account resolves itself into this short but discouraging proposition, that we have a very good ministry, but that we are a very bad people, that we do set ourselves to bite the hand that feeds us, that with a malignant insanity we oppose the measures and ungratefully vilify the persons, of those whose sole object is our own peace and prosperity. If a few puny libellers acting under a knot of factious politicians, without virtue, parts or character, such they are constantly represented by these gentlemen, are sufficient to excite this disturbance, very perverse must be the disposition of that people, amongst whom such a disturbance 
can be excited by such means. It is besides no small aggravation of the public misfortune that the disease on this hypothesis appears to be without remedy. If the wealth of the nation be the cause of its turbulence, I imagine it is not proposed to introduce poverty as a constable to keep the peace. If our dominions abroad are the roots which feed all this rank luxuriance of sedition, it is not intended to cut them off in order to famish the fruit. If our liberty has enfeebled the executive power, there is no design. I hope to call in the aid of despotism, to fill up the deficiencies of law. Whatever may be intended, these things are not yet professed. We seem, therefore, to be driven to an absolute despair, for we have no other materials to work upon but those out of which God has been pleased to form the inhabitants of this island. If these be radically and essentially vicious, all that can be said is that those men are very unhappy, to whose fortune or duty it falls to administer the affairs of this untoward people. I hear it indeed sometimes asserted that a steady perseverance in the present measures and a rigorous punishment of those who oppose them will in course of our time infallibly put an end to these disorders. But this, in my opinion, is said without much observation of our present disposition and without any knowledge at all of the general nature of mankind. If the matter of which this nation is composed be so very fermentable as these gentlemen describe it, leaven never will be wanting to work it up. As long as discontent, revenge and ambition have existence in the world. Particular punishments are the cure for accidental distempers in the state. They inflame rather than allay those heats which arise from the settled mismanagement of the government or from a natural indisposition in the people. It is of the utmost moment not to make mistakes in the use of strong measures and firmness is then only a virtue when it accompanies the most perfect wisdom. In truth, inconstancy is a sort of natural corrective of folly and ignorance. I am not one of those who think that the people are never in the wrong. They have been so, frequently and outrageously, both in our countries and in this. But I do say that in all disputes between them and their rulers, the presumption is at least upon a par in favour of the people. Experience may perhaps justify me in going further. When popular discontents have been very prevalent, it may well be affirmed and supported that there has been generally something found amiss in the constitution or in the conduct of government. The people have no interest in disorder. When they do wrong, it is their error and not their crime. But with the governing part of the state, it is for otherwise. They certainly may act ill by design, as well as by mistake. Les révolutions qui arrivent dans les grandes états ne sont pas un effet de hazard, ni de caprice des peuples. Rien ne révolte les grands d'un royaume comme un gouvernement foible et dérangé. Pour la populace, ce n'est jamais par envie d'attaquer qu'elle se soulève, mais par impatience de souffrir. These are the words of a great man, of a minister of state, and a zealous asserter of monarchy. They are applied to the system of favouritism which was adopted by Henry III of France, and to the dreadful consequences it produced. What he says of revolutions is equally true of all great disturbances. If this presumption in favour of the subjects against the trustees of power be not the more probable, I am sure it is the more comfortable speculation because it is more easy to change an administration than to reform a people. Upon a supposition, therefore, that in the opening of the cause the presumptions stand equally balanced between the parties. There seems sufficient ground to entitle any person to a fair hearing who attempts some other scheme beside that easy one which is fashionable in some fashionable companies 
to account for the present discontents. It is not to be argued that we endure no grievance, because our grievances are not of the same sort with those under which we laboured formerly, not precisely those which we bore from the Tudors or vindicated on the Stuarts. A great change has taken place in the affairs of this country, for in the silent lapse of events, as material alterations have been insensibly brought about in the policy and character of governments and nations, as those which have been marked by the tumult of public revolutions. It is very rare indeed for men to be wrong in their feelings concerning public misconduct, as rare to be right in their speculation upon the cause of it. I have constantly observed that the generality of people are fifty years at least behind hand in their politics. There are but very few who are capable of comparing and digesting what passes before their eyes at different times and occasions, so as to form the whole into a distinct system. But in books everything is settled for them, without the exertion of any considerable diligence or sagacity, for which reason men are wise with but little reflection, and good with little self-denial, in the business of all times except their own. We are very uncorrupt and tolerably enlightened judges of the transactions of past ages, where no passions deceive, and where the whole train of circumstances, from the trifling cause to the tragical event, is set in an orderly series before us. Few are the partisans of departed tyranny, and to be a Whig on the business of a hundred years ago is very consistent with every advantage of present civility. This retrospective wisdom and historical patriotism are things of wonderful convenience and serve admirably to reconcile the old quarrel between speculation and practice. Many a stern Republican, after gorging himself with a full feast of admiration of the Grecian Commonwealth and of our true Saxon constitution, and discharging all the splendid bile of his virtuous indignation on King John and King James, sits down perfectly satisfied to the coarsest work and homeliest job of the day he lives in. I believe there was no professed admirer of Henry VIII among the instruments of the last King James, nor in the court of Henry VIII was there, I dare say, to be found a single advocate for the favourites of Richard the Second. No complacence to our court or to our age can make me believe nature to be so changed, but that public liberty will be among us, as among our ancestors, obnoxious to some person or other, and that opportunities will be furnished for attempting, at least, some alteration to the prejudice of our constitution. These attempts will naturally vary in their mode according to times and circumstances. For ambition, though it has ever the same general views, has not at all times the same means, nor the same particular objects. A great deal of the furniture of ancient tyranny is worn to rags. The rest is entirely out of fashion. Besides, there are few statesmen so very clumsy and awkward in their business as to fall into the identical snare which has proved fatal to their predecessors. When an arbitrary imposition is attempted upon the subject, undoubtedly it will not bear on its forehead the name of ship money. There is no danger that an extension of the forest laws should be the chosen mode of oppression in this age. And when we hear any instance of ministerial rapacity to the prejudice of the rights of private life, it will certainly not be the exaction of 200 pullets from a woman of fashion for leave to lie with her own husband. Every age has its own manners and its politics dependent upon them and the same attempts will not be made against a constitution fully formed and matured that were used to destroy it in the cradle or to resist its growth during its infancy. Against the being of Parliament, I am satisfied no designs have ever been entertained since the Revolution. Everyone must perceive that it is strongly the interest of the court to have some second cause interposed between the ministers and the people. 
the gentlemen of the House of Commons have an interest equally strong in sustaining the part of that intermediate cause. However, they may hire out the usufruct of their voices. They never will part with the fee and inheritance. Accordingly, those who have been of the most known devotion to the will and pleasure of a court have at the same time been most forward in asserting a high authority in the House of Commons. When they knew who were to use that authority and how it was to be employed, they thought it never could be carried too far. It must be always the wish of an unconstitutional statesman that a House of Commons, who were entirely dependent upon him, should have every right of the people entirely dependent upon their pleasure. It was soon discovered that the forms of a free and the ends of an arbitrary government were things not altogether incompatible. The power of the Crown, almost dead and rotten, as prerogative, has grown up anew with much more strength and far less odium under the name of influence, an influence which operated without noise and without violence, an influence which converted the very antagonist into the instrument of power, which contained in itself a perpetual principle of growth and renovation, and which the distresses and the prosperity of the country equally tended to augment was an admirable substitute for a prerogative that, being only the offspring of antiquated prejudices, had moulded in its original stamina irresistible principles of decay and dissolution. The ignorance of the people is a bottom, but for a temporary system. The interest of active men in the state is a foundation perpetual and infallible. However, some circumstances arising it must be confessed in a great degree from accident, prevented the effects of this influence for a long time from breaking out in a manner capable of exciting any serious apprehensions. Although government was strong and flourished exceedingly, the court had drawn far less advantage than one would imagine from this great source of power. At the revolution, the crown deprived, for the ends of the revolution itself, of many prerogatives, was found too weak to struggle against all the difficulties which pressed so new and unsettled a government. The court was obliged, therefore, to delegate a part of its powers to men of such interest as could support, and of such fidelity as would adhere to, its establishment. Such men were able to draw in a greater number to a concurrence in the common defence. This connection, necessary at first, continued long after convenient, and properly conducted, might indeed, in all situations, be a useful instrument of government. At the same time, through the intervention of men of popular weight and character, the people possessed a security for their just proportion of importance in the state. But as the title to the crown grew stronger by long possession, and by the constant increase of its influence. These helps have of late seemed to certain persons no better than encumbrances. The powerful managers for government were not sufficiently submissive to the pleasure of the possessors of immediate and personal favour, sometimes from a confidence in their own strength, natural and acquired, sometimes from a fear of offending their friends and weakening that lead in the country which gave them a consideration independent of the court. Men acted as if the court could receive as well as confer an obligation. The influence of government, thus divided in appearance between the court and the leaders of parties, became in many cases an accession rather to the popular than to the royal scale. And some part of that influence, which would otherwise have been possessed as in a sort of mortmain and unalienable domain, returned again to the great ocean from whence it arose, and circulated among the people. This method, therefore, of governing by men of great natural interest or great acquired consideration, was viewed in a very invidious light by the true lovers of absolute monarchy. It is the nature of despotism to abhor power held 
by any means but its own momentary pleasure and to annihilate all intermediate situations between boundless strength on its own part and total debility on the part of the people to get rid of all this intermediate and independent importance and to secure to the court the unlimited and uncontrolled use of its own vast influence under the sole discretion of its own private favour has for some years past been the great object of policy if this were compassed the influence of the crown must of course produce all the effects which the most sanguine partisans of the court could possibly desire government might then be carried on without any concurrence on the part of the people without any attention to the dignity of the greater or to the affections of the lower sorts a new project was therefore devised by a certain set of intriguing men totally different from the system of administration which had prevailed since the accession of the house of brunswick this project i have heard was first conceived by some persons in the court of frederick prince of wales the earliest attempt in the execution of this design was to set up for minister a person in rank indeed respectable and very ample in fortune but who to the moment of this vast and sudden elevation was little known or considered in the kingdom to him the whole nation was to yield an immediate and implicit submission but whether it was from want of firmness to bear up against the first opposition or that things were not yet fully ripened or that this method was not found the most eligible the idea was soon abandoned the instrumental part of the project was a little altered to accommodate it to the time and to bring things more gradually and more surely to the one great end proposed the first part of the reformed plan was to draw a line which should separate the court from the ministry hitherto these names had been looked upon as synonymous but for the future court and administration were to be considered as things totally distinct by this operation two systems of administration were to be formed one which should be in the real secret and confidence the other merely ostensible to perform the official and executory duties of government the latter were alone to be responsible whilst the real advisers who enjoyed all the power were effectually removed from all the danger secondly a party under these leaders was to be formed in favour of the court against the ministry this party was to have a large share in the emoluments of government and to hold it totally separate from and independent of ostensible administration the third point and that on which the success of the whole scheme ultimately depended was to bring parliament to an acquiescence in this project parliament was therefore to be taught by degrees a total indifference to the persons rank influence abilities connections and character of the ministers of the crown by means of a discipline on which i shall say more hereafter that body was to be habituated to the most opposite interests and the most discordant politics all connections and dependencies among subjects were to be entirely dissolved as hitherto business had gone through the hands of leaders of whigs or tories men of talents to conciliate the people and to engage their confidence now the method was to be altered and the lead was to be given to men of no sort of consideration or credit in the country this want of natural importance was to be their very title to delegated power members of parliament were to be hardened into an insensibility to pride as well as to duty those high and haughty sentiments which are the great support of independence were to be let down gradually points of honour and precedence were no more to be regarded in parliamentary decorum than in a turkish army it was to be avowed as a constitutional maxim that the king might appoint one of his footmen or one of your footmen for minister and that he ought to be and that he would be as well followed as the first name 
for rank or wisdom in the nation. Thus Parliament was to look on as if perfectly unconcerned, while a cabal of the closet and backstairs was substituted in the place of a national administration. With such a degree of acquiescence, any measure of any court might well be deemed thoroughly secure. The capital objects and by much the most flattering characteristics of arbitrary power would be obtained. Everything would be drawn from its holdings in the country to the personal favour and inclination of the prince. This favour would be the sole introduction to power and the only tenure by which it was to be held, so that no person looking towards another and all looking towards the court, it was impossible but that the motive which solely influenced every man's hopes must come in time to govern every man's conduct, till at last the civility became universal. In spite of the dead letter of any laws or institutions whatsoever, how it should happen that any man could be tempted to venture upon such a project of government may, at first view, appear surprising. But the fact is that opportunities very inviting to such an attempt have offered, and the scheme itself was not destitute of some arguments, not wholly unplausible to recommend it. These opportunities and these arguments, the use that has been made of both, the plan for carrying out this new scheme of government into execution, and the effects which it has produced, are in my opinion worthy of their serious consideration. His Majesty came to the throne of these kingdoms with more advantages than any of his predecessors since the Revolution. Fourth in descent and third in succession of his royal family, even the zealots of hereditary right in him saw something to flatter their favourite prejudices and to justify a transfer of their attachments without a change in their principles. The person and cause of the pretender will become contemptible. His title disowned throughout Europe. His party disbanded in England. His Majesty came, indeed, to the inheritance of a mighty war. But victorious in every part of the globe, peace was always in his power, not to negotiate, but to dictate. No foreign habitudes or attachments withdrew him from the cultivation of his power at home. His revenue for the civil establishment fixed, as it was then thought, at a large but definite sum, was ample without being invidious. His influence by additions from conquest, by an augmentation of debt, by an increase of military and naval establishment, much strengthened and extended, and coming to the throne in the prime and full vigour of youth, as from affection there was a strong dislike, so from dread, there seemed to be a general averseness from giving anything like offence to a monarch against whose resentment or opposition could not look for a refuge in any sort of reversionary hope. End of section 28